Get a Book Dot today presents Strike Battleship Marines, Book 3 in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2018. Our enemies. They held against fighters, mechs, starships, infantry, wild dogs, particle cannon fire, windstorms, alien diseases, two armored divisions, and starvation. But they ran like cats on a tile floor when they heard the war cry of the first Skywatch Marine. Skywatch Force Alert, all units, Sector 2. Be advised, 98th Marine Recon has engaged enemy armor at Hallow's Moon at timeout mark 0 0.7, sustained heavy casualties. Attempted regroup and counteroffensive at Executioner's Ridge. Contact lost with Line Command. All telemetry offline. Surviving fire teams requesting evac at coordinate 761 break 41. Transmission interrupted. Attempting to establish contact. Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. The percussive thump of detonation reports sounded in the distance. Each was carried into the sky by a bracing, unrestrained gale force wind. The ominous shadow of a maimed SX-8 fast tank turret dominated the dreary sky over the battlefield known colloquially as Executioner's Ridge. The very soil itself was a good ten degrees warmer than it would otherwise be due to the apocalyptic destructive energies that had exploded over it only hours earlier. A few yards away, the gutted hull of an SX-12 recon tracker was still pouring black smoke into the raging storm. Hundred-foot-wide impact scars from orbital energy weapons were scattered in all directions. A discarded handheld scanner crackled with the noise produced by the partially ionized atmosphere. Scraps of tack suits, broken weapons, and smashed power armor littered the pale ground. The smaller of the twin suns was only partially visible over the southern horizon, casting long shadows across the destruction. Seated in a twisted pose against an undamaged track still attached to the SX-8's chassis, was the only apparent survivor of the engagement. He was suffering from two broken legs and a rapidly worsening head contusion. In one hand he held an exhausted blaster pistol, in the other was his comlink. It was set to repeater mode and still broadcasting the evac signal ordered by his long-since vanished platoon commander. A murky shape moved from behind part of a crashed Paladin bomber hull. The strike sergeant recognized the shiny carapace and the alien insectoid motion at once. He reflexively inhaled and cringed as the adrenaline intensified the pain from his injuries. With only moments to react, he used every last ounce of his remaining strength to raise his weapon. His hands shook as he took aim. He forced a dehydrated and exhausted bellow from his strained throat and fired into the charging creature's face and eyes again and again and again. Chapter 1 Forward Operating Base Alaska, Hallow's Moon, Bayown 4 Interdiction Zone, Alert Condition 2 Strike Sergeant Roy Alexander reporting as ordered, sir. The young Marine performed a regulation salute and stood at attention, waiting. His posture was subtly different from the average infantry Marine. Alexander looked more relaxed, as if he were more comfortable and sure of himself. One might even have guessed he looked at home, which was confusing given the unsettling surroundings. The Alaska base had been incinerated from the inside out. After images of human bodies had been flash-burned into the walls by incredible destructive energies, it was as if an enemy had managed to detonate a nuclear weapon inside the facility without destroying the structure. Everything but the walls had been reduced to slag or flaky ash. The makeshift table had to be constructed out of cement blocks and a bent electrical access panel. It was unbearably hot, and the air was thick with the acrid smell of burned-out chemical fires. It wouldn't be long before the environmental systems failed completely. Take a seat, Sergeant. 
Alexander moved with efficient intent and sat on a rickety chair across from Jason Hunter and Honora Doverly. Both officers were dressed in the Blacks. It was the fleet name for the nondescript fatigue-like uniform designed to keep high-ranking personnel from standing out in forward areas. Black blouse, black trousers, black boots, belt, holster, and sidearm. Each wore a patrol cap with a removable rank patch. Their jackets had their names on the chests and argent insignia on the shoulders, all black on black. The unusual uniforms were a necessary precaution. By all rights, battleship captains, commanders, and medical chiefs were rarely allowed to hit dirt in a hot LZ and were often barred by regulations from visiting a forward base so recently attacked, at least without a heavily armed escort. But something the regulation writers often overlooked was the fact circumstances often called for more decisive action. And these most definitely qualified. Captain Hunter was about to preside over one of the biggest buildups of reinforcements for a capital ship in recent memory, but before he welcomed the new crew, Marines, and hardware to the decks of DSS Argent, he had an urgent mission to complete. Both Jason and Honora noticed the sergeant didn't make a sound, either pulling the chair out or seating himself. He was a plain-looking man. He definitely didn't resemble a fleet officer's image of a special forces Marine, especially one from the elite recon section. He wore an impeccably trimmed beard that perfectly matched his short brown hair. He wasn't particularly heavy nor noticeably muscular, but Hunter did notice his stare right away. Sergeant Alexander never broke gaze. He never looked down, never glanced or fidgeted. He was like an icy reflection. His face didn't flinch. When he blinked, he looked perfectly relaxed. Even his breathing was unusually steady. A man like Roy Alexander got called in when the situation could be handled in no other way, and the recommendation of his services was always delivered by whisper. His reputation preceded him, even through meetings with two admirals and a marine general. The only thing about him that wasn't classified was his name and rank. He was the deadliest human being in the Bayonne system, and Captain Hunter was about to send him on a mission from which he would quite possibly never return. At 0400 hours Bayonne, three time yesterday, an Argent 2nd Marines infill team deployed to the planet's surface to conduct reconnaissance of what we believe is a hidden recovery LZ 60 miles southwest of the 14th Infantry Garrison at Letha Deeps, Hunter began. Both our ground and orbital stations lost contact with Paladin 6-4 over the Triad Jungle at these coordinates. Commander Doverly indicated a location roughly halfway between the Starhaven perimeter and the Rustridge Mountains at the far end of the Triad Basin. We were unable to pick up any residual energy readings, nor can we locate a crash site. Even with look-down probes? Alexander asked. <laughs> There's some kind of scattering field active down there, Hunter replied. My signals officer speculates it could be coming from a natural source, as the swamps in the Triad Basin are home to some rather unusual algae blooms that can ionize the atmosphere over the water. Unfortunately, that's something we can't confirm from orbit. Understood. You need visual confirmation to locate the vessel and your missing men. It's not just any missing man, Sergeant, Hunter replied. My ground forces commander is on that mech. I have a battalion of Marines that may get the call at any second, and I don't relish the thought of sending them into action without my best officer in the lead. Acknowledged? Aye, sir. <laughs> I'm reasonably certain sitting here I don't have to go into much detail on what we're facing. I have eleven starships gearing up to engage what may be at least three hostile battle groups, and the strike point will either be Hallow's Moon or... Bayonne 3, Alexander finished. Komanov's intelligence section believes ground forces will hit the planet in less than 72 hours, Doverly added. If they've quietly established an LZ somewhere out there in the Triad Basin, we need to find it and put it out of commission before their invasion force arrives. Affirmative. Which objective has priority? Say again? Do you want the LZ out of commission or the missing paladin rescued first, ma'am? Alexander asked the question as if it were perfectly reasonable that one man could accomplish either task, to say nothing of both. Find my marines first. If they are still operational, they can join the mission to take out the LZ. Acknowledged. We realize it's a lot to ask of one man, Doverly said. Negative, ma'am. What do you mean? I always have help. Chapter 2. Attack Squadron Victory. Dante's Twins. Gitarin Reach Sector 5. Lieutenant Commander Dara Walsh Commanding. Rhode Island Boyle. Anything. Negative. 
Lieutenant Nessa Boyle hesitated after glancing at her captain. Walsh was motionless, staring at the view screen, hands clasped behind his back. He looked calm and at ease, but the Rhode Island XO knew better. She knew his mind was racing, engaging all his experience and sensibilities, reaching into the void for the slightest hint of enemy activity. He's doing it again, Boyle whispered. I hope he sees whatever I'm missing. Commander Islington sighed. We have hostels out here, and they're looking to take a shot at the task force before we get our defenses established. But why approach from this vector? Boyle asked rhetorically. I realize there's some limited timing advantage in maneuvering directly through the system, but the risk has to outweigh the tactical considerations, especially if they are moving in numbers. If it were me, I would engage from behind the twins. Those two stars make things very dangerous for warships, but they aren't as big a hazard to properly outfitted capital missiles. They aren't much of a threat to fighters either. Fighter strike. Long-range missile strike. Nessa mused. Can Sarn warships mount an attack like that this close to core space without being detected? If they had Skywatch help, they could. Those words burned at Nessa Boyle's sense of fair play. The idea that high-ranking officers would deliberately aid and abet hostile warships in civilian space lanes was unthinkable. Yet the continually mounting evidence that was exactly what was happening was impossible to ignore. So the captain sent the warlock out here to find them first, Rebecca continued. I have him to thank for finally getting my cloak, even though I had to give up my inboard S DAC launchers to get it. I think you'll find flying an attack sub in space sounds a lot more glamorous than the reality, Nessa said. To be honest, I've been looking forward to some quiet, contemplative moments. Boyle chuckled. Her smile faded as she glanced at her captain again. Commander Walsh just stood there staring. It was as if he were peering into another world, a universe only he could see. It looked like that other universe were just as quiet as Nessa and Rebecca's. Every time he so much as flinched, the entire bridge crew tensed, expecting him to bark one of those unexpected orders. The orders that almost always touched off the few seconds of screaming terror that punctuated the endless hours of waiting. Nevertheless, the crew of the Rhode Island could be thankful for two things. One, their captain could apparently see and hear things in the soundless emptiness of space nobody else could. And two, the ship he commanded was Death's own scythe. She was a warship without peer, capable of striking suddenly and vanishing into the cold eternal night of space like an icy whisper. In fact, Rhode Island had grown even more effective since the Bayon perimeter engagement. She was a lithe, razor-sharpened black leopard prowling her territory, and woe to any luckless beast who blundered into her path. Rebecca, I can't get my mind off fighters. The more I think about it, the more it makes sense. The twins would give them exactly the kind of navigation hazard they would need to drive a battle group up a wall. And if their commander has any sense, he knows we're going to be looking for a long-range attack, so he's going to maintain a combat space patrol, which is why I believe those anomalous readings we got at the twins yesterday were a sarn-ready alert ducking out of our scanner envelope at the last second. The captain is never going to allow us to go active. Well, if his reputation is genuine, we won't have to. Islington quipped. Touché. Nessa glanced at Walsh again. He's been standing there for hours, Rebecca. Is he waiting or... The Rhode Island signals officer held his headphones closer, concentrating on something. His expression twisted in confusion. Captain, I have a coded perimeter alarm. Source? Walsh asked in a chilling voice. The transmitter is moving, sir. Source frequency is drifting in a range of 0 0.07 gigahertz. Course plotted and on the board. Unidentified contact designate Uniform Epsilon 6 bearing 044 Mark 60, range 12 million miles in closing. Re-establish data net. Nessa already had the command queued up on her console. Silent electronics glowed to life and began transmitting telemetry between Rhode Island and Minstrel. Within moments, two Skywatch warships became as one, their weapons, sensors, navigation, defenses, and battle screens coordinated to within microsecond intervals. Patch in Minstrel on coded frequency. The signals officer configured the necessary channel. Captain, are you getting all this? Walsh asked. Affirmative, Rhode Island, we see it. Opinion? If I had to guess without going active, I'd say it was a sentry probe. Signals, configure a transponder challenge before it breaks 10 million miles. Align our beacon antenna to bounce the signal off the Shasta jump gate at 335. Walsh issued his orders without taking his eyes off the screen. Sir. 
begging the captain's pardon. But won't that trigger an open frequency response from the probe? Nessa asked, voicing the question her signals officer wanted to ask, but didn't out of concern for his own welfare. Nobody aboard Minstrel spoke. Rebecca Islington was likely considering all the possibilities just like the crew of Minstrel's sister ship. Yes, it will. Walsh still hadn't moved. There was a pause as everyone on the data net considered what Walsh had proposed. If Rhode Island transmitted a challenge, the probe would automatically respond per Skywatch protocols. That transmission would not only be picked up by any hostiles in the area, it would also give away the probe's location and course. The two Skywatch patrol ships, on the other hand, would ostensibly remain cloaked and undetected, since Walsh intended his ship's signal to use the directional antenna and let the Shasta jump gate pretend to be the source. All the enemy would see would be a transmission from the gate followed by a response from the probe. There wouldn't be a shred of evidence any other ships were in the area. Of all people, Islington and Boyle both knew the strategic advantages. It perpetuated the worst of all possible circumstances for an enemy. They were up against Rhode Island and they didn't know it. Minstrel was just as dangerous but for entirely different reasons. The ghost killer did its deadly work suddenly and silently. Minstrel preferred a wild, loud, open-range chase where enemy captains were likely to make a mistake not because of the tactical situation, but because of the split-second advantage-gaining and decision-making required to beat the fastest Perseus warship and her quick-thinking captain. The two ships together were twice as dangerous, as now Minstrel shared Rhode Island's cloaking technology, and the larger destroyer had the option to employ its heavier and more versatile weapon systems during one of Minstrel's trademark furballs. Nessa just stared in awestruck silence. The warlock rarely spoke in situations like this, but when he did, it was almost always to issue an order replete with malevolent elegance. The probe would go live using an omnidirectional broadcast. Its position would be detectable to any hostile ships in the area. If any of them moved to investigate, they would become visible to Rhode Island and Minstrel and silently tracked back to their launch points. The signals officer spoke shakily. Standing by, sir. Transmit. Chapter 3. Strike Battleship Argent BBV 740, Blackburn Jumpgate, Rho Theta System. Captain Jason Hunter commanding. All right, let's get this thing started. Captain Jason Hunter set his portable tablet down on the main light table in Argent's War Deck Operations Center. Zoni and two of her specialists had been hard at work most of the morning getting a series of multi-layered tactical screens set up for the briefing. She was seated at the opposite end of the darkened facility, working at a large console and watching the command computer's responses to her requests carefully. Present was Commander Toby DeMay, skipper of DSS Dunkirk. The Perseus Group's third capital platform had finally arrived at Blackburn, along with some of the strike fleet's munitions and supplies. Hunter wasn't happy about the inexplicable and nearly continuous delays in getting his ships where they needed to be, but he was gratified to have avoided the administrative friction these kinds of supply operations often produced. His back-channel arrangements with Admiral Benjamin Powers, Sink Eastern Banner, seemed to be paying off for now. Also present was newly promoted Lieutenant Commander Yili Curtis, Argent's chief engineer. Her timely actions on Bayon 3's surface to not only recover the Copernicus engineering corvette, but also set up a surprisingly effective power system for 14th Infantry, had finally gotten the attention she and her orbital combat engineers so richly deserved. By now, most of Argent's crew had noticed the newly decorated engineering command insignia, the new Skywatch Commendation Medal with a Combat Action Cluster, and a third silver star on the Commander's Surface Warfare Ribbon, alongside her second Purple Heart. The engineer herself, naturally, had little to say. She was busy with a set of weapons schematics on her own tablet. Hunter's Executive Officer, Commander Honora Doverly, was seated near the head of the table. She was still heavily involved in coordinating logistics for the battleship's immense recent reinforcements. Skywatch knew there was a war coming. Whether it started on Bayon 3 or ended there was simply a matter of semantics as far as the strategic situation was concerned. The flag officers Hunter could still trust had rightly concluded Argent was the only ship in the formation heavy enough to anchor a true amphibious operation. For now, that was the only realistic option. Other battle groups would arrive eventually, but like all fleet officers, both Hunter and Doverly knew the dangers and the practical reality of promised defenses responding to right-now attackers. 
The commander had deftly presided over the reactivation of the 12th Marine Mechanized and the 99th Marine Amphibious Companies. 28 of Argent's 68 Paladin mechs had been rearmed and refitted to support sustained ground operations planetside. The 7th Marine Strategic Air Group and 40th Airborne accounted for the rest of Hunter's rapid response ground forces. The Perseus flagship could now launch, recover, and provide fire support for nearly 900 mechanized Skywatch Marines. The fleet carrier Song of Heaven had detached Squadron 16 for temporary reassignment to Argent, which brought the battleship's fighter complement to 94 attack craft organized into five fully manned squadrons. The storied Devil Cats brought two dozen battle tested Wildcat fighters with them, along with 60 additional deck crew reinforcements and full racks of reloads and spare parts. Admiral Neela Hafnitz, the flag for Strike Fleet Athena, had personally recommended 1 6. The new pilots brought Squadron 85's Los Gatos back to full strength, meaning it was no longer necessary to leave six of the squadron's Wildcats behind on combat operations due to pilot shortages. The Tiger Sharks and Red Buccaneers were grateful for the energy weapon support the new wall of cats could bring to bear, and Lieutenant Roscoe himself had rolled one of his trademark kegs into the officer's mess when he learned the Archangels were no longer the only full-strength Wildcat squadron aboard. Newly promoted Master Chief Petty Officer Duncan Buckmaster celebrated right alongside Argent's pilots, as he had been presented with a half-dozen Mackinac heavy transport lifters, each of which could ferry up to 12,000 tons of either cargo, vehicles, or armor from orbit to surface. He was now officially Chief of the Battleship, complete with his new nickname, Cobb. Buckmaster was in charge of the nearly a thousand members of Captain Hunter's deck crews on all three of Argent's cavernous flight platforms. The new Max were expected to make things much easier for spacelifts, which had been one of Cobb's biggest problems. The big vessels could function either autonomously or could be controlled by wide-spectrum remote electronics, which Lieutenant Tixia had been kind enough to set up for Flight 2's benefit. Only Argent's center flight deck could accommodate vessels like the Mackinax and the larger electronic warfare and rescue corvettes, not to mention her formidable Tarantula Hawk gunships. Buckmaster was the senior crew member tasked with instructing newly arriving crew and Marines on the role and function of a strike battleship. Most Skywatch personnel, whether they were fleet or ground forces, were more likely to know the details of platforms like the heavy battleships Kingsblade or Resplendent, as they were the vessels that hosted appearances by high-ranking civilian politicians and were the sites of ceremonies of interest to the general public. Argent, on the other hand, was one of the fleet's workhorses. A true hybrid, she combined advanced Havoc anti-proton main batteries with an innovative arrangement of three flight decks, each capable of launching craft ranging from probes to fighters to amphibious vehicles and armor. Where heavy fleet carriers like Song of Heaven and Bretagne were each equipped with two spacious decks designed to launch alpha-strength fighter wings as rapidly as possible, Argent's three-deck arrangement was optimized for versatility. Although she couldn't stage the kind of sustained long-range fighter operations of the specialized carriers, she was no slouch when it came to force projection, especially considering her unique wing of gunships, which could operate in nearly any attack role. More importantly, when it came time to close range and engage in weapons-to-armor slugging matches, Argent had considerable advantages over the lighter-armed Skywatch carriers. Most of the new crew and Marines weren't all that impressed until Cobb explained a fully loaded strike battleship displaced 5 million tons and had enough hull volume to house 32 of the ancient wet Navy's Ford-class aircraft carriers. She was 72 stories from base to the very top of the Skywatch sensor deck, 1,700 feet wide from port side flight 1 to starboard side flight 3 and just over 2,700 feet long. Buckmaster made a point of explaining all this on the 10-minute walk from the ship's aftmost radiation shielding to the Deck 5 observation bay, which was the forwardmost point aboard ship. By the time his presentation concluded, his audience often had new appreciation for the phrase capital ship. But the captain's secret weapon was still DSS Dunkirk. Commander DeMay had pulled her crew together faster than any other officer could have. Argent's adopted escort strike cruiser was now at full strength and then some. Although she didn't yet have the new weapon systems installed like those on DSS Fury, DeMay's cruiser could still dish out considerable punishment with her standoff plasma cannon main batteries, especially in space-to-ground engagements against enemy infantry and armor. It was what the strike cruiser was invented to do, and by the looks of things, that fact hadn't been lost on Toby DeMay or his crew.
the fact that Argent and Dunkirk now shared advanced data link and could synchronize their point defense, battle screens, and electronic warfare suites to tolerances of a tiny fraction of a second didn't hurt either. Nevertheless, what ate at the captain as he took his seat at the head of the war deck's planning map was the fact that his marine battalion's commander was missing on the very planet his ship was about to defend against a probable invasion force. Seems Admiral Powers and my darling sister have done rather well. We managed to refit, rearm, and repair all but two of our ships without drawing the attention of anyone else at Skywatch Command, Hunter began. His officers and other crew members took their seats around the enormous light table. What else has been done? Signal section is up. We've run regression tests on the entire array and all three watches have been briefed and rated on the most recent set of combat drills, Zoni reported. If someone lights a match anywhere in Sector 2, we'll hear it burning in stereo. Outstanding. Engineer? All reactors at full capacity, all engines operating at five nines, capable of maximum velocities in all flight modes, Commander Curtis replied. Anyone familiar with Argent's unusual third-in-command would have likely recognized the importance of this briefing. Yili didn't bring any of her gadgets. Understood, Hunter replied. I'm operating on the assumption we won't have to do much chasing this time, but it's good to know we have the horses if we need them. Space Wing? Cobb assures me the deck crews are up to speed, Commander Doverly replied. The pilots from the 1-6 are going through the last of their rating simulations on our recovery systems. I expect they will all be cleared for combat operations within the next 12 hours. Cobb? The commander's right, sir, Buckmaster replied. We'll be ready. Very well. An ultra-high-resolution image of Bayon 3 snapped into view on the map table's surface. Starhaven, the garrison for Komanov's 14th Infantry and Lethe Deep's planetary defense base, were all visible in the eastern half of the continent. An icon marked the last known position of Colonel Moody's Paladin 6-4. The display's POV was roughly 60 miles above the surface, viewing the planet from what would be considered a combat orbit by Skywatch. The ocean beyond the eastern shore was just visible along the planet's curved horizon. Yesterday morning, I issued an order that will either be the biggest mistake of my career, or the reason the population of Starhaven lives to see their next harvest, Hunter began. Zoni transmitted a declared fleet-opposed invasion. Target, Bion 3. I have committed the balance of Strike Fleet Perseus to Operation White Wing. Within the next six hours, I will order the entire force to a standing alert condition too. Silence. I don't need to elaborate the urgency of this situation. Commander Hunter and I have our theories as to why Colonel Atwell not only delayed his attack, but announced his intentions in advance. Nevertheless, we can only assume by now he has concentrated his plans and intends to hit the Bayon system with enough force to drive us all the way back to Vicksburg within the next few days. Hallow's Moon was hit this morning in an attack that cost us most of 98th Recon and our spacehead over Bayon 4. And the view pulled back to a point where most of Sector 2 was displayed. I have deployed the strike fleet at what I consider to be the four most likely attack sites. Revenge, Constellation, and Exeter have been assigned to support 14th Infantry from Bayon 3 orbit. The other officers watched the display carefully. Commanders Walsh and Islington have formed Attack Squadron Victory and are anchoring our defense at Dante's Twins near X-Ray Tango. Spruance and Teller's group have established a command zone in the Shiloh Corridor. Revenge, Constellation, and Exeter are providing orbital fire support for 14th Infantry over Bayon 3, and Fury has taken up a patrol route for Manassas Station on the Gitern side of El Rey. We have the 808th available to float if we need it. I chose Blackburn and the Rho Theta perimeter as a resupply rendezvous, so we would have equal flight times to reinforce any attack vector from Barker's asteroid to the Dead Reach. Raleo is now completely isolated, which of course invites Atwell to approach from the far side of Prairie Grove and fly right into the teeth of our heaviest strength. The theory being Shiloh and Manassas block any approach from El Rey or Prairie Grove, Buckmaster replied. Exactly. Atwell's main body rendezvous point is somewhere along the eastern edge of Sector 2. Either he's parked at X-Ray Tango behind the Twins in El Rey or Prairie Grove or in the Raleo system. At this point, no matter which direction he picks, he will hit at least one of our pickets and need several hours of lead time to get within range of Bayon 3. That puts Argent and Dunkirk in position to reinforce the line and make it a fighting retreat all the way to the surface where 2nd Marines will be waiting at full strength to blow his invasion force out of the sky transport by transport. What about the unengaged squadrons? 
Commander DeMay asked. Will they have enough time to hit Atwell's forces and open a second line? Absolutely, Hunter replied. A yellow circle appeared around the winged avatar for DSS Fury and her patrol zone. If I could choose, I'd like to see them hit Manassas and approach from straight north on a 180 true. That would put Walsh and Islington in a perfect position to sneak into his wake and commit some old-fashioned mayhem against his lighter units on the approach. If we can tangle that formation at System's Edge, we might be able to end this thing in space. The only X factor in all this is the whereabouts of DSS Orca. A true fleet carrier would change the balance of power completely, Doverly added. We lost track of Task Force Poseidon before we arrived at X-Ray Tango, but we do know Kingsblade was not its only capital platform. There is also the issue of the remaining missing crews. Are we even certain Orca is still in the fight? Buckmaster asked. Whomever committed Poseidon to pursue us sacrificed Aki, Ceres, and Leto to cover her withdrawal, the commander replied. She's a ship of the line, just like Argent. A CVA can cycle more than 150 fighters. Now granted, those fighters aren't going to be terribly effective if they were automated like they were at Uniform Tango, but I don't need to point out she has half again our force projection, and if Atwell comes up with some pilots, she can do a variety of damage and hit us from a long ways out. That brings me to my second point, Hunter continued. We've done our best to try and analyze the teleportation technology Atwell apparently deployed at Station 19, against Exeter and against our own crew over Bayonne. Zoni has collected all the hardware Argent has recovered so far, but we can no longer recharge any of the units we possess. That makes it very difficult to analyze or test them. We have no defenses against the technology yet, but developing them is at the top of our priority list. For the time being, we are going into this operation presuming our enemy has the ability to transport both ships and crews practically anywhere at will. The most urgent consideration is boarding actions. All Perseus ships have sufficient marine deck security, but it doesn't hurt to devote Max attention to anything unusual. I want the message to our crews to be this. Don't wait. Sound the alarm. No Perseus officer or crew member is to give anyone a hard time for overreacting during this operation. After what happened aboard Exeter, I don't need to explain the potential for loss of life and valuable fleet assets. The other officers nodded their assent. Admiral Hafnitz assures me the first battle group to arrive will be Strike Fleet Athena. They will be in position to relieve Spruance and take up a forward position at Prairie Grove. Admiral Powers has performed some headquarters magic and managed to redeploy other warships from Southern Banner to help us. But the main event is our responsibility. We have 11 starships, a full space wing, an overstrength battalion of mechanized infantry, an armor company, an artillery company, and the finest crews in Skywatch. On this op, there's no points for second place. The grim faces around the war deck told the captain his warning had been soberly heeded. I'm certain I also don't need to inform any of you the fact Lieutenant Rhea Cooper, Constellation's first watch tactical officer, is still missing. I expect a report from Commander Hunter within the hour. Our working theory is her location might give us some valuable information on the whereabouts of the rest of our missing men and women. Let's wrap up our final reports and prepare to make way. Toby, Anora, we have an appointment aboard Dunkirk. The rest of you are dismissed. Chapter 4 14th Infantry Garrison, Bayon 3, Lethe Deep's Defense Perimeter, Major Daria Komanov Commanding. Quarters in garrison bases were capable of becoming completely lightless by design. Even Marines needed sleep, and trying to relax on alien worlds was hard enough without unscheduled light interrupting the night cycle. This early in the morning, even Marine officers weren't usually awake and active. Fourth Watch, on the other hand, was not only awake and active, but under orders to report anything unusual, even if it meant disturbing a formerly sleeping Major. Rook to Black Queen. The Major reached for the side table and keyed her comlink. The environmental system detected movement and brought the lights to 10%. Komanov. Major, we are picking up an unusual gravitic reading from our surface repeater at Point West. Is it localized? Negative, ma'am. I was about to raise Jester, but you left orders to check with a command officer first. And Tarkas is off base, the Major sighed. Quietly raise signal status to condition four. I'll be up in a minute. Komanov stopped at her window and deactivated the polarizing field. Reflected light from one of Bayon's suns was visible along the mountains far to the south. The firebase 6th armor had landed to establish was fully operational by now.
The Major's Iron Keep had deployed flawlessly, adding yet another feather to Special Project's resume and her experimental weapons section. Because of Commander Curtis, instead of one engineering camp, now they had three, each with total failover power routing capabilities. Reactor 2 was a half-mile underground, courtesy of DSS Argent's combat engineers. The infantry team would have preferred to blast its way under the surface, but given the time restraints, it was decided precision demolitions could do the job faster. It wasn't quite as loud or destructive, but it only took a few hours instead of an odd number of weeks. The garrison itself was a triangular affair, with reinforced and anchored half-dome ground emplacements at equidistant points around a larger headquarters facility situated at the complex center. Armored maglev trains shuttled fuel, repair crews, combat personnel, and ammunition between nodes using vacuum-sealed, supercooled underground tracks. 6th Armor's battalion of superheavies was now firmly established as the base's primary ground force. The SX-15 Razorback tanks provided both ground and low-orbital energy weapon firepower for defense, and the SX-8 and SX-12 recon units were tailor-made for patrol duty. A company of heavily armed Marine infantry from the 14th was stationed at Lethe Deep's orbital defense complex and in constant communication with the remainder of Komanov's forces at the garrison. Several attempts had been made to bring the formidable permanent weapon emplacements of the Deeps back online, but the project had been postponed in the interests of speedy readiness. Captain Hunter had left orders not to proceed more than three levels below the planetary installation's surface, which was prudent considering the inexplicable mysteries they had found at ground level. It was still inconvenient and potentially dangerous, however. There was no telling what might boil up from below, so the 14th had the abandoned base under constant surveillance. Komanov had managed to lose the 715th Marine Artillery Battalion by pretending to get into a bureaucratic disagreement with DSS Argent's SCOM. The two officers produced a mountain of paperwork which they promptly submitted to Skywatch Command, along with a request to mediate a compromise. It was good enough for a month of delay, during which time Jason Hunter pretended not to notice four gunships and 60 personnel from T-Hawk Black had been mistakenly assigned to the 9th Marine Intelligence Battalion. That little mistake gave the Bayoun Amphibious Forces formidable air defenses and long-range firepower to go along with the infantry and armor units. Reaper 8, Black 8, Night Fever, Black 5, the Black Parakeet, Black 7, and Shadow Waltz, Black 3, were parked in a menacing row inside the base's flight bay right across from the mighty hypersonic artillery pieces of Rickety's gun shop. But the Major knew it wasn't going to be enough. Not by a couple of touchdowns. For one thing, any ground combat was going to have to favor defensive formations within a few minutes' response time to Starhaven. Facts were facts. There was nowhere for the civilian population to run. An airlift of tens of thousands of civilians would take months of planning even in the best of circumstances, and this was to say nothing of the companion problem. Abandoning Starhaven's crops would threaten a significant portion of the food supply for three systems. Like it or not, the civvies were here to stay, and that meant the Marines weren't going anywhere anytime soon either. Komanov strode into the station's alert center. Three technical specialists from Watch 4 were on duty, and by the looks of things, all of them were focused on the same set of readings. What's the approach profile? That's what's confusing, Major, the watch officer replied. It's a scout-class ship, but it's in a standard approach lane. That meant one of three things. Either the ship was automated, its captain was suicidal, or it was exactly what it appeared to be. Only one of those possibilities made any sense, so the Major punted. Stand by hailing frequencies, patch monitoring to Jester. A moment passed as the signals tech configured the ground antenna with the Starship Jester's sweep frequency. Jester, Riley. We brought you in to get a fix on an approaching spacecraft pilot. Oh, I love party guests. Is it the shuttle in line for a standard orbit at 215? That's the one. Feed us the telemetry. If they veer out of the approach, we'll hand it off. Acknowledged. Standing by. All right, Corporal, open a channel. Aye, ma'am. The inbound tracking display filled the main view screen. A tiny yellow dot in the center of the picture indicated the slow-moving spacecraft. The lower left corner was filled with a portion of the planet. The green position markers for three Perseus warships and the 808th formation were scattered throughout the planet's orbit. Attention unidentified vessel. 
This is Major Daria Kamanov on the surface of Bayon 3. We are monitoring your approach. This is a restricted area. By order of Skywatch Command, Starhaven is under embargo. Civilian vessels are advised to proceed to the out-system jump gate and then to Vicksburg for routing. Acknowledge. Moments passed. Anything? No response. Adjust pickups to read transmissions outside standard Skywatch frequencies. Recalibrate and transmit full spectrum. Repeat message. Aye, ma'am. Another pause. We've got them, Major. Very low power. We can barely read them. Tune ComSat relative to data channel K6 frequency, 1.365, and confirm signal. Can you boost it for us? Stand by. Kamanov nudged her tech. The corporal reconfigured his receiver to the proper data and voice channels. Black Queen, this is Jester. Stand by for voice transmission. Same frequency. Go. Static crackled and popped. Komanov frowned. Something was wrong. A half-watt crystal radio at this range and azimuth would produce a clear signal. There was almost no interference, especially this early in the day. Unless the approaching ship's equipment was malfunctioning, her base should be reading them five by five. A tinny, distant voice was audible. Ground station, this is Sandbag. Request permission to land at your facility. Repeat, we are low on fuel. Requesting permission to land at your coordinates. Jester, this is Black Queen. Can you confirm data reception? Stand by. Komanov watched the yellow dot intently. She was moments from ordering an intercept when Riley picked up the transmission again. Black Queen Jester, data transmission checksums are not a match. Repeat, the data and voice transmissions do not match. Standing by for instructions. Decode it, Corporal, quickly. Everyone in the control center watched as the message slowly decoded on the view screen. Attention, Skywatch. Our shuttle is carrying a 200 kiloton warhead set for remote detonation. We know where Lieutenant Rhea Cooper is being held. Help us. Chapter 5 Advanced Strike Cruiser Fury CX plus 704, Manassas Station Frontier, Gitarn Sector 8, Commander Jace Hunter Commanding. Help. Lieutenant Commander Thomas Huggins strode onto the bridge and examined the tactical display on the main view screen. Status No change, sir. Manassas Station has performed nine complete sweeps. No contact. Walsh is certain there is activity in the Shasta sector. They're going to jump out somewhere along the reach. The only question is where. Huggins sat at the con and activated the comlink. Hunter. Huggins on the bridge, ma'am. You asked for a status update. And you're about to report nothing has changed. You sound impatient. An astute observation, XO. I'm getting tired of tinkering with spare parts while our enemy stays out of reach. We're due to dispatch a tactical bulletin in 18 minutes. Any new instructions? I'll be up in a minute. The channel closed. Huggins knew there were only a few things in known space that could drag Jace Hunter out of her off-duty workshop. One was Petty Officer Beetle Angley's vegetable stew. The other was nagging strategic doubt. The Fury XO suspected the latter was the reason Jace had relocated her workshop to Deck 2 during the refit. Captain on the bridge. Jace walked directly past the con to stand near the forward view screen. Give me a comprehensive tactical view of the Gitarn interdiction zone and center it on Fury's position. The tactical officer silently configured the necessary controls. An instant later, the forward display switched to a top-down map of the line of defensive sectors stretching from Raleo in the extreme upper left corner all the way down to Scorpion 1-3 in the lower right. Fury was situated directly in the center, occupying the zone designated Gitarn Sector 8. Near Fury's green avatar was the stationary indicator for the Manassas Battle Station. The large, heavily armed base was one of only a few fortifications standing between the contested El Rey system and the edge of core space. Highlight the last positions of Rhode Island and Minstrel. Two new green indicators appeared three sectors away between Fury and the lower right edge of the screen. Assault Squadron Victory was operating only 800 light hours from the trailing edge of the minefield where the Barker's asteroid Sentinel emplacement had been destroyed. Near their position was the binary system known as Dante's Twins. Astronomers had long believed the treacherous gravity spikes caused by the two eternally warring stars ripped nearby planets to ribbons and created the asteroid field where both Barker's asteroid and Scorpion 1-3 were located. It was the only sector where Skywatch refused to deploy a battle station, citing safety concerns. That meant it was left to Jace Hunter to reinforce the system with two of her most prominent skippers. 
a risk to be sure, but a necessary one. Left undefended, Dante's twins would make a fine corridor through which to send an end run of warships and drive straight through open space right to Bayon's front door. Is there anything we've missed? I don't think so, ma'am. Commander Teller reports Spruance has established her operational patrol zone at Shiloh. That cuts off Prairie Grove. Constellation, Exeter, and Revenge are reinforcing the 808th at Bayon 3. That blocks the dead reach. Argent and Dunkirk are ready to make their run against either Bayon or Hallow's Moon. We've got El Rey pinned. That leaves Raleo isolated. So anything coming from the right edge of that tactical display has to go through at least one Perseus warship to engage Bayon. Now, what about the threats on the left side? All there is behind the Gitarn IZ is Vicksburg Station and the Core Worlds. Exactly. You're expecting another attack by friendlies? We've already tangled with Task Force Hades once. I'm not convinced that Pinnace wasn't of dubious origin, and we still have the matter of our famous imposter. The rest of Fury's bridge crew pretended not to listen, but the truth was they were hanging on every word. The disappearance of Lieutenant Cooper had sent shockwaves through the Perseus formation. How could a senior officer just vanish like that, and how could Atwell's forces possibly have replaced her so quietly and skillfully? For that matter, what other officers were potentially missing? And how did Commander Hunter know? Where is he going to strike first? Huggins asked rhetorically. Ensign, what is that reading on the harmonic sensors? Hunter asked. Ensign Coleman almost leaped out of his shoes at suddenly being called on by the captain. It took him several moments to fight through the surge of adrenaline to locate the numbers on row six of his forward projected readings. He scrolled through five screens of information trying to find the backlink. Ensign? Hunter asked, arms still folded. Uh, it's an energy surge, ma'am. E.W. picked it up as a potential weapons emission match. Weapons? Matched to what? Hunter asked, her attention and curiosity now both fully engaged. Coleman leaned closer. Skywatch records indicate a feedback mechanism used by saboteurs in the First Battle of Magellan Pass. It was called the Rifle Cutter. Feedback mechanism, Huggins mused. Weren't we briefed on feedback weapons when WPS installed the new Spectres? Jace added. Something about using a covalence trail as a free-floating ionized wire for a magnetically contained plasma charge. You've been reading those space books again, Huggins chuckled. What are experimental weapons doing in my command zone, Ensign? Unknown, ma'am. It could be a battle computer wrong guess. We've had false positives on weapons discharges before. The Ensign blushed, realizing he hadn't been asked for speculation. Hunter let it go. De Huggins had used the moments when he wasn't talking to move closer to Fury's forward tactical display. Yeah, but that was when our weapons were involved. We haven't fired a shot. Tactical, ready a Type 3 probe. Stand by launch at zero acceleration. Ensign, give me a maximum envelope anti-transmission field. Dial us up to 0.5 megawatts until the probe reaches range. A Quiet acknowledgments answered the commander as she climbed into her center chair without breaking her gaze at the tactical screen. Probe ready, ma'am. Launch. Engage forward AMT beams at 15% power. Maximum amplitude gain on all pickups. Pilot, maintain position. Engines at station keeping. Aye, ma'am. Helm answering all stop. Engines at station keeping. Tactical, navigate probe on least time course relative 121 mark 16. Vector to range point 6 mega clicks and report all contacts. The sleek little rocket shot into space at an unsettling speed. Once it emerged from Fury's anti-transmission field, its law systems established data link with the cruiser's formidable reflectors and began to cycle telemetry. Reading's coming in now, Captain. Ensign, find me anything that looks like a trail. I don't care what it is or what it looks like. If you can track it from point A to point B, I want to know about it. Affirmative? Yes, ma'am. I can spare an hour. If we find something interesting enough, are we delaying our patrol? Huggins asked. We don't know when or where, but I have a hunch we might find out what before the shooting starts. Whatever Atwell has planned, at least some of it is going to come from under Bayon 3, and that means it's up to Komanov and 2nd Marines. The rest of it might come out of nowhere in my patrol zone, and if it does, I want to be ready. Hunter strode back towards her workshop. She was filled with anxious energy, and she knew standing on the bridge listening to the ticking clock wasn't going to help. Find me that trail, Exo. You have the bridge. Acknowledged.
the lift doors closed behind her. Helm, set new course 105. All ahead slow. Notify Manassas we are delaying phase 3 until further notice. Maintain electronic warfare posture. The warship banked silently in space and crept along her new course. Chapter 6. Attack Squadron Victory. X-ray Tango Interdiction Perimeter. Gitarn Sector 5. Lieutenant Commander Dara Walsh commanding. Permission to speak freely, ma'am? Granted. With respect, I knew we left this sector too quickly the first time around. We can't just blow it off now. Those readings have to be investigated. It could be anything, pilot. Or it could be exactly what Calvin's battle computer says it is. If a rogue mine hit us with SRS reflections, then there's something active in that asteroid field and we should check it out. Captain Islington headed off her instinct to dismiss her pilot's concerns. The most recent intelligence putting two battle groups in the area had to be a higher priority. Nevertheless, Minstrel didn't work that way. Finn McCampbell was many things, but he wasn't impulsive, nor was he the type of officer to approach things frantically. He had mastered the starship's flight envelope to the point where he could do things with the agile little escort frigate that would quite literally tie other ships and crews in knots. His entire Skywatch record could be distilled to the word dedicated. He wasn't the kind of officer smart captains ignored. The Sentinel emplacement was destroyed before we were assigned to Sector 2, Islington said. Scorpion 1-3 was shot to pieces by massed paladin attacks. We knew there was a better-than-average chance of active mines out there. Still. What's got you so spooked, pilot? The timbre of the captain's voice changed subtly. It was smoother and even a little chilling. The unspoken tone of the question told Finn he had her full attention. And now even the captain's curiosity was piqued. Her intent gaze would have been more than a little unsettling for anyone but her own bridge crew. What Lieutenant McCampbell knew better than most was that particular look in Islington's eyes. Once Minstrel's skipper got hold of a problem, it was bound to be left in one of two conditions, solved or torn in half. Okay, consider this. We almost lost Argent and Exeter at X-Ray Tango because we weren't looking for another base. It found us first. They tried to misdirect our fire control, but the truth is, if it weren't for some fast thinking and some pretty heroic flying by Argent's bomber squadrons, we could have been badly hurt. Agreed. So we hit both bases and moved on to Bayown, following the trail back to Atwell's bigger base and managed to upset the Sarn in the process. With everyone watching Bayon and trying to survive whatever else we kicked up rescuing the Saratoga, nobody was paying any attention to the minefield. Nobody was watching X-Ray Tango anymore. And you think Atwell took advantage of that? It what better place to hide your strength than in the last place any of us would look? Nobody expected we'd be back out here sniffing around Dante's twins. That was Commander Hunter's call, and it was a good one. What if Atwell established a third base inside that minefield, and what if it was the source of that probe? Walsh is still livid over the fact we lost it in the EM interference from that solar flare, Ensign Grant added. XO, what was the probe's last known position and course? Islington asked without looking up. 170, ma'am, at a relative position 44 light hours from the twins. The look on McCampbell's face said it all. Cal, project the probe's location against a look-down map of the long-course waypoints around the interdiction zone. The tactical projection appeared on Minstrel's main view screen. The probe's avatar was directly in the center of the display, with the waypoint located in the lower right-hand corner next to the last known position of the Scorpion-13 Sentinel emplacement. Now project a linear course. A yellow line extended from the probe directly along a vector crossing the true coordinate circle at 170 degrees. It indicated the probe would cross the minefield, but would not intercept any of the labeled waypoints. Now correct for navigational hazards and the gravity well from the twins. The line adjusted from a straight course to a shallow parabolic. It shifted to the right just enough to directly intersect waypoint X-ray Tango. Mary and Joseph, Lieutenant Winchester exhaled. Captain Islington swiveled her con chair to face the tactical station. Cal, are you absolutely sure that signal intercept was an SRS harmonic? Was there something out there trying to target us for range? Ensign Grant nodded soberly. Aye, Captain, I'd stake my next paycheck on it. So, a minimal bet then? Winchester quipped with a grin. Grant rolled his eyes. Rebecca chuckled. All right, boys, you've convinced me. Signals, open a coded channel to Rhode Island. Get me Commander Walsh. Chapter 7 
Battle Frigate Ajax, FFX-771, Blackburn Jump Gate, Rho Theta System. Lieutenant Commander Dominic Harcourt, commanding. The automatic door to the officer's mess slid to one side and Captain Jason Hunter wandered in. Dr. Doverly watched him slouch to the dispensers and pour himself a fresh cup of coffee. With nothing alcoholic to add to it, the captain managed to gather two forlorn creamers and sigh his way to Honora's table. I'm not being ordered to return to Vicksburg, but if I don't agree to show the flag at the big wow pow, then we won't get what we need for the bigger pow wow. Isn't that always the way of things? Doverly replied as she made swirly designs in her own rapidly cooling coffee-like beverage. Ajax's mess crew insisted it was the best coffee in the fleet. Argent's senior officers were withholding judgment. Hunter laid flat on the cushioned bench, leaving his electronic folio and comlink on the table. He half growled, half sighed. Sometimes I wish I had accepted command of a smaller ship. Seems like everyone in uniform wants to take a shot at us now that we're flying a ship the size of Fort Worth. By now, Honora was used to talking to an empty bench. It reminded her of all the times she had talked the captain down during one of his famous tequila-soaked strategy sessions. She could see the captain's shoes, but the table concealed the rest. Any official word on the Hughes inquiry? Not a sound. Frankly, I'd be happier if they were spitting poison, Hunter replied. Just remember, we have the legal high ground. He wasn't sent out here by accident, and I'm not buying the story of Admiral Custer versus the Oogabugas. Dunkirk was sent out here on purpose, and I want her evaluated from stem to stern before we're ordered to surrender her to Skywatch Command. Is that on the agenda at Vicksburg? So far, no. Powers wants at least some cover for tossing me the keys to those Southern Banner extras. Fury needs to be resupplied, and Zoni needs a look at Commander Walsh's telemetry from the Bayon 7 engagement. Islington needs her new XO made official, and we're in the rack until I get 2nd Marines a new tactical officer. Yilly's officially getting her leaves, and so is Rebecca. Still, I don't like splitting up my forces like this, not one bit. Atwell isn't ready either. According to Atwell, Hunter sighed, I'd be happier if I was sure he wasn't ready. Who knows where he's going to pop out along Gitarn? We could be looking at strategic level engagements anywhere from X-Ray Tango to the Raleo Frontier and everywhere in between. We don't have anywhere near enough ships or crews to properly monitor all that real estate, much less blockade it. Wherever he starts, he's going to end up on Bayon 3. So far, that's the only good news, except for the fact I've got six Marines down there now and five of them are missing. And now I've turned Commander Harcourt's ship into a fully crewed Skywatch taxi because Powers doesn't want to risk a line captain riding around in a shuttle. I'll perform the Hughes autopsy when we get back to Argent. Janice has been setting up a clandestine OR and equipping it for no molecule unturned. Admiral Hughes taught leadership at the Academy, the only professor that ever flunked me on a test. I was convinced I was right, and he forced me to rethink my position twice. And when I discovered I had been right all along, he put a commendation in my permanent record. He was trying to teach me to question orders, to question authority. And now I know why. I read your report. I have to admit I wasn't prepared for the Admiral's theories on Atwell's motives. Doctor, if it were any other man, I would have rejected his words out of hand. But no matter what those alien bastards did to his mind, I don't believe they turned him against us. He may very well be right about the colonel. Atwell might be out here trying to use Ithis technology against whatever attacked Dunkirk. If that's true, then he's on our side, even if he's going about it all wrong. For all we know, Jason, they may have emptied his mind, too. You remember all that nonsense about a new era? The man sounded like he had been turned into some kind of fanatic. Maybe he was. Maybe his personality was split, too. That's been my theory on Hughes ever since we boarded his ship. The first time I saw the Admiral's face aboard Dunkirk, he was boasting about conquest as one of their warlords. By the time we caught up with him aboard Kingsblade, he was completely broken. Didn't speak a single defiant word to me. In fact, he sounded like my old teacher again. Maybe he was right about the Ithis. Maybe they're too advanced for human minds. That's what I want you to find out, Doctor. I want to know what happened to Admiral Hughes. If you succeed... It could give us an edge when we face off against the Colonel. Chapter 8. Strike Cruiser Dunkirk CX-288, Blackburn Jumpgate, Rho Theta System, Acting Commander Toby DeMay Commanding. 
Sergeant Roy Alexander reporting as ordered, Lieutenant. Boris Simpkins turned around without looking up from his clipboard. He caught unusual movement out of the corner of his eye. A moment later, he was face to face with a gray and black German shepherd. Sergeant? Corporal, sir. Sable is my K-9. She has all the same clearance as I do. Simpkins wasn't entirely prepared to find a dog had been assigned to Second Marines. Sable watched the lieutenant expectantly, tongue out and panting. She was apparently standing in her four-legged version of attention. The platoon leader had to admit he had never seen anyone but a human in a breakaway combat harness, to say nothing of a non-human wearing corporal's rank insignia complete with a special forces emblem under her stripes. Am I allowed to ask about your mission? I, sir, I was instructed by the flag to deliver a coded classified briefing for my direct report. Alexander handed the lieutenant a data pack. Force command tells me you're him. A couple of off-duty 2nd Marines infantry wandered through, stared a moment at the dog and Alexander's ominous gear, and then hurriedly excused themselves after a glare from Simpkins. This is dangerous stuff, Sergeant. Are you sure you don't want some backup? Even a handful of standby infantry would make me a lot less nervous. All due respect, sir. I'm hitting dirt in six hours. I can do or I can teach. I'm afraid I don't have time for both on this drop. Understood. If this is what the captain wants, then we'll do our damnedest to carry it out. Ensign Ahern is going to be your nemesis pilot. Ensign McBride is your electronic warfare specialist. They're both good officers. You'll be in good hands for the infill. What do you need from me? A rack, sir. We need four hours of dark and quiet and two hours to gear. Quartermaster will set you up. Next cabin down that hall. Chow is at 1300. Thank you, sir. Alexander saluted and Simpkins returned the salute. The sergeant guided Sable into the corridor. A couple of infantry riflemen watched as the recon marine made his way to the quartermaster station. One was cleaning his hands with a grease rag as he bumped his buddy's arm. You know what's sad about this, Brian? What? That dog outranks you. Chapter 9 Advanced Strike Cruiser Fury CX plus 704. Gatern Sector 8. Commander Jace Hunter commanding. Threat board. Commander Hunter swiveled to face the helm. XO, set tactical condition 3. Stand by battle station's energy. Affirmative. The signals officer configured the necessary controls. A clear channel alarm went off all over the ship, signaling quiet for all unnecessary comm traffic. The alert matrix lights shifted yellow, indicating the vessel was now one order away from general quarters. What the hell am I looking at, navigator? Aye, ma'am, the officer scrambled. Navicomp thinks it's a debris field, approximately 60,000 miles end to end. The dense volume to the port side of the phenomenon tripped our look-back probe's proximity alarms. Signals, give me a spectroscopic analysis of that dense region. Do it quickly. Hunter hadn't taken her eyes off the tactical display for more than a few seconds since the beginning of the shift. There was just something about this region of space that made the hairs on her neck stand up. Huggins had to admit he was feeling it too. I have ionized sodium particles, carbon, oxygen, and ionized helium, ma'am. Trace amounts. Shift the display and highlight the areas with the highest concentration of those elements. Fury's main bridge display shifted to what looked like an ultraviolet view of the dust cloud. Snaking through it like a dissipating contrail was a scarlet-colored overlay indicating the particles the warship's SRS section had picked up. Son of a... Huggins stopped short. Tactical, project the course indicated by those readings, Hunter ordered. She kept her eyes locked on the display. Her fists were white with tension. Course 171, ma'am. XO, we have a picket. It would seem so, Skipper. I don't remember inviting any guests to my party. Signals, run that ion trail through the vessel identification database. See if that nets us anything useful. They could have at least RSVP'd, Huggins said in a deadpan tone. Raise Manassas on a coded priority frequency. Include our telemetry and log entries for the last 60 minutes. Make sure they know what we're seeing out here. Aye, ma'am. Coding your message. Drawing a line? Huggins asked rhetorically. Whoever it is, they want a medium-range shot at the base from a vector we can't reach in time. I want equidistant ranges to all their vantage points. We could be sloppy on purpose and draw them out. If my guess is right, XO, they're running out of time. The longer we make them try to line up their shot, the less time they'll have to punch a hole in this perimeter. 
What I want is an old-fashioned pile up on one of these bases, then I can bring the entire task force right down on their heads. Squeeze play. Like a mustard packet, Hunter muttered. We have an analysis on that trail composition, Captain. She's the Psy Key, a Skywatch Palermo-class fast attack frigate, armed with standard sprint-equipped Ram 101 missiles and VOC standoff main batteries. Confidence? Battle computer indicates a 97.1% match. Tough little ship, Huggins said reflectively. I'd bet she's added a few unauthorized upgrades if she's on the mission we think she's on. Who is it at Skywatch Command who thinks we don't know what they're up to? Huggins shook his head. If we had that information, we'd have a lot more success ending this. The commander looked back over her shoulder. Get me Manassas Station on priority frequency. The signals officer brought up the long-range transmitters and configured the channel. I have Lieutenant Phillips, ma'am. Manassas Station, this is Hunter aboard Fury, requesting you set for Aegis Protocol until further instructed. We have indications of unauthorized activity in your command zone. Acknowledge. The disinterested face of the Manassas approach officer appeared on Fury's main screen. We have no contacts, Fury. Are you sure you're not misreading your instruments? Hunter ignored the subtle jab at her bridge crew. Confidence is high. From this point forward, your station should consider all unexpected contacts hostile. Meaning what? Hunter set her jaw and hesitated for a moment, doing her best to work through the foot-dragging and apathy. Report any unusual readings or communications traffic to my signals officer immediately. Is that understood? That's not regulation, ma'am. Lieutenant, I'd rather not make this an order. We all have jobs to do, Fury. My job, Lieutenant, is to keep you alive long enough to defend Sector 8. Please cooperate with my crew. If I make changes of that magnitude to our sensor and communications protocols, it's going to... I'm in no mood to litigate. You are under Aegis protocol until further instructed. I thought you said you didn't want to make it an order. We are hours away from a shooting war, mister, Huggins interrupted. You strike me as one of those last word people, so I'm going to make this as clear as I can. From this moment forward, if you verbally answer Captain Hunter's orders with anything other than yes, Commander, the sun will go out on your planet. Is that clear, Lieutenant? A pause. Yes, Commander. Very well. Fury out. The Exo dramatically flipped the channel closed. Huggins and Jace exchanged a look. Hunter swiveled back to face the pilot's console. Navigator, drop a repeater 200 miles off the trailing edge of that ion track. Pilot, let's put ourselves where we can do the most good. Steer new course 282 Mark 355. All ahead full. Stand by battle stations. Fury's pilot maneuvered the control bar into a controlled port bank and nudged the throttle forward. The enormous warship accelerated as her drive field stabilized at four times its cruising power. Let's go find our little friend, Jace muttered. Chapter 10. Strike Battleship Argent BBV-740. Blackburn Jump Gate. Rho Theta System. Captain Jason Hunter commanding. Honora Doverly knocked on the door of the executive inboard cabin. It was rare for the captain to summon individuals to his office. Everyone on board Argent knew by now her captain was far more comfortable with the idea of ad hoc conversations wherever he happened to find the people he needed at the moment. Whatever this was, it was about as formal as it ever got. Come. Jason was seated at his desk, surrounded by paperwork. His cabin was somewhat better decorated than the average officer's, since he had made a habit of gathering trophies and souvenirs from his many travels as a pilot and flight officer. Several dark wooden shelves of memorabilia were arrayed behind him. He was wearing his blue and gray fatigues, which only added to Honora's unanswered questions. Jason Hunter almost never wore true combat gear aboard ship. He preferred his officer's duty uniform or some combination of Academy Sports Organization t-shirt and workout gear. Silvered eagles adorned both collars and cover. He looked older and much more businesslike than normal. Honora decided this was likely not an invitation to banter. Honora Doverly reporting as ordered. Thank you, doctor. Be seated. The expression on Honora's face was one of an officer expecting the other shoe to drop. Once she was comfortable, Jason set down his paperwork. I just got some good advice from a hero of mine, so I'm going to cut through the formalities. I'm replacing you as executive officer, effective immediately. I'm also appointing Zack Commander Space Wing and bumping his number two to DS Com Flight Leader. It was like being hit in the chest with an artillery shell. 
Honora tried her best to conceal her emotions. Her first instinct was to interpret Jason's statements as a reprimand, but she knew better. At least she thought she did. She didn't reply right away. I could say it was the Admiral's call and I'd be right, but he didn't make it an order. So it's my call. I don't know what to say. Skywatch Command has been anxious about us since we crewed Argent. We've all been doing double duty. We've also been short-staffed since Jupiter-5, and now that we've got a chance to prepare, Powers wants this operation's capital platform at full combat capability. Komanov wasn't kidding when she said we were getting our pick of the store. Fleet finally decided a fighting doctor wasn't regulation? I'm not busting you, Honora. Having an SAR command officer on my ship is a privilege not many captains get. It will earn us both a lot fewer raised eyebrows around the fleet if you're my chief medical officer and you can train us both a qualified science staff. We're going to need them if we ever get in range of the Raleo system. Honora had to admit the sudden change was startling, but it did promise to take a fairly heavy burden off her shoulders. Who is taking second chair? Jace nominated Sabrina Mallory, I agreed. She's junior to both Moo and myself. She's not a Marine Ground Forces commander, nor is she a six-time decorated doctor. She's got advanced weapons training, and she comes highly recommended. Jason, I respect your sister more than you know, but you can't train command officers in combat like this. Fury is a fine ship, but she's not a battleship. Commander Mallory has no space wing experience and no amphibious assault experience. Hell, she was just promoted from lieutenant a couple of weeks ago. She's got a year of school to finish before she takes command of a capital vessel. There's a hundred problems with this, any ninety-nine of which could sink any chance we have before we get out of sight. She has two days. I'm relying on you to hit the high notes and leave the book study for a time when we're not up against the wall. Am I out of the command rotation? Yili is in line after her promotion. Zoni doesn't want command yet, especially after being pushed into the role at Bayonne. She's not confident in her abilities, and I'm already forcing the issue with too many others. I want my SAR wing at full strength, and that means both the Tranquility and Nightwing crews and the entire Angel inventory need a leader. Without being too blunt, you're not going to have time to run the whole ship. What you're going to do for me is bring one hell of a lot of juice to Argent's emergency crews. Do I keep my rank? Honora, you're not being busted. I want someone with your experience in charge of sickbay and my science section. In six months, you're going to be eligible for promotion to captain, and I can't think of a bigger step for you than to have your choice of medical assignments. We knew we were short-staffed when we took command of this battle wagon. You did your duty far beyond any call, and you took the slings and arrows when certain fleet officers took advantage of your conflicting responsibilities. You're one of the best officers I've ever known, and you are by every measure the best combat pilot on this ship. You are the only officer in Skywatch history to assume command of an abandoned battleship under enemy fire. I will appear before any promotion committee in the future to enter my formal recommendation. You know that. I guess they can't call me Dr. Blood anymore, Honora sighed. I can't say I'm not disappointed, but I want what's best for the ship, Jason. I would expect nothing less. Honora finally decided to ask about the winces she had noticed on Jason's face from time to time. You're upset we couldn't go after Moo on our own. I don't like asking for help after bringing on 4,800 reinforcements. I don't like being told Second Marines isn't up to the job. So yeah, I'm a little uptight. We can't invade Bayonne yet. Half our strength hasn't even unpacked. But we can find a disabled ship. At least that's what my loadout says we can do. It bothers me when I've got 35 decks of trained personnel and the mission always calls for the three guys who don't have their shoes on yet. It occurs to me this ship is still bleary-eyed and dragging, so it's time for me to do some old-fashioned ass-kicking before we go back to Bayonne. We're going to finish what we started. Doverly took that last remark as an implication Hunter wasn't going to lightly tolerate another lost crew member situation without an operational search and rescue wing. What are my orders? Same as before, Hughes autopsy. Find me something I can use against Atwell. As my medical chief, I'm ordering you to utilize whatever force is necessary to protect our evidence. I've already notified Commander DeMay. I want him and his crew to grant you and your team full access to Dunkirk's records computers and sensor banks as necessary. Per my orders, you are also, as of now, the ranking Strike Fleet Medical Officer. Understood. Admiral Powers has graciously provided us a set of choice transfers from Skywatch Medical Command. They're due in our last arrival, so let's get a list sorted and transmitted before the next watch rotation.
I want both Tranquility vessels fully staffed, I want the Nightwing ready for action, and I want Deck 16 to be the pride of the fleet when it comes to combat hospital facilities. There is nobody else in Skywatch who can do this, Doctor. I need you and your team squared away in 24 hours, because there are nearly 900 Marines in this formation about to go to war. We'll be ready, sir. Very well. Send in Commander Mallory. Honora opened the cabin door and nodded. She slipped past the younger officer, who looked about as confused as the doctor had been a few moments earlier. Sabrina came to attention as Honora closed the door. Sabrina Mallory reporting as ordered, Captain. Very well. Be seated. Mallory stepped around the designated hot seat and sat rigidly with her cover in her lap. Hunter grinned. Sit at ease, Commander. Now you're making me nervous. Sabrina tried to relax, but she wasn't entirely successful. By order of Skywatch Command, as of 0900 hours Vicksburg time, you are ordered to the post of Executive Officer of the Battleship Argent with the rank of Acting Commander. Congratulations. Aye, Captain. Mallory felt as if she had just been hit with a hundred-volt shock. You have my permission to speak freely. Sabrina held her breath. She was sure her face had changed color at least twice in the ten seconds since she had been given the news. I was just promoted, sir. I'm not sure I... I mean, perhaps there is someone else. There's nobody else. I need a full-time executive. Commander Hunter has recommended you for your own command on at least three occasions. You've been at the top of Fury's promotion list for two months. It's time. But my post was aboard a cruiser, sir. And now you are in command of a battleship crew. Aye, sir. We're going to war in two days. A ball of ice landed in Sabrina's abdomen and spread throughout her legs and arms. There's a pair of silver leaves in this for you if we win. I will notify the crew. We'll set aside time for a honeymoon later. Do you have any questions? She considered asking but decided against it. Not at this time, sir. Very well. You're with me. I have the first of three technical briefings today on Flight 2. Hunter attached his comm link and snapped his utility belt before checking his sidearm. We'll need to get you properly outfitted and armed. Let's go. Sabrina desperately tried to avoid looking like she was running along behind Hunter as he made his way to the lifts. More than once, she heard crew members and officers alike shout, Attention on deck! Dozens and dozens of personnel froze and stood at attention as he passed them in passageways, cabins, and compartments. The ship seemed unusually crowded, which wasn't surprising, since Arjun's headcount had increased by a factor of six since the last Bayon engagement. Finally, they reached the lifts. Hunter spent the interval fiddling with his comm link. Sabrina felt like there was a 10,000-watt spotlight following her around. She knew Argent's command structure. She had been a junior officer only a few weeks ago. How could she possibly command this behemoth? She was aboard a flying city. The magneto lift descended 22 levels before arriving on the Flight 2 load lane. There were hundreds of people working the deck. Two Yellow Jacket fighters were suspended by magnetic arms in the center of the ship's central launch facility. One group of technicians was rearming them, while another was cycling their fuel components. Behind the angry-looking jacks loomed one of the heavy gunships of Tarantula Hawk Green. Its wings were raised in a belligerent pose. A maintenance crew was hurrying in and out of her side entry hatch with electronic analysis equipment. At the far end of the flight bay were nine more Wildcat fighters parked next to several racks of bullfrog compression torpedoes. Duncan, Hunter shouted over the din, what's Command One's status? Sabrina was busy trying to take it all in when she heard a near-deafening honk. Bright white headlights surrounded her in a stark glow. She found herself in the way of a full-sized truck. After running a few more steps, the fuel transport lumbered past her and pulled up under the wing of one of the jacks. Finally, she caught up with the captain again. Six more hours, sir. Duncan Buckmaster was wiping grease off his hands with a small rag. In his work gear, he looked like a cross between your favorite bartender and a linebacker with a beard. Sabrina could not get over the sheer size of it all. At the extreme far end of the deck was an immense open bay. Beyond it was the blackness of space. Thirty stories overhead, white LED light bars were arranged in a grid across the ceiling, and its six enormous service lifters. Flight 2 was the largest of Argent's three launch facilities, covering an area of more than 12 football fields. The forward section of the deck housed three oversized rail tunnels, each capable of launching corvettes, gunships, or Mackinac dropships for armor and ground vehicles. 
They were the heavy variations on the smaller fighter-only launchers on the ship's lateral flight decks. Beneath the commander's feet was the rest of the Flight 2 facility, housing roughly one-third of Argent's fighters, ten corvettes, all 26 gunships, and half of her 68 Paladin mechs, along with their weapons, fuel, spare parts, and machining facilities. Unlike the pure warship design of a vessel like Fury, Argent was a hybrid, capable of fighting well in both ground and space engagements. And now that she was fully equipped, the new battleship could launch and direct nearly 200 spacecraft and deploy as many as 900 marine mechanized infantry. Duncan, I'd like to introduce you to our new executive officer. Sabrina, this is Duncan Buckmaster, chief of the battleship. Welcome to Argent, ma'am, the master chief nodded. It went without saying he wasn't going to offer her the opportunity to cover her own hands in Greece. Honor to serve with you. Nice to meet you in person, Cobb, Sabrina replied. She had only seen that many service stripes on a uniform in person once before in her career, her father's. If she were being honest with herself, she would have admitted Buckmaster reminded her of him a little. The Gatos are still banging their cups about those new missiles, sir. Now the arming mechanisms are turning themselves off unexpectedly. Item 6300 on my list of 8,000 things to do, Master Chief. As soon as I get the commander up to speed, we'll be a little less frantic around here. When you get a chance, can you chase down Lieutenant Roscoe and have him report to my deck to cabin at 1300? Aye, the Master Chief replied. Is my technical briefing still in there? Hunter asked as he headed for the launch tunnel. Hell no, Buckmaster replied. Someone might steal it. Hunter rolled his eyes and made a dismissive gesture at the grinning crew chief. Sabrina realized she had been left behind again and ran to catch up. Chapter 11 Missile Destroyer Constellation DDW-1919 Bayonne 3 Perimeter Gitarne Sector 2 Lieutenant Commander Raymond Flynn Commanding What have you got? Now crossing the perimeter, sir. Contact designated Whiskey India 5 bearing 120 Mark 10 on evasive course and accelerating. Range 4 million miles. Helm, bring the constellation about. Pursuit course. All ahead flank 2. Aye, Captain. Helm answering 117 Mark Zulu. Engines all ahead flank 2. Signals. Raise revenge. Be Ray Flynn knew his ship wouldn't be the squadron's first choice for pursuing something as maneuverable as a scout-class flying bomb, but Revenge and Exeter were both out of position and wouldn't likely be able to reach the sector perimeter in time. I have Commander Enright, sir. Flynn switched channels on the con. Pat, I've ordered a pursuit of contact Whiskey India 5. Can you detach one of the 808th for escort? We don't have the tonnage for this, Ray. We're already stretched way too thin to screen for Komanov and the 14th. Let them go. Pat, they've got information about Rhea. A pause. The Constellation's bridge crew waited anxiously. Commander Enright was nominally in command of the squadron, but Revenge and Constellation had a particularly storied past. The two ships had only operated in different formations once, and that was only because Constellation was launched six weeks before the larger assault cruiser. Ray knew his opposite number well. Patrick Enright was a stand-up officer and an unapologetic straight shooter. One thing the other Perseus officers appreciated was knowing exactly where they stood, and Commander Enright never pulled any punches. Even though he was the same rank and had a few years on Jace, he had volunteered to be the task force's number two in order to avoid being assigned elsewhere. His goal was much like the rest of the senior officers, keep the heart of the formation together. Fury, Minstrel, and Rhode Island had been getting all the press and medals lately, but anyone truly familiar with Perseus knew it was Revenge, Constellation, Exeter, and Jefferson that formed the foundation upon which Hunter's house was built. Dutch isn't going to split the 808th Constellation. If you get one, you get them all. Acknowledged. Jace is going to chew both our backsides if this goes sideways, Commander. Understood, Revenge. I have to do this. I can't leave one of our own out there alone. Another pause. Flynn could tell Enright was wrestling with a hard choice. It was unforgiving work, but it was also what Skywatch captains were paid to do. I'll give you twelve hours, Ray. I want you and McGee back in system no later than T plus thirty-two. Affirmative? We'll be there, Pat. Hold the fort. Constellation out. There was an ominous silence on Constellation's bridge. The ambiance of the electronics was all that interrupted the cold consideration of the sobering risk they were all about to take. 
Signals, let's put Dutch in formation. Constellation has the lead. Aye, Captain, coding your message. The privateer frigates of Assault Squadron 808 screamed out of Bayonne orbit and converged on the much larger ship's track. Each of Captain Holland Dutch McGee's ships was about as unregulation as they could get. On the bridge of the AS-808 lead frigate, the captain stood at the con as if daring an opponent to face him. He smiled the smile of a man used to winning, and doing so with a flourish. McGee always wore a uniform designed to stand out, especially among active-duty Skywatch officers. As an officer with more than his share of style and sensibility, he was a definite hit with the ladies and had already been formally reprimanded on at least three occasions for his designs on the daughters of high-ranking politicians and at least one female brigadier general. All vessels form up on the destroyer. Maximum energy to drive fields. Stand by battle stations, Dutch ordered. His pilot and navigator carried out the maneuvers and Assault Squadron 808 settled into a flying wedge formation alongside Flynn's larger warship. Holland McGee was the only Skywatch command-grade officer on active duty who served under a special warrant. By act of the Corps Council, the captain had first been drafted out of the Merchant Service into the 116th Survey Command based out of Corps 5. After the expiration of a year's distinguished service, his warrant was renewed only weeks before the first of three attacks that touched off the First Sarn War. He quickly accepted a commission as a privateer and maneuvered his squadron into position to disable two enemy ships and capture a third at Magellan Pass, a victory which blunted much of the power of the first Praetorian offensive. Hours later he outright stole an advanced weapons frigate on the way out of core space. It was the act which gave birth to his checkered reputation and necessitated the first of his three pardons. After the president intervened to broker the return of the missing ship, the incident was overlooked by Skywatch. McGee was offered a commission, which he turned down in favor of an ongoing but more informal role as a privateer. His twice-disavowed frigate squadron became the storied 808th. They were known by many nicknames, including the One-Shoed Magnificence, Jolly Good, and the Intergalactic Screwballs, and of course, once sighted twice lost, which was the profanity-free version of the nickname they earned when Dutch and his entire eight-ship flotilla literally vanished into thin air right in front of the president himself. Few ever learned the entire story, but there were rumors of a seduced 19-year-old defense minister's niece, expensive alcoholic beverages, a short foot chase, a stolen hover car, and an unknown amount of missing money. But none of the details could be confirmed. Dutch hadn't been seen on Core Prime since, at least officially. The 808th were the ships and mercenary crews most likely to one day give Lorleon and the Condor pirates a run for their money. Among the very few reasons they were tolerated was their ability to drive enemy warship crews directly up a wall. By the looks of them, the phrase ragtag didn't come close. Once the first shot was fired, however, the 808th turned into a pack of precision-coordinated fusion-powered attack dogs with unorthodox weapons and even more unorthodox combat protocols. Hostile contact Whiskey India 5 accelerating, now vectoring 116, on course for the Prairie Grove system. Stay with them, Helm, Flynn replied. Set tactical condition 2, standby battle stations missile. Navigation, give me the count. We will reach the Sector 2 jump gate in 39 minutes. Signals, open a hailing frequency. The ensign at the communications station configured the channel. Affirmative, Captain, you are patched in. Attention unidentified vessel. This is Captain Raymond Flynn of the Skywatch Destroyer Constellation. We have you under our weapons. You are hereby ordered to cut your engines, heave to, and prepare to be boarded. Acknowledge. The bridge crew watched intently as the tiny red icon on the tactical display continued inching towards the bright line indicating the Bion perimeter. No response. Flynn swallowed a curse. Maintain pursuit course. Chapter 12 Strike Battleship Argent BBV-740, Blackburn Jump Gate, Rho Theta System, Captain Jason Hunter Commanding. After what seemed like days, First Watch finally rotated off duty, and Sabrina began her search for her cabin. All she wanted to do was fall face-first into something resembling a bed and be unconscious until after the war. Aboard a ship of the line, senior officers were all traditionally berthed on Deck 4. That much, at least, Mallory had figured out— but Deck 4 wasn't just one corridor with numbers on the doors. There was the officer's mess, and then the officer's briefing, and the other officer's briefing, and then the cafeteria. 
By the time she had mapped all the rabbit warrens and twisty passages leading away from just the center deck magneto lift corridor, she had passed the same sentry marine and returned a salute from the same sentry marine four times. Finally, Sabrina managed to remember to remove her cover, which relieved the marine of his duty to salute each time she wandered by. Had Deck 4 been a motel, she would have been the guest looking for the ice machine at midnight. She was thankful the young Marine didn't say anything, as it would have been the height of embarrassment for a Marine PFC to ask a fleet acting commander if she knew where she was supposed to be going. The fact he was a strikingly handsome black man with the physique of Apollo himself and stood a foot taller than the exhausted XO didn't help much either. Marines in general, and deck sentries in particular, were trained to speak only when spoken to, so if the saga of the executive officer who never got to sleep aboard her new command was going to be solved, it was up to her. Private, would you be so kind? Aye, ma'am. Without waiting for another word, the Marine led Sabrina around the corner to the second lateral corridor and around one more turn to an alcove with a single cabin door. The quartermaster's mate had your personal items delivered at 1400. Officer's mess is open all night. Sabrina returned her fifth salute, and the sentry returned to his post. She suspected he had been prepared to help from the moment she stepped out of the lift. But instead, he skillfully exercised his personal discretion and refrained from interrupting the acting commander on the grounds that privates first class generally did not presume to advise acting commanders, even ones dangerously close to unconsciousness. Next to the cabin door was a newly engraved nameplate with a silver oak leaf emblazoned above it. Commander Sabrina Mallory, Executive Officer. Her face flushed. Jason had only appointed her an acting commander. She would have to get that fixed somehow. She gingerly opened the cabin and peered inside as if entering an enchanted library for the first time. All she needed was a burning torch and a map. The lights glowed to life automatically. Sabrina stood in the entry and gaped. The cabin looked like a palace compared to what she had aboard Fury. There was a desk and a bookshelf, of all things. The entire far wall was an immense floor-to-ceiling convex bay window overlooking the portside flight deck facility and the sweeping 600-foot-long armored wing of the ship. She would no longer be sleeping in a rack. That much was certain. Now she had a queen-size bed occupying one entire corner of the room. The sink, restroom, and shower were set off from the rest of the cabin by built-ins and had their own door. On the opposite side of the spacious quarters was a door to the XO's private office. Sabrina peered inside. It was impeccably appointed and not much smaller than Captain Hunter's inboard cabin. There were two computer consoles. One was built into the wall near the entry door at eye level for a person of average height. It consisted only of a screen and a universal interface. The unit on the desk was more elaborate. Computer? Good evening, Commander. How can Argent help you this evening? What is the current temperature? 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Please activate 5% air conditioning until temperature reaches 72 degrees. A pleasant tone sounded. Moments later, a low hum indicated the environmental unit installed in the cabin ceiling had started. Another tone sounded. Sabrina took a pristine hardcover copy of Joseph Wamba's The Choir Boys down from the bookshelf and began leafing through the pages. It had been years since she had held a printed book. You have a message waiting, Commander. From? Jace Hunter. Sabrina shook off the unfamiliarity. She was still getting used to the idea of being addressed as Commander. Mallory sat at her desk and called up the message. Moments later, her former captain's face filled the console screen. Congratulations, Sabrina. Jace smiled that mischievous hunter smile. Mallory had already noticed Jason's version. There was no longer any doubt they were twins. Jace, what did you say that got me posted here? Admiral Powers asked. Then Jason asked. I told them the truth. It was either this or Exeter's center chair when Alvin moves on to his teaching job at the academy next year. This move puts you on track to become a line captain. But what about you and Fury? Oh, don't worry. There's six young hotshot lieutenants already gunning for your spot. I'm going to issue them all swords and shields and let them settle it on the flight deck. There's more than 5,600 officers and crew aboard this thing. I'm not ready for this. You saved my ship, Sabrina. You're as ready as you'll ever be. You'll be part of the reason Argent's SAR section will be at full capability by the time we are all back in theater. Don't forget your new digs relieve Commander Doverly of her moonlighting job. You left Fury better than you found her. That's the mark of a great XO. Jason's a fortunate man. 
I can't wait to see what you come up with on that behemoth. I have to say, I'm a little jealous I don't get to play with our new weapon systems anymore. Tell Tom I'm expecting great things from him. I will. He sends his regards, by the way. What do you think of all those fighters and gunships? It's overwhelming. I got a chance to meet our new SCOM. Lieutenant Roscoe's got some rambunctious boys and girls driving those Jackson cats, as they call them. They were all so nice and so supportive, too. We've been reinforced to five full-strength squadrons. Whoever is sending us back to Bayonne apparently isn't interested in subtlety. I've got a year's worth of training to complete in a few days. We've got the whole task force deployed across the perimeter. No matter where Atwell's forces pop out along the edge of Gitarn space, we'll be ready for them. They'll drive for Hallow's Moon and Bayonne. If they think they can knock out one or more of our base stations along the way, I think they'll try. Guarding all that real estate is going to be a big job. What can we do to help? You get that bastard if he so much as looks at Bayonne 3 again, Commander. We'll cover for you. Sabrina felt tears well. She tried her best to keep her bearing. Thank you, Jace. I don't deserve this, but thank you. Take care. The console screen returned to displaying Argent's raptor-emblazoned crest. Mallory picked up her book and carried it to the bed. She started reading. Ninety seconds later, she was asleep. Chapter 13. Jettison Active Reentry Operation Apache Blade. Argent Nemesis 4. Bayon 3 Exosphere. Pre-insertion checks were almost complete. Sergeant Alexander had already secured Sable in her canine customized assault capsule. To preserve the highest possible aerodynamics and to minimize the exposure of surface area to the torturous stresses of re-entering a planet's atmosphere, each of the Marine Special Forces capsules were built with no hard edges. They were designed by computer-assisted aerospace engineers to fly through an atmosphere like a frictionless bullet. Their shape provided an added benefit of making the high-speed single-occupant vehicles very hard to detect without precisely tuned scanning equipment pointed in exactly the right direction. Apache Blade was set for atmospheric insertion from an altitude of 141 miles. The Sergeant and K-9 would be accelerated from a powered launch rail in the Nemesis Corvette's ventral loading bay into open space at a velocity of nearly 20,000 miles an hour. Their assault capsules were controlled by specialized versions of the same navigational computers used by Skywatch warships. The computer's job was to use each capsule's onboard maneuvering thrusters to guide the two Marines through the Bayon skies to an LZ no more than 20 yards from the location Captain Hunter had chosen. The Apache Blade LZ was designated in a relatively well-concealed valley only six miles from the last reported position of Paladin 6-4. Sergeant Alexander performed a final check of his surface warfare equipment. Of particular interest was the Universal Atmos, atmospheric analysis and spectrometry, handheld and its backup. The two devices were the marine equivalent of the SRS systems aboard fighters, mechs, and gunships. They provided a way to passively detect movement, localize changes in air density and humidity, and gave individual soldiers the ability to find and analyze molecular compounds, energetic particles, and electromagnetic activity. From the ground, performing this kind of analysis was much more difficult than from the air, which was why the Skywatch Marine Atmos was one of the most overbuilt pieces of equipment in the fleet. It had been observed on more than one occasion that one of the chunky devices could probably be thrown out a window in orbit and re-enter on its own. On this operation, however, the sergeant had nothing to prove, so his ATMAS and backup were stowed in their fitted bays inside his capsule. Navigator, this is Apache. Blade is secured. Stand by for jettison in 60 seconds. A second Marine secured Alexander's utility harness and activated the assault capsule life support systems. Gentle lights glowed to life inside the 12-foot-tall, bullet-shaped capsule. The sergeant fastened the ten-point harness around his shoulders and legs. Automated magnetic systems pulled the thick straps tight, securing the Marine in his specialized crash couch. Bolted into the capsule's frame right next to Alexander was his lethal TK-95 plasma sniper rifle, known from one end of the fleet to the other as the Wraith. Ready, Sergeant? Alexander's eyes flashed. Recon. The two Marines locked hands in an arm wrestler's grasp and the sergeant slapped the younger soldier's arm a couple of times. Then he activated the sequencers and set the unit to seal itself for launch. The younger Marine keyed his comlink. Apache secured. Jettison in 20 seconds. As if she knew what was happening, Sable let out a single muffled bark, which the launch Marine took as a ready signal. 
The two capsules slid across the magnetic platform and lowered into the jettison rails. An orange light began rotating on the launch bay's ceiling, indicating an airlock pressure event was imminent. The launch marine activated the blast door mechanism, sealing himself and the rest of the ship off from the bay. The navigator in the corvette's second chair sat motionless, the curved edge of the planet's atmosphere reflected from his flight helmet's faceplate. On final approach, altitude 141.7, stand by to activate release sequencer. The Nemesis Corvette silently dove into a low orbit of Bayon 3. Its blast shielding and drive field began picking up ionization from the upper exosphere. The pilot noticed and configured his controls. With a skillful adjustment of the vessel's electronics, the Nemesis drive field's magnetic envelope altered and the glowing trail behind the small boat winked out. Otherwise, its approach was so quiet even the other two Skywatch vessels stationed at the planet's defensive perimeter didn't detect its presence or course. The silent black ship skated over the atmosphere and across the Terminator. The second of Bayon's twin suns disappeared behind the planet as the vessel transited at a velocity that would cover the full circumference of Bayon 3 in less than 70 minutes. The launch bay doors opened quietly, and the younger Marine caught his breath. He could see land features, clouds, and even a river. All were growing darker by the moment as the last reflections of Bayon sunlight faded away. The rail mechanisms locked into place and rolled out of their tracks, suspending the two assault capsules precariously over a 140-mile drop. Mark. The two capsules rocketed into space and vanished into the atmosphere. Apache Blade mission time T plus zero minutes. Package delivered. Vectoring 280 for Blackburn approach. Have a nice day. Nemesis 4 banked out of its orbital track and vanished into open space at full speed. Chapter 14, Strike Battleship Argent BBV-740, Blackburn Jumpgate, Rho Theta System, Captain Jason Hunter commanding. Yilly Curtis and Duncan Buckmaster strode into the boat bay to find Captain Hunter and Lieutenant Tixia standing under a stripped-down wildcat hull. There was nothing else in the bay except a bright overhead light illuminating the parked fighter hull. Engineer, Master Chief, it's time we had a technical powwow. Sir? Buckmaster asked. You come up with another crazy idea we need to hide from fleet? Oh, I've got a whole ship full of those, Cobb. What I need is something they've already thought of but can't make work. Now Zoni here spends all her spare time at Cats playing with her electronic building blocks, so that's why we're starting with a wildcat hull. And building what? Yili asked as she inspected the ventral wing surfaces. Without drive avionics or control circuitry. My long-suffering darling sister is telling stories about something called a picador, which maneuvers autonomously, launches a missile strike, and then flies away. The Sarn has them, which means Atwell does too. Indeed, Buckmaster said, folding his arms. I actually went and did the research myself, and I want to know why we can't do this. At least three big-budget development efforts went into this theory. Two were canceled for lack of further funding, but the third actually reached a prototype, which they ran out of money to test. I want to pick up where they left off. And you want to use a wildcat hull to mount the missiles? Yili asked. I didn't make that call. Diamonds did. Zoni looked as if she had just been nominated to the party committee by surprise. Hunter walked up to the nose of the fighter hull and indicated the extra components seated under the leading edge. This is where we install the jackrabbit module for both configurations. Up to now, it's all been an experimental thing, but after the Bayown engagement with the Invector Squadron, we've had a real-world test and we did it in combat. It was magical, Zoni said. I'm not entirely up to speed on that one, Cap, Buckmaster said. A full spread of sarn birds were chopped up like carrots in a stew by Zoni's system. She combined the Yellow Jacket launch control with an electronic warfare package and our data link. At range, her fighter leveraged Argent's targeting and combined it with her own and managed to increase fidelity by more than 35%. Any other single fighter would have had a better than 80% chance of being disabled or outright destroyed by those anti-fighter defenses. Granted, we used bolted-on energy mounts, but it still proves we have a working prototype. There's no way one jack could outrun or outmaneuver all those missiles, Yili said. At least not without electronic countermeasures. Zonies didn't have to. She shot them down. Then she sank a 40 ton destroyer with one torpedo. Buckmaster whistled. Nice going, Lieutenant. Rabbit with a gun, Yili added. 
All right. Now that my signals officer has given us a proof of concept and flown it in combat, I want the three of you to help us take the next step. All three Argent technology specialists waited expectantly. There was nothing they loved more than being assigned to implementing yet another of the captain's crazy ideas. It was like being part of a science fair with a five million ton clubhouse where they could build their contest entry. I want an autonomous weapons platform. And I want to manufacture it in numbers in Flight 2's machine shop. And I want it working right now. Buckmaster folded his arms. He looked delighted. His expression said, You've finally gone and done it. You've gone right loopy. I want to be able to load a platform just like this one. The captain patted the stripped hull of the Wildcat. I want to give it a target and I want it to fly to range, kill that target and come home. I want to put phantoms on it too. Not a chance, Yili said. SDAC missiles are way too much mass for a cat unless you want to launch them one at a time. At minimum, you need rotary mechanisms like Ajax and Jefferson's so you have something to absorb the kinetics. You fire an SDAC off a fixed mount attached to this thing, and the backblast will disrupt the drive field and rip it and the missile apart. Can't we yank out all the life support circuitry and compensate with better drive stabilizer emitters? Buckmaster asked. Only if the missiles bring their own internal reactors and independent navigation. The Wildcat is underpowered as it is. If we weigh it down with ship killers, it's just going to be a big block of unsteerable metal, Yili replied. There just isn't enough mass in this hull. Maybe we could find an alternative, Zoni offered. Do we really need heavy ordnance on an autonomous platform? Hunter kept quiet and listened. This was where his crew was at their best. It would only be a matter of time before they came up with the answer on their own. He only suggested phantoms because he knew it was a gold-plated conversation starter, especially with Yili in the room. Argent's chief engineer had a well-known and long-standing love-hate relationship with the Space Direct Acquisitions Combat, SDAC, weapons platform, which was one of the key reasons Hunter had chosen her for this command. We could fit hemlocks on it, but that would bankrupt Skywatch in about 30 minutes, Buckmaster said with a chuckle. What about energy weapons? If we could keep the thing alive long enough, energy would be a good choice, Zoni said. It certainly works on a jack. But jacks have pilots and electronics. You need a whole lot of energy weapons fire to add up to even the smallest S2S warhead. And if we're going to load the thing up with pilots and electronics, then what the hell do we need it for when we've already got five squadrons of fighters? Yili asked rhetorically. How about fusion torpedoes? Three officers and one chief turned to look. Standing in the boat bay hatch was none other than Acting Commander Sabrina Mallory, decked out in her new uniform complete with DSS Argent insignia. Now there's a woman who doesn't mess around, Buckmaster exclaimed. What's the advantage of torpedoes, Commander? Hunter asked in a raised voice. They have independent power packs, Mallory replied. Once armed, they can hold charge for an hour or more. Jaguars are also proximity weapons, meaning you don't necessarily need a clean lock. Interesting, Yili muttered, scanning the wildcat hull again with new appreciation. The weapon itself has almost no mass, since it's all potential energy. The rest is electronics. No fuel, no avionics. Doesn't need radiation shielding like the hemlock would, Zoni added. What about targeting? Can we feed it targets if we add it to our data link? I don't see why not, Mallory said. I ran the Mark II systems aboard Fury through their simulation batteries. The system relies on internal targeting circuitry, but Fury's entire weapons package is 2-gen data link compatible. In fact, it's future-proofed for 3-gen. Now all we need is some fusion torpedoes, Buckmaster said. I know where to get some, Hunter replied. Oh, Cobb said with a grin. Think we can just put in a request at Vicksburg? I didn't say it was going to be legal, the captain said with a mischievous raised eyebrow. What if I told you I have half of my sister's supply of Jaguars stacked in an out-of-the-way locker on Flight 3? Say again, Buckmaster sputtered, pretending to be outraged that the captain was smuggling weapons on the Master Chief's flight decks. Don't worry about customs. They're marked as winter socks. Cobb chuckled and shook his head. Ely stared up into the Wildcat's drive field circuitry for a few moments. Show me where they are and let me borrow Zoni for a while and we'll make it work. What will we have if you succeed? Hell on horseback. Chapter 15. 
Assault Squadron 808, Bayon 3 Perimeter, Gaitern Sector 2, Lieutenant Commander Raymond Flynn Commanding. The roar on Ray Flynn's bridge made it sound like they were piloting a steam locomotive at top speed. Hostile contact Whiskey India 5, now 3 million miles in closing, target engaging evasive maneuvers. Flynn sat resolute at the con. Stay with them, Helm. Stand by long-range energy batteries. If we get a clear shot, I want to disrupt their drive field first. Now, veering back on their original course, estimating system perimeter in 12 minutes. Tactical. How close are we going to get before we hit the Bion perimeter? We'll barely break 3 million miles range, sir. It's taking everything we have to maintain pursuit velocity unless we drop our field for continuous acceleration. Signals open a channel to Jester, Flynn barked. He waited a moment while the channel switched over. Dutch, we're too fat and slow for this kind of thing. What have you got that can help us? Captain Holland's delightful laugh filled the Constellation's bridge alongside the rumbling noise from the vessel's overworked engines. If you'll give me permission to maneuver, we'll catch the little bastard. Sure as mud after rain. Well, I know you're a big fan of the rulebook, Captain, but I... Threat board, proximity alarm. The destroyer's auto systems shifted the bridge lights red. Only a potential disaster could trip a warship's alert system so suddenly without a watch officer's orders. Report, Flynn shouted. New contact, in space and approaching fast. Metal-cased object, no emissions. A spear of fire stabbed the captain straight through his midsection. He briefly glimpsed the deaths of more than 200 Skywatch crew and then went into immediate action. Helm, hard over. Breakaway course 355. All ahead emergency flank speed. The pilot of the privateer frigate escorting the Constellation from her port quarter saw his own life flash before his eyes as the relatively monstrous hull of the larger warship suddenly swerved in the direction of his starboard wing. The frigate Harlequin reacted in time, but mistakenly tried to roll over the destroyer's leading edge instead of banking with the maneuver as a fighter pilot might. The resulting closure rate overflew both ships' magnetic envelopes and caused their drive fields to arc. A massive discharge of ionized electricity spidered around the Constellation's hull and fed back on the smaller frigate in a fraction of a second. A fiery explosion trailed across space as the Harlequin was ripped off course and thrown aside like a slipped shoe. A thundering disruption wave rattled the deck plates throughout Constellation. She fell away from the formation, rolling to port, desperately trying to avoid the tumbling object rocketing towards her from the trail of Whiskey India 5. We'll never clear the track, Captain. Impact in six seconds. Reflex batteries forward. Fire. Point blank. Three emplacements swiveled away from the destroyer's diving course and fired back across the navigational track. Furious energy beams strobed from the high-mount particle batteries, bracketing the projected track of the killer object as it screamed towards its target. At a disastrous range of only 71 miles, one of the beams pierced the warhead's center mass. A 100-megaton fusion explosion lit up Bayonne space like a small star, then faded. Captain Holland McGee tried to blink away the afterimages from the explosion. He lowered his hand from his eyes and made a snap decision. Open a channel. The lead frigate's hailing circuitry instantly established a data net with the rest of the assault squadron. You're on, Skipper. All birds, this is Jolly. I'm taking command of the formation. Maintain pursuit course. Target Whiskey India 5. All ahead battle speed. The enemy contact raced across the Bayon perimeter. Minutes later, 7A's 808 frigates came screaming out of the system in pursuit. The tactical officer aboard the crippled destroyer constellation watched the enemy contact vanish. Moments later, the last AS-808 frigate entered the Prairie Grove jump gate and winked out. Chapter 16 War Destroyer Exeter DDX-8043 Bayon 3 Orbit, Lt. Commander Alvin Pierce Commanding The combination blessing and curse of station duty was the unavoidable boredom, with the exception of shift changes, there was literally nothing interesting likely to happen in a war destroyer's CIC when it and the rest of the fleet were waiting for high-ranking officers to finish doing whatever it was high-ranking officers did before the shooting started. On this particular late evening, at least by Starhaven time, Lt. J.G. Brittany Hawkins, two Green Ensigns and a Battalion Marine were the only souls on DSS Exeter's SRS deck. They were all gathered in a small cabin surrounded by some of the most precisely tuned military hardware known to man. 
The only reason any of them were posted to CIC and doing anything more consequential than folding towels was because regulations demanded it. All fleet vessels were required to have minimal space lane clearance personnel on duty, plus a watch officer and at least one working engine, even if they were nothing more than a police corvette. At this particular moment, there were supposed to be no fewer than ten screening vessels accompanying Exeter. The chances of her sensors picking up something before Constellation and the 808th returned, or the Argent's combat space patrol arrived, were minimal. Lieutenant Hawkins had drawn the short straw, at least by her own reckoning. She was pretty sure it wasn't punishment for the Station 19 incident, even though Commander Hunter's speech was still fresh in her mind. No, this was just the universe doing what it did best, making the lieutenant sit and watch a screen that never changed, except for the Starhaven chronometer beacon readout in the upper right-hand corner. To be fair, Hawkins had redeemed herself somewhat during the Scorpion 1-3 engagement, but she still had a nagging suspicion someone in charge had posted her to the SRS graveyard shift out of either annoyance or mild antagonism. Unlike some of her colleagues, Hawkins often managed to stay at full alertness throughout her shift. Other officers had been known to allow their attention spans to drift, sometimes to their own detriment. Commander Hunter's lack of tolerance for laziness was legendary after all. Hawkins and her closest friends in the censor section had considered several alternative explanations, Maybe she was being prepped for a supervisory assignment? This was the fourth time in a week she had been formally posted to a command, such as it was. She was the ranking officer in the room, even though the combined ranks of the others assigned to her station weren't all that impressive. She was smiling and imagining what Ensign Jameson would think if she were actually posted to a bridge tactical post when something changed on her readout for the first time in days. And then it vanished. SRS to bridge. Requesting clearance to engage battle computer. Acknowledge. A pause. Affirmative, SRS. The requisite systems indicators cleared on Hawkins' console and she configured the analytical interface with well-practiced efficiency. After the Scorpion 1-3 engagement, Hawkins at the very least always managed to get permission to use the battle computer. Exeter's internal circuitry came to life module by module as the transfer board gathered all the new telemetry and began running it through the standard tests. Another indicator activated as the strange readings returned. Then it went dark as if someone had flipped a switch. Brittany could have sworn she heard the switch click. Paul, are you running a diagnostic cycle? Negative, ma'am. We're not scheduled for any tests today. The strange readings returned, then vanished. Okay, I've got an unidentified contact with a Skywatch authorization code bearing 105 approximately 600,000 miles off the Bayon perimeter. The transmission has sector beacon headers, but is cutting off at exactly the halfway mark on every pulse. Why would Bayon have a random repeater that far out of position? Is there anything in the flight logs? Paul asked. Check that for me, Hawkins replied. The comm console beeped. SRS bridge, I have revenge on priority frequency. On speakers. Exeter, this is Revenge SRS Ensign Hill. Confirm new readings designated Everest 946, bearing 104 relative. We've got it, Revenge. Stand by. Brittany waited impatiently as Exeter's battle computer raced through the last pass against the initial contact data. The report appeared on the analysis console. SRS Bridge, I have 14th Infantry Ground Control on priority frequency. Patch them into the net with Revenge, Bridge. Affirmative. Garrison, this is Exeter SRS Lieutenant Hawkins. Can you confirm unidentified contact readings designated Everest 946 bearing 107 relative? Affirmative. I have an intermittent 2x2 two two signal. It's fluctuating, but there's something out there. Battle computer thinks it's a misconfigured transmitter, Hawkins reported. Maybe one of the civilian repeaters is out of position? What the hell is a civilian transmitter doing with a Skywatch code, and one that's no longer even being used? Paul thought out loud. A civvy transmitter is what we got after the first pass too, Exeter, the Revenge SRS officer replied. But now it's moving. Say again? Contact Everest 946 is moving. We're picking up the same broadcast pattern on every cycle. The headers indicate an 8-second transmission, but it cuts off at 3.9 seconds every time. Hawkins thought for a moment. Repeaters don't move, Garrison. Agreed, Lieutenant, came the response. Another set of inconclusive readings. Given the strategic situation, however, this time there was no room for hesitation. Bridge, SRS, get me the officer of the watch. 
Lieutenant Gibson has the con. Report. Hawkins stared at her screen. By now she was on her feet. SRS Bridge. Report. Exeter, this is Bayon Ground Control. Unidentified contact Everest 946 is altering course. Possible change in target aspect. Now 510,000 miles off the formation defense perimeter and closing. Now it was Gibson's voice. Lieutenant, report. Oh no, Hawkins whispered. It all became sickly visible on her screen at once. She didn't know what ship it was, but one thing was clear. It wasn't Skywatch. A moment later it vanished. Bridge, SRS, patch us into the command emergency net. Signal station 0 Juliet 8. Lieutenant, what the hell is going on? The bridge channel roared. Fine, I'll do it myself, Hawkins half growled. She slammed a fist down on the SRS scram bar and rapidly configured her communications array, switching transmitters over to the fleet-wide channels. The other two officers at the SRS console fumbled with their headphones. The battalion marine at the hatch raised his weapon to the ready. Finally, the transmitter channel switched over. Attention all stations. Attention all stations. This is signal station 0 Juliet 8. Three black-suited humanoids appeared out of thin air at the far end of the SRS facility. The battalion marine downed one before a barrage of destructive weapons fire exploded all over the cabin. Hawkins dove for cover. Pieces of metal, sparks, fiery debris, and particle weapons fire screamed overhead. Hawkins rolled and drew her sidearm just in time to see Paul's body hit the deck. She looked up. One of the intruders grappled with the Marine and was instantly killed by a snapped neck. A TK-40 round discharged into the ceiling a moment before the fire suppression systems activated. Hawkins nearly crushed her comlink in her fist. Intruders! Deck 4 SRS! Intruders! The officer of the watch didn't waste a second. He grabbed the handset out of the overhead console and gave the order to repel borders. Since the last two engagements with unidentified attackers, Exeter's readiness profile had been raised considerably, and Captain Cleghorn's 1st Marine Company was ready. Shock squads had been stationed at key locations around the ship, and the deck alert subsystems had been retuned to detect and localize sudden appearances and disappearances of enemy personnel. Had those new systems been neglected, Exeter's bridge crew never would have known the attacker's apparent objective wasn't the short-range scanner section. It was Exeter's engine room. A savage exchange of energy weapons fire ripped through the radiation shielding control complex on Exeter's fifth deck. At least ten intruders were advancing on the warship's reactor systems, and their weaponry and tactics indicated they were likely to be an extreme challenge for the eight-strong squad of security infantry guarding the engine room blast doors. Explosions strobed and white-hot plasma hissed up and down the entry approach. Scorch marks began to accumulate on the bulkheads as the call went out for reinforcements. By now there were two dozen attackers. The battalion corporal in charge of the squad was on his comlink coordinating his defense with the approaching backup when a satchel charge winked into existence only five yards away from the magnetically sealed blast doors. The bridge crew aboard Revenge had just been alerted to the unfolding crisis aboard Exeter when the helm officer noticed a sudden and potentially dangerous change in the war destroyer's course. Commander Enright reached the bridge in time to see the image of Exeter on the view screen begin to roll out of position. An instant later, her engines exploded into a scattered field of fiery debris. Radiation and atmosphere trailed as the immolated starship began to spiral towards Bion's atmosphere. There was a scarce moment of hesitation aboard Revenge as the commander fought through what was left of his fight-or-flight instinct. He began shouting orders while his highly trained crew hurriedly fastened their crash harnesses. The assault cruiser's powerful battle screens came up a few moments later and power surged through her lethal proximity cannon. But despite all the power at his command, there was little he could do for his fleetmate. Exeter was now cavitating inside her own drive field. Static electric discharges began to superheat the ozone and plasma in the exosphere, causing the leading edge of the ship to glow. Within 15 seconds, Exeter was fully obscured by the fireball trailing it through Bayonne 3's atmosphere. The ship was no longer under power and had no way to change aspects to avoid tumbling through her entire re-entry track. A 600-mile-long trail of fire dove towards the eastern ocean. Chapter 17 Strike Battleship Argent BBV-740, Blackburn Jumpgate, Rho Theta System, Captain Jason Hunter Commanding. 
The simulator section petty officer almost tumbled to the floor when Commander Mallory rounded the corner and made her way up the well-lit corridor towards the war games complex. The simulator facilities weren't generally scheduled to be in use during preparations for real-world action. The only reason anyone was even posted to them was to make certain any malfunctions or potential electronics issues were promptly reported to the appropriate engineering crew. He ran out of his small station office and scrambled to catch up. Another battery of tests, ma'am? Don't worry, petty officer. I'll overlook the fact you were reading on duty provided I don't see it again. The station tech resisted the urge to breathe a sigh of relief. Aye, ma'am. Load Carthaginian sunset at station 12. The tech hurried to keep up with his single-minded exec. Mallory was always at her best early. She was often up before the rest of her shipmates and prided herself on getting at least something useful done before her first duty rotation. With respect, ma'am, that's a grueling simulation you failed yesterday and the day before. Are you sure you wouldn't prefer something with a little less octane? It's the last test on my qualification battery. I have to get it right at least once. Argent deploys in 11 hours. That sim will tear you apart, ma'am. It's a lot to ask in the best of circumstances. You've been hitting the war games pretty hard the past couple days. All the better to be prepared, petty officer. Mallory entered her security keys into the simulation center's main entrance console and waited for Argent's internal sensors to verify her vital signs. Identify. Acting Commander Sabrina Mallory, Executive Officer DSS Argent. Identifier Kingfisher 4301. She placed her hand on the biometrics pad. A blue light illuminated the edges around her fingers for a moment as the life sciences computer compared her fingerprints and circulatory patterns to her medical records. Identity confirmed. Welcome to Argent's War Game Simulation Complex, Commander. You have completed 17 of 19 requirements in your Space Wing Qualification Preliminary Batteries with a score of 2447 out of a possible 2800 points. Give me 60 seconds, Mallory said. Aye, the petty officer replied. The enormous convex doors rotated away with a whisper, allowing Mallory into the long hallway that housed the entrances to mock-ups of Argent's control complexes. Some were engineering stations. Others were life support, damage control, medical, flight deck, and load lane consoles. The commander bypassed them all. She was headed for Argent's bridge, specifically the Force Command station from which Argent's formidable space wing was deployed. Mallory was more than hyped for this. She had been studying the Mediterranean gambit for days now, and she was pretty sure she had identified a key flaw in the enemy fleet's strategic launch sequence. She was very interested to see if her theory could be put into practice. It wasn't anything spectacular. Ultimately, it came to her late one evening when she was poring over the optimal flight readiness profile for the first-generation Wildcat fighters. The Wildcat had been designed before space-to-space -space missiles had become practical. Cats were medium-range, underpowered, and over-armored energy-armed interceptors designed to operate in wings of four to five at a time. Their primary mission was to shoot down enemy fighters and to provide cover and escort for heavier multi-role platforms like the Paladin bombers and the newer Yellow Jacket fighters and their high-tech missiles. Their key feature was they could absorb a lot of punishment while protecting expensively trained pilots. The reason Wildcats had remained a fleet workhorse for so long is because they were relatively cheap to manufacture in numbers compared to the more advanced Yellow Jackets and because Skywatch had been training pilots in the idiosyncrasies of energy weapons for decades longer than space-to-space -space missiles. Commander Mallory had already considered the fact her new captain's active duty career began with the first-generation Yellow Jacket fighter. Hunter Squadron hadn't flown cats, at least not for any significant amount of time. She was beginning to understand the Hunter family's rationale for assigning her to this role. The former Force Commander and exec Anora Doverly was a jack driver through and through. Her entire flight education had centered on the advanced missile capabilities of her ships. The storied Dr. Blood was also the equal of any other pilot in the squadron when it came to combat effectiveness, but that effectiveness was always going to be colored by her favored weapon, the Jack. Commander Mallory, on the other hand, wasn't a pilot. She was a strategic expert. Fleet had given her just enough time to get familiar with Fury's weapon upgrades and then shipped her off to Argent where the captain planned to give her command of 94 fighters, 70 of which were wildcats. There had to be a reason for all this. Junior officers didn't have the perspective to understand it, but the newly minted acting commander was beginning to figure it out. 
Doverly was always going to be limited and biased by her experience. Captain Hunter's superiors had likely recognized that fact and decided they wanted someone in command of the space wing with less specific preferences. The truth was, Katz had a significant advantage over Jack's, and that was their ability to remain on station in combat. Once a Yellow Jacket had launched its weapons, it had to rotate back to base to reload and refuel. It had once been explained to Sabrina that jacks were the space equivalent of torpedo planes. If they got a hit, they could severely damage or destroy an enemy warship. But they only got a few shots in even the best of circumstances. It was true jacks could mount more than one torpedo and carry dozens of missiles. But there was only so much ordnance one fighter could practically carry and remain maneuverable enough to avoid the enemy. Even though each fighter had a fusion plant and enough power to light up dozens of residential neighborhoods, it was necessary to realign and recalibrate each reactor on launch. This was the primary justification for the capsule reactor technology that allowed fusion plants to be swapped out of fighters like spare tires on a race car. Argent's deck crews had the entire cycle time down to four minutes, which was at the high end of the Skywatch fleet average. Jack weapons made a bigger splash naturally. They could fire Bullfrog oxygen compression torpedoes and Hemlock antimatter warheads. They could be fitted with kinetic weapons capable of opening enemy starships like cans of potatoes. They could even launch short-range sprint missiles designed to avoid enemy point defense by closing range much faster and saturating enemy fire control. There were credible rumors Zoni had put in for short-range energy mounts both forward and aft to give the newer fighters at least some energy capabilities. But even the short-range jack mounts were a pale shadow of the weapons a wildcat carried. They could get a pilot out of a bind, but they were going to need a ton of development time before they got to the point where they would match the equivalent effectiveness of a yellow jacket combat missile loadout or a cat's guns. Eventually, inevitably, jacks simply ran out of ammunition. Cats didn't. A wildcat squadron could remain on station for hours if necessary, and every fighter would always have offensive capability. Sabrina was certain this strategic advantage was part of the reason she had been brought to Argent. Her experience with Fury's advanced weapons package and her rating on the smaller warship's new engagement envelope had some connection to Argent's space wing. There was something about wildcat fighters she was destined to discover. The captain expected her to figure it out, and she was pretty sure she was on the right track. She arrived at the bridge simulator and configured the exterior control console. The complex itself was little more than a metal lattice floor extending the length of the corridor between high metal walls and a dozen or more entry hatches. The doors were spaced far enough apart to accommodate the largest of the simulation stations at the far end of the complex. Mallory was standing at Simulator 12. The console displayed a scrolling readout of Mallory's pre-selected mission orders along with the configuration data for the mechanism and its electronics. The commander knew the moment the door opened, the clock would start, and the simulation would react as if she had just arrived on the bridge. Her communications with other crew members would all take place over the comm system and various video displays. Everything was pre-recorded, right down to the carefully selected tones sounded by the battle and navigational computers. If the commander got everything right, her fighters would have sufficient strength, numbers, and fuel to remain active over the target zone for more total minutes than the enemy squadrons. Carthaginian Sunset was less an exercise in winning by attrition and more an exercise in winning by logistics. Mallory had learned that lesson the hard way. Her first attempt at this particular simulation ended abruptly when she was sneak attacked by a hidden carrier with 60% of her fighter strength rearming on Argent's flight decks. She was reminded of the story she had read about the fateful engagement between the Imperial Japanese Navy and American carriers at Midway Island. She knew her operational tempo could not afford to be bogged down in logistical problems, so she spent an inordinate amount of time studying that defeat before she attempted the sim again. She had been more successful the second time around, but her performance had still been judged a failure. This test was the foundation for her force command rating. There was no way to avoid it. She had to pass. This time, she was determined to win. The clock hit zero and began counting the seconds in the positive column. The doors opened. Sound general quarters, Mallory barked into her comm link. The bridge simulator lights shifted red as the doors closed. Chapter 18. Operation Crimson Thunder. Recon Team Apache Blade. Triad Jungle Lowlands, Bayonne 3, approximately 171 miles southwest of Lethe Deeps.
Within minutes of his re-entry capsule's touchdown on Bayonne Three's surface, Sergeant Alexander had completed his second equipment check. Two look-down probes had already been launched. One was tracking Sable's location and processing the data uploads from her electronics harness. The second probe was watching the first and keeping watch for any potential aerial hazards. The Recon K-9 was first to emerge from her capsule. Sable was already equipped with a life support system customized for German shepherds of her weight. She immediately bolted for the trees and set up a patrol perimeter on higher ground 200 yards away. Her weapons array was set to cover the sergeant's position while he completed mission checks. With two armed Marines, any hostile contact could be fired upon from at least two different vectors, confusing potential enemies and making them think Apache Blade might be a squad of infantry instead of a recon team. Skywatch Special Forces were experts at using this kind of confusion in their favor. After his own life support was secured, Alexander rapidly worked through the standard checklist, making every attempt to sync his electronics with any localized subspace, wideband, data, transponder, or radio transmission source. Skywatch Electronics would be broadcasting an encrypted carrier stream which his equipment could detect, categorize, and process, bringing any important information to the sergeant's attention and recording everything else for later analysis. Naturally, his own equipment was dark. Further, all of his transmitters were broadcasting the equivalent of a hole in midair. Any incoming scanner pass, radar pass, life sign sensor, or anything else that might give his position away would be detected by his own sophisticated equipment and responded to with false readings, no readings, or the electromagnetic equivalent of noise cancelling. The Recon Com Array was essentially a cloaking device for people, K-9S and landing capsules. Sergeant Alexander could be standing in a 10-acre parking lot with an audience and a spotlight shining on him and electronically vanish into thin air with the press of a button. Televised magic acts didn't come close. The two landing capsules used their external shield emitters to scatter dirt, mud, and plants around themselves for camouflage. Meanwhile, their internal power supplies continued operating, storing battery power in the event the recon team needed to return to recharge weapons, life support, transmitters, or autonomous probes. Alexander's viewfinders rotated down across his eyes and his vision glowed to life with an augmented view of the land area around him. He was dressed in shock armor equipped with haptics, external shielding, power absorption surfaces, and control and communications mechanisms keyed to all his personal equipment. It wasn't the heavy power armor that Marine Amphibious Infantry used. It was the plausibly deniable, top-secret version the Special Forces preferred. He hefted his TK-95 rifle and performed all the necessary checks to make certain it was in working order. The recon sniper model was much longer than a standard-issue infantry TK-40, and some would say a little sleeker as well. The sergeant powered up his gravity suspension systems. One of the key technologies used by the Special Forces section was their boots. Each set of footwear was equipped with computer-controlled human-sized pinpoint maneuvering thrusters designed to help Marines navigate unfamiliar territory. Instead of slogging through a river, for example, a GSS-equipped Marine could hop across it in a few steps. If he or she came to an obstacle, they could quickly jump 10 to 20 feet vertically instead of making themselves a target with climbing equipment. Anytime they needed an assist, their boots would respond with a milliseconds-long burst of thruster energy. The footwear didn't make him any faster, but it certainly made him more agile. Alexander switched his viewfinder to Sable's view and got a magnificent picture of himself from a considerable distance. He slid that view to one side and called up the aerial views from his look-down probes. He activated the voice interface to his Surface Warfare Battle Computer, codenamed Ariane. Divide perimeter into 2,000 square foot sectors, exclude water and impassable terrain. Affirmative, search pattern on the board. Report all contacts. Unidentified energy source bearing 191, range 1600 yards. Deploy probe 2 to localize. Affirmative, ETA 40 seconds. Ariane spoke smoothly and confidently in a reassuring female soprano. Over decades of experience and study, Skywatch had determined that the female voice improved marine endurance, physiological readiness, and mental alertness for both male and female soldiers. There were numerous theories about this phenomenon. Ultimately, the rank and file put it down to the fact that having an all-seeing mom along just made Marines feel better. Skywatch scientists couldn't disagree. Ariane had been redesigned alongside the sight sound enhancements for space pilots.
the resulting 9% improvement in ground forces readiness and proficiency tests over a period of just 12 months was one of the most profound the Marine brass had ever seen. The sergeant moved swiftly along the tree line, keeping a short distance between his path and the shallow brook coming down from the higher ground to the north. Sable watched him pass by and stop to cover her advance. She silently moved to the next spot 30 yards ahead of the sergeant, then stopped to cover his advance. The range between the Apache Blade Recon Team and the unidentified contact began to close. Chapter 19 Assault Cruiser Revenge CA-220 Bayoni 3 Interdiction Zone Commander Patrick Enright Commanding New Contact Designate Atlantis 12 Bearing 290 degrees range 11 million miles on intercept course and closing the crew of Revenge was still in the process of organizing a rescue of their fleetmate Exeter when the signals section lit up. The SRS bridge officer verified the readings and performed a threat analysis. Course is consistent with a Blackburn transit, sir. Estimated time to intercept 27 minutes. Commander Enright swiveled his con chair to face the forward navigator's console. Straight through our own jump gate. Exactly what Jace was worried about, he muttered. Signals. Open a priority secured channel to Argent Force Command. Authorize all relays. Include our log entries and tracking for the last six hours. Note last known positions of Constellation, the 808th and Exeter. Notify Captain Hunter. I believe a first strike on the Bion system will commence in the next ten hours. Affirmative, Captain. Coding your message. Bosun, signal all decks. Sir, all frequencies are down. Subspace and loss transmitters are offline. We are being jammed by Atlantis-12. Either their timing is flawless or they knew what we could least afford, Enright muttered. Set alert condition 3. Tactical battle screens to maximum. Helm, take us out of orbit. New course 60 Mark 171. All ahead flank 2. Bridge crew members responded snappily to each of the commander's orders. Moments later, the bristling profile of the menacing assault cruiser banked out of the planet's magnetic field and began accelerating into open space. Enright's jaw tightened. The pit in his stomach ground away at his sense of honor at leaving any possible survivors behind in the Exeter wreck. But his duty to protect Bayonne 3 and the thousands of defenseless civilians on its surface took priority. Revenge needed more open space than most warships to fight at her maximum effectiveness. The commander knew better than most the danger of having his main battery proximity weapons too close to an atmosphere in the event of an all-out exchange. Revenge was one of the oldest ships in the Perseus line designed before many of the advances that had given rise to new classes of warship in the Rhode Island and Fury molds. Her plasma cannon were first-generation guns with massive heat sinks and relatively short range that relied on unstable charge loads to produce devastating explosive force on impact. Revenge was also the only ship under Jace's command with the ability to overload her weapons. In the hands of a skilled captain, such firepower amplified the effectiveness of Fury's escort cruisers considerably. With the bit in her teeth, Revenge could credibly match even Argent's gunnery in certain assault profiles. Although the Citadel-class Havoc guns had half a dozen firing modes and far longer range, when it came to sheer destructive force at closer assault ranges, there were few Skywatch vessels that could compete with venerable heavies like DSS Revenge and the other Dragoon-class cruisers and their variants. Captain Enright also knew his single ship would be completely outmatched if Bayon 3 was, in fact, the strike point for Atwell's attack. In orbit, Revenge was not only a clearer target, but was totally unable to maneuver in the event of a multi-pronged attack, or the sudden appearance of cloaked vessels, or a few of Hunter's fabled picadors. Tactical, do we have an emissions profile on Atlantis-12 yet? Negative, Captain. The battle comp is working on it. Enright thumped his fist against his chair arm. Is the contact turning with us? Negative, the navigator said. Contact on course for a high bay on three orbit. Notify Black Queen Revenge recommends she declare Aegis Protocol. Start the clock. Negative, sir. I can't pierce the interference in system. Enright muttered a curse. Navigator, I need to know if Atlantis 12 is a single, and I need to know now. You've got 60 seconds to get me an emissions profile or we're flying weapons hot into its teeth battle group or not. Working, Captain. Helm, plot an intercept course. Maintain speed. Chapter 20. 14th Infantry Garrison. Bayon 3. Lethe Deep's Perimeter. Major Darya Komanov commanding. 
It wasn't often human beings witnessed a 300,000-ton object moving at 14 miles a second surrounded by a fusion-powered electromagnetic force field in a planet's atmosphere, but for those on the ground within a thousand miles of Starhaven, that's exactly what was slicing through the sky at an altitude of more than 140 miles above Bayonne 3's surface. The Starship Exeter's navigational auto systems were still in operation and had managed to slow the vessel's out-of-control port roll to a manageable rate, but the destroyer's engines were completely out of commission, which meant there was no way to significantly alter the ship's course. A ghostly faraway light strobed and lit up the jungle floor in all directions, stopping Sergeant Alexander in his tracks. He watched quietly as the trail of fire soared over his position and disappeared beyond the tree line to the east. He briefly considered breaking radio silence to help coordinate a rescue, but ultimately decided against it. Realizing his personal ability to assist the 14th would involve transiting possibly hundreds of miles from his current position. It would have to be left to Komanov's garrison, as she would be much closer to the crippled vessel's impact point and would have the personnel and equipment to locate the ship and rescue her crew. It just so happened Komanov herself was standing just outside her base perimeter and carefully tracking Exeter's course. She had a pair of sophisticated range finders and was using them to gather what data she could. She also had the vessel's disaster beacon and quickly assigned her SRS section to the task of recording Exeter's exact impact point. Report. I, ma'am. Vessel will impact in four minutes. Current projected location will be 71 miles off the Starhaven Zone's eastern coast, near the Windward Island chain. Do we have a look down in that region? Komanov snapped. Negative. The closest is SATCOM 7. We can redeploy and get a high-resolution pass on the next orbit in 40 minutes. I need a look down in five minutes, Corporal. Sorry, ma'am. We can't do it with satellites. Very well. Get the crews to the gunships. I want them powered up and ready to scramble launch immediately. I'll have two SX-12S ready to move with them. Redeploy SATCOM-7 as our backup. I want to know exactly where that ship first touches the surface, and then I want to know its location moment by moment until she's on solid ground, underwater or other. Affirmative? Aye. Transmitting scramble orders now. By now, Exeter's smoking hull was corkscrewing through the clouds over the garrison's location. Flaming pieces of wreckage were streaming through the air around it. Komanov could only guess what was happening inside Commander Pierce's pitted, scorched ship, or what would happen if she hit the eastern ocean at speed. Given the physics involved, the most favorable outcome, if there was such a thing, would be for the vessel to graze the water at the shallowest possible impact angle in order to skip across the surface and potentially use friction with the ocean to slow down before a more significant impact. The disaster scenario would be if Exeter hit at a high angle. The energy discharge of an object that large going that fast would be bad enough. The fact Exeter was packed from bulkhead to bulkhead with weapons and fusion piles only made it worse. Her battle screens and drive field would mitigate the damage somewhat, but ultimately they would end up being the match put to 300,000 tons of what might as well be tightly packed hydrogen bombs traveling at Mach 65. The resulting detonation would likely vaporize several hundred cubic miles of ocean water, which could create an even bigger problem for the farms and fields to the west of the ocean. Danger was doing what it did best, multiplying on itself. 14th Infantry had minutes to respond, if that. Exeter disappeared into the cloud cover east of the garrison. In moments it would pass below Kamanov's horizon. The Major whispered a curse and ran for the alert center. The early warning board lit up in the garrison's operations complex. A moment later, the overhead voice channels activated and echoed through the halls and control rooms. Alert response officer, this is Skywatch. Clear all frequencies and stand by for an emergency action message from Black Queen. Acknowledge. The Marine ARO flipped two switches and picked up the handset at his control station. Affirmative, this is alert response at timeout 3-4 mark. Standing by to copy your message. Acknowledged, A.R.O. Now hear this. Now hear this. Scramble all alert spacecraft. Repeat. Scramble all alert spacecraft. Respond to Skywatch on deployment frequency SATCOM 7. Ground targets on the board. Bearing 99 degrees. Range unknown. The alert response officer picked up his handset and calmly activated his combat radar systems. Moments later, he brought the garrison STC matrix to full readiness. The internal power systems of all four gunships were warmed up, system checked, and activated at 5% power. Rotating yellow lights snapped on at various points in the hangar. 
Assault Wing Command, I have a valid emergency action message. Combat launch orders confirmed. STC is standing by. The pilot's barracks exploded in a storm of screaming alert klaxons and strobes. Nearly two dozen crew members leaped from chairs, racks, showers, couches, and even a weight room to sprint for their flight gear lockers. Not far from the garrison, two of Kamanov's prized SX-12 recon trackers abruptly pivoted away from their patrol stations and accelerated down a gentle grade toward Starhaven's western perimeter. Within moments, the two agile little vehicles had reached more than 70 miles per hour and were soaring over hills and bouncing their wheels off broken rocks as they raced to follow the fiery disaster in the sky over their position. Both trackers reported to the garrison's alert center they had scanner locks on the spiraling starship. Using what orbital resources they could, they immediately set up a network of tracking stations and began working on the problem of projecting Exeter's impact point. But even with their considerable ground speed, it would be some time before they could reach a position on Bion's surface from which they could render any kind of practical assistance. Inside the vehicle's chassis, the noise of its engines and hydraulic suspension systems roared like an avalanche. Alert response, this is Wolfpack 6. Engage ground telemetry reception on SATCOMNET 7 and stand by to receive position reports as they become available. Acknowledge. The ARO added the two trackers to the telemetry net and authorized their position reports throughout the network established by SATCOM 7. Moments later, the combined data from three satellites, the garrison radar systems, two trackers, one Razorback tank, and an unidentified aerial probe far to the west of the SX-12 position, all had DSS Exeter's impact point located. Komanov's gunships had 40 seconds to break the starship's horizon, or it was going to be nearly impossible to find its resting point, even if they did manage to pinpoint where the destroyer went down. Chapter 21. War Destroyer Exeter DDX-8043. Bayonne 3 Atmosphere. Lieutenant Commander Alvin Pierce commanding. A teeth-shattering explosion ripped through Exeter's bridge. By now, most of the officers were either strapped into their crash harnesses or holding on to one of the emergency tethers for dear life. All but two or three had blacked out by now. The ship continued spiraling, causing violent G-forces that prevented those that were still conscious from reaching the controls they needed to stabilize their course. The forward viewer displayed a vertigo-inducing high-resolution view of the pale sky turning around and around. Another barrage of whispery plasma blasted down the egress corridor and ripped the last of the debris from the magneto lift entrance. Corporal Henderson Byers ducked behind the pilot's console and caught the eye of one of the bridge officers. His jump pack boots were magnetically anchored to the deck plates. Without them, he would have been battered unconscious by now. The pressure release sensors in his combat suit were the only thing keeping him from passing out from the gravitational force. Using crude hand signals, he got the young, petty officer's attention. Byers couldn't be sure, but through all the smoke and sparks, he thought he saw an engineer's rating on the man's uniform. The Marine Corporal hoped the petty officer knew what to do if he gave him the chance. Byers nodded towards the navigational console and then indicated he would help the young man get to it. The petty officer glanced towards the egress corridor, then back to Byers. He nodded. Corporal Byers changed the setting in his boots from anchor contact to momentum contact. With three heavy steps, he moved from one side of the console to the other. Using mime-like hand signals, he encouraged the petty officer to detach the lock on his harness and hold it with his arm instead. Once the young man was free and able to leave his station, Byers held up his hand and counted down with his fingers. Five, four, three, two. The Marine exploded from cover and launched a conch round down the corridor. The unstable plasma bolt filled the bridge with bright light before disappearing into the smoke. An instant later, Byers fired a plasma bolt into it, causing an overload reaction and detonating the round in the lift hatch. The bulkheads and controls shuddered again as the explosion thumped and another blast of hot debris scattered across the deck. In the instant that followed, Byers physically lifted the petty officer out of his crash couch with one arm and placed him at the navigation console. He was now in the line of fire, but Byers was standing right behind his control panel with his formidable weapon aimed directly at his would-be attackers. The petty officer rapidly laced up the shock harness and locked himself into the navigator's crash couch. Commander Pierce coughed and struggled to turn far enough to see the Marine. His valiant attempt to save the ship was their only chance. Report! Altitude now 16 miles. Estimate impact in 84 seconds. Engage Navicomp and re-entry sequencers. 
Authorization Cougar 7559. Enemy weapons fire angrily flashed out of the magneto lifts, tearing energy-spitting gouges in the bridge ceiling. One bolt impacted the communications bank. Sparks showered down across the controls. Buyers ducked and rose again. A rapid-fire barrage ripped through the smoke. The shriek of energy impacts echoed. Despite the fact he might be vaporized at any moment, Petty Officer Darren Murphy quickly acclimated to the reoriented layout and activated the navigational computer. The main data banks were down, but he was able to quickly engage the auxiliary system. Exeter's maneuvering system accepted the command uploads and the computer engaged what was left of the enormous ship's thrusters. I have a power failure, sir. We're down to one auxiliary reactor. No response from engineering. A black-suited enemy fighter appeared in the main hatchway and leveled a heavy-looking weapon at the navigational console. Corporal Byers snap-aimed and fired at a range of perhaps eight yards. Two rounds punched into the attacker's chest and threw him back into a pile of torn and burning metal. His weapon clattered against the hatch. All engines and thrusters back full. Maintain power to drive field and life support only. Acknowledged. Stabilizing course on Axial 4-1. Three minutes to impact. Sound collision. As the bridge lights shifted yellow, the leading edge of the heavily armed warship began to glow as the vessel's hull started cavitating inside its own drive field again. The electromagnetic surface of the powerful shell around Exeter began to ionize atmosphere as the ship hurtled through the sky. The trail of fire rapidly became a soaring pattern of electrical discharges and rapidly accumulating clouds. In a matter of seconds, the ship herself was obscured in an expanding field of crystallizing water vapor and atmospheric ice. With the assistance of the maneuvering thrusters, Petty Officer Murphy managed to orient the ship's roll angle relative to the Bayonne 3 surface at an altitude of just over 21 miles. The drive field fluctuated as the internal systems worked to adapt to the frantic changes in atmosphere density, water content, and temperature. A mighty sonic boom erupted from the clouds, strobing across the eastern continent and water's edge as the war destroyer plunged towards the ocean. Partial engine power restored! Murphy shouted. His voice was barely audible over the roar on the bridge. Corporal Byers had his weapon trained on the egress hatch. For now it appeared the attackers were regrouping. All back full, Pierce shouted back. Set pitch to plus five relative. Get us down to 500 yards per second relative velocity, maximum altitude. Affirmative. Murphy fought to hold Exeter's course as Byers sidestepped heavily across the cluttered and damaged bridge to the main hatch. He held his rifle muzzle up and began working the security controls in an attempt to seal the bridge off from the rest of the ship. Forward velocity now seven miles per second and slowing. Pierce resisted the urge to breathe a sigh of relief. There were still a hundred things that could go wrong with this little excursion into a planet's atmosphere. While frigate-class vessels like Minstrel and Ajax were capable of intra-orbital flight modes and ostensibly capable of landing on a planet's surface, Destroyer hulls weren't designed for the kind of gravitational stresses and atmospheric pressures that resulted from amphibious operations. Exeter's assault boats, of course, were capable of transiting to just about any location, surface or otherwise, but the mothership was designed to operate in space. Re-entry, operating a drive field in an atmosphere and using ion-type engines through a planetary magnetic field, were all theoretically possible and had been attempted by far more experienced scientists and spacecraft designers before. Based on the available results, such flights were not recommended except in the gravest circumstances. Murphy brought up the vessel's navigational profile. Exeter's number 5 engine was still operational at roughly 70% capacity. The rest of the ship's main drive was dark, and the special systems display indicated no damage control parties were available. That last bit of information sent a chill up Murphy's neck. Where were they? Was the bridge crew all that had survived the initial explosion? Byers succeeded in configuring the security system. The reinforced blast door slammed over the main hatch, sealing off the bridge. A moment later, the vessel lunged as her drive field exploded through a miles-wide pocket of unstable turbulence. The crew members who were conscious held their shock harnesses tighter. Position report, Pierce shouted. Altitude now 12 miles, forward velocity 4 miles per second and slowing. It seemed to the commander his ship just might halt its perilous descent before impact. He started untangling himself from his shock harness. If the G-forces on the bridge subsided, his plan to get to the pilot station just might succeed.
Now that the attackers attempting to take the bridge had been temporarily blocked, he would have time to right Exeter's course and possibly get her back into space. Altitude now 9 miles, forward velocity 3,600 yards per second and slowing. When velocity breaks 500 yards per second, bring us to station keeping at maximum altitude. Aye, standing by to... The bridge lights went dark as the shock of a huge explosion rocked the entire vessel's structure. A secondary went off moments later, causing all the control surfaces on Exeter's bridge to flicker. The tactical console flashed, spewing sparks and composite debris into the air. The engineering bank went dark. Emergency lights, Pierce shouted. Manual operation. A stark glow was restored from a single LED in the aft section. Long shadows covered the floor and consoles. There was just enough light to illuminate the con and the forward consoles. The rest of the bridge was either submerged in shadows or completely dark. Engine 5 is offline, velocity increasing, station-keeping thrusters are overloaded, I can't hold altitude. Configure forward battle screens for maximum depth, set our defensive systems to absorb as much of the impact momentum as possible, stand by to engage fire suppression systems, all personnel engage emergency life support. Impact in 25 seconds. Chapter 22, Tarantula Hawk Assault Wing, Bayoni 3, Starhaven Protection Zone, Lieutenant J.G. Maxwell A.B. Commanding. Four fully crewed gunships continued their ascent over Komanov's Iron Keep garrison. Each pilot was seated forward of his or her commander and three crew specialists. With the precision any knowledgeable observer would expect, each spacecraft maintained its perfectly synchronized position in a standard diamond combat formation, resembling the attack profile popular with Wildcat squadrons and their flight leaders. The difference here was the T-Hawks were twice the displacement of even the heaviest cat, and their drive fields were tuned to fully support a wide variety of devastating firepower. ASO, this is night fever. All wings report full-spectrum combat readiness. Engaging interstellar drive fields now. Requesting instructions. Affirmative Command Wing 5. Vector 098 for ground targets. Your signal is buster. I say again, your signal is buster. Acknowledged ASO, vectoring 098 for intercept. Time out 40 seconds. Blackwing's lead gunship banked towards Starhaven in sync with her three squadron mates. Reaper 8, the Black Parakeet and Shadow Waltz maneuvered in formation with their flight leader. The Diamond Formation dove low over the northern fields as it moved towards the unidentified ground contacts along the eastern coast. The trailing gunship locked its sophisticated targeting systems on Exeter and added itself to the SATCOM-7 datanet. With the assistance of Wolfpack 6 and one of the far-off communication satellites, Reaper 8 calculated Exeter would impact the surface of Bayon 3's largest ocean more than 200 miles offshore. Fortunately, the warship was no longer headed for the Windward Island chain, but the offsetting problem was the further Exeter got from shore, the harder it was going to be to effect a proper rescue. ASO, this is night fever. We are tracking six unidentified hostile ground contacts bearing 116, range 45 miles. Request permission to arm. Major Kamanov grabbed the remote handset. Command 5, this is Black Queen. You are cleared to arm. Get me an ID pass if possible. Affirmative. All wings accelerate to attack speed and break formation for combat intercept. Lieutenant Abi's lead gunship banked to port as Reaper 8 and the Black Parakeet dove to starboard. A moment later, the formation broke 20 miles and started angling back towards the coast. Threat board! Hostile transmission sensors went off aboard all four vessels at once. The jangling tone sounded in every crew member's helmet. Engage panic reactors. Get me a targeting solution. Three gunships rocketed over farms and buildings, causing apocalyptic sonic booms that shattered windows and threw debris skyward. Black Queen, this is Black Parakeet. Battle Computer reports Sarn armor and mobile anti-aircraft batteries at coordinates 558 by 1673. We are being targeted for range. An alien vehicle parked behind a rocky outcropping less than a mile from the beach swiveled snap quick and rapidly launched nine ground-to-air rockets at the oncoming gunship. The missiles instantly registered six-point weapons locks on Black 7's flight track and accelerated to more than three miles a second closure velocity. Black 7's commander saw the combat telemetry and calmly ordered overload power to his forward screens. Punch through, pilot. Stand by your countergrav.
all nine enemy missiles slashed in on divergent vectors. Half-mile-wide bursts of fusion energy thumped along Black Seven's track, buffeting and rattling the angry vessel's screens with white-hot bursts of fiery destruction. Hundreds of tons of earth, rocks, trees, and sand exploded into the sky. Seven screens absorbed several million watts of energy from the impacts and poured it into the gunship's panic reactors. Divert all power to weapons! Seven roared out of the barrage and sliced low over the mobile SSPM battery. The sound of the drive field blasting through the Bayoun atmosphere slammed into the rocks like an oncoming train hauling 100 freight cars full of cement. The SSPMV's left side wheels landed back on solid ground a moment later, but by then the black parakeet had swerved back far enough to bring her heaviest weapons to bear. The gunship banked out of her turn and roared forward into a frighteningly precise strafing run. Fire! Seven opened up on the SSPMV's position. Oval-shaped bolts of unstable plasma punched into the ground like white hammers. The ground shook and finally erupted into a trailing violent fountain of flaming debris. The warship screamed overhead, leaving behind two half-mile-long craters and a 90-yard-wide fissure in the rock formation. Enemy vehicle screens are down. The SSPMV launched again, this time with five rockets. The tiny missiles tore through the sky, following Seven's drive field signature. For a moment, it looked as if the Sarn birds might score a direct hit, but the enemy ground commander wasn't ready for Black Three. Shadow Waltz broke weapons range on a zero-degree axial and came in on the SSPMV's position at an impossible altitude of less than 40 feet. By the time enemy fire control recognized the threat, it was several seconds too late. Multiple rounds punched through the vehicle's armor like cannonballs through a fishing net. Its power plant detonated with a violent blast, tossing the 60-ton vehicle into the air like a child's toy impaled on a column of fire. The secondaries from its remaining warheads vaporized most of its chassis before pieces of what remained rained down on the beach. Meanwhile, a Sarn armor company had crested a hill scarcely four miles downrange from the destroyed mobile surface-to-space missile vehicle. Black Five's battle computer caught their scanner signatures first and transmitted their designations to her three wingmates' threat boards. The Skywatch computers identified the units as Sarn Mark VI medium battle tanks, codenamed Hoplins. Black Queen, this is Night Fever. Sarn armor units confirmed. Repeat, Sarn infantry is down on the surface approximately 19 miles from the Starhaven Protection Zone. Five's commander gave the order to reconfigure his gunship's weapons for screen disruption. Black Seven and Black Three hovered into position a few hundred yards off the crest and locked their weapons on the enemy formation. The Sarn opened up first. Guided by overhead targeting drones, their main batteries flashed and thundered, rapidly filling the skies with mile-long lances of plasma energy. Disruptive strikes immolated the forward screens of the two heavily armored gunships. White-hot energy began to burn the ground for hundreds of yards in every direction as static bursts caused uncontrollable lightning to spider across the sand. Seven began to stagger under the unending firepower, skidding back against her own engines as the fires of vengeance raged around her. Finally, Shadow Waltz returned fire. A rancorous bombardment of cannon fire smothered the rightmost elements of the enemy column. Dozens of bolts, each the size of a railroad car, pulverized the ridge itself, throwing rock, sand, and all manner of debris into the sky, where secondary explosions blasted it all over the battlefield. The Black Parakeet joined in, launching an even more devastating hail of cannon fire into enemy armor and their formidable battle screens. The sound of the explosions roared out over the oceans and shattered the ground for miles in every direction. The Sarn tanks drew from auxiliary power sources and increased both the intensity and rate of their attacks. The disruptive energy began to interfere with the two gunships and their targeting systems. The pilot of Black 3 responded to an alert signal on his power board. Sir, we have 8% reactor capacity left, estimating 20 seconds to failure of our forward battle screens. Black 5, this is Black 3. We are disengaged. A Sarn SPM detonated overhead. The fusion-powered shockwave hit Black 3 hard enough to nearly overwhelm her engines. Only a quick maneuver by her pilot allowed the ship to avoid crashing into the beach. Shadow Waltz veered to port and went into an evasive roll as four more enemy birds screamed from behind the Sarn armor column. Three screens barely held against the proximity explosions. The last detonation knocked out her starboard engines and Reactor 3. The gunship redlined her systems to maintain altitude and limped out of range, flying more than 15 miles out over open water before veering back towards the garrison. 
Lieutenant A.B.'s ship saw the reinforcements first. His scanner tech rapidly identified at least two of the units as heavy Sarn Seacrops class armor. Ninth Intelligence was aware of the potential for highly dangerous land battleships and the Sarn propensity for big guns, but this was the first time they had been detected in action. They were heavier than Major Kamanov's Razorbacks, but rumored to be much slower and possibly underpowered as well. Nevertheless, if his scanner tech was right, the gunship wing was grossly overmatched. Black Five to all wings break off and return to base. Acknowledged, flight leader. Seven's pilot took the risk of punching his engines to maximum and flying directly over the Sarn column. It was a bold move, and fortunately for Kamanov's limited forces, it worked. None of the Sarn units were able to redirect their weapons in time to engage Seven before it emerged from the Sarn fire envelope. Reaper 8, meanwhile, was hovering at the edge of the protection zone more than 15 miles away. Its scanners were locked on the fire-trailing hull of the starship Exeter. The destroyer had broken five miles altitude and was still traveling at nearly two miles a second. All five of Eight's crew members knew what that meant. If Exeter impacted the ocean at that speed, even with her screens up, nobody aboard would survive. Chapter 23 Strike Battleship Argent BBV 740 Blackburn Jumpgate, Rho Theta System Captain Jason Hunter Commanding 2800 out of 2800. I have to say, XO, your reputation was not exaggerated. You've passed the Force Command battery with flying colors. Time to add a ribbon. Captain Hunter slid the box across his desk. The gleaming Skywatch emblem on its top was unique among all the symbols in the fleet. Only a box containing a medal, award, or ribbon carried such an emblem. Mallory suspected it contained her Force Command badge and ribbon, authorizing her to take charge of the Space Wing aboard a ship of the line. Thank you, sir. You might not have your rank yet, but you've just earned yourself the title of Force Commander. Take a seat. I've been going over our flight deck rotations. Now is as good a time as any to get up to speed on what your plans are for the wing. I've scheduled some time with Zack as well. I want him to get you familiar with our pilots and their reps. Commander Mallory took one of the electronic tablets and called up Argent's real-time readiness profile before seating herself across from the captain. I have to admit, sir, I'm not confident about my knowledge of T-Hawks or Paladins yet, but I did get a chance to go over Commander Doverly's report on our SAR Corvette wing and familiarized myself with the Mackinax. Very good. Marine Infantry Command will handle a lot of the Paladin deployments. The only time I use them in an offensive role is if we form up a fighter-escorted bomber run over a target like Scorpion 1-3. There's a good chance we're looking at that kind of operation over Bayonne. If enemy forces hit dirt with heavy armor or air cav, we're going to need to launch space-to-ground strikes on their bases. That's what paladins were built for. Agreed. I got far enough into the demonstration specs to see how well mechs and fighters work together. I expect T-Hawks and mechs are equally well matched. That's one of our most powerful options for amphibious operations. Gunships plus mechs creates a major problem for any assault force anchored around armor. What are your plans for my cats? I figured you were going to ask me about that, Mallory replied with a grin. I have some ideas about rotating pure sorties and mixing them in with missile runs. The bell sounded in Hunter's executive cabin. Come. The door whispered open. In stepped Zoni Tixia with an I-just-got-treated-to-a-free-lunch look on her face. Behind her was Yili, whose attention was fixated on a portable gas spectrometer. Seek and ye shall find, Captain. What have you got for me? Your presence is cordially requested in Forward Observation 4. Hunter pretended to look annoyed. You're not going to tell me, are you? Not a chance, sir. You have to see it first. The four officers took the magneto lifts to Deck 5 and then made their way along Argent's spacious portside crew transit. The ship was still buzzing with preparations for the upcoming confrontation over Bayonne, but the initial frenzy had been replaced with a quiet sense of anticipation like a championship football team with nothing to do but wait for kickoff. The group of officers arrived at Observation 4 to find Master Chief Buckmaster standing with his arms folded before the 70-foot-wide magnetically reinforced quartz pane. Behind the barrier was a magnificent view of Argent's quarter from almost 20 stories above her main hull. Welcome to the future, Captain Hunter. Duncan, I see my officers are corrupting my enlisted now with all this cloak and dagger. What's the big deal? Buckmaster nodded towards the open space beyond the observation deck. 
Parked at station keeping about 200 yards off Argent's leading edge was a strangely shaped wildcat fighter. Cobb handed Captain Hunter a small control unit. There's a drone 4,000 miles off Argent's bow. When you push that green button, it will register as hostile to that cat. You'll have to forgive me as I'm no poet, but I think you'll approve of what happens next. Hunter first raised an eyebrow at Cobb, then looked over his shoulder at Zoni and Sabrina. They both smiled innocently. You're all in on this, aren't you? Whatever could you be talking about, sir? Zoni replied in a sing-songy voice. Hunter glanced suspiciously at Cobb, then examined the little control unit. There was nothing to it but a blank screen and a mechanical green button. All right, let's see what happens here. The captain clicked the button and looked up. Outside the bay window, the wildcat hull came to life, pivoting 35 degrees and screaming into the distance. The panoramic heads-up display provided by the on-station Nemesis Corvette partially obscured the view as it filled the observation window with a follow-on camera angle of the fighter hull as it picked up speed. Unmanned, Hunter muttered. Never thought I'd see the day a ship could invent and manufacture, Cobb replied. A few moments later, the combat telemetry from the Wildcat hull produced a red-tinged overlay on the heads-up display. A target was in range and turning to run. The Wildcat banked in pursuit and kicked up its engines. The range closed rapidly, causing the drone to duck and swerve in a pre-programmed evasive pattern. A moment later, the cat's weapons armed and its targeting systems burned through the weak ECM signature of its target. A almost painfully white strobe from an energy discharge filled the display. Six Jaguar II fusion torpedoes shrieked into space and detonated in an over-under proximity attack. Both vessels pierced the barrage of trailing spherical explosions. The drone staggered and then tried to turn under the cat's heavy weapons. The next torpedo had its course projected with cold-blooded mathematical precision. Jaguar shots 7 and 8 pulverized the drone with simultaneous center-mass impacts. A superheated cloud of debris swirled through space. The four officers and the chief stared in open-mouthed shock as the cat returned and parked itself in exactly the same spot it had been waiting before. We have an autonomous fighter platform armed with fusion torpedoes, Hunter exhaled, and a jackrabbit module. Zoni rocked on her heels with a grin on her face that reminded the captain of a child at their first ice cream party. Mallory's wide-eyed face was three shades paler. Buckmaster looked like a man who had just been handed the keys to a sports car. Yili was still playing with her spectrometer. I only asked for this a few hours ago. What can we say? We work fast, Zoni replied. Well, to be fair, Yili works fast. We help fast. How many of these can we build, Cobb? Depends. How many do you... The deck lights shifted red. The clear channel tone sounded. Attention all decks. Attention all decks. Officer of the watch has set alert condition three. Stand by battle stations. Captain to the bridge. Deck officers report alert status to CIC. Timeout 3-5 mark. XO, Zoni with me. Yili, get me a combat status on our mains. Two minutes. Go. Five senior Argent officers sprinted for the lifts. Chapter 24. War Destroyer Exeter DDX-8043, Bayonne 3 Atmosphere. Lieutenant Commander Alvin Pierce commanding. Engine power restored. Altitude now six miles. All back full. Slow to station keeping. Set pitch to zero. Lieutenant Commander Alvin Pierce was almost out of breath. He felt as if his rapidly failing voice had been competing with the unnatural thundering roar on his bridge for hours, even though the explosion that had initially knocked out Exeter's engines had only taken place minutes ago. The constant lurches and jolts from his shock harness and the fact he had been hanging against the frame of his crash couch since the detonation weren't helping. Altitude 4 miles, forward velocity slowing again. 2,900 yards per second, impact in 15 seconds. Screens to maximum, offset absorption energy only. By all appearances, the few minutes of time Corporal Byers had bought for Exeter's bridge crew had been well invested. Instead of a disastrous hypersonic impact with the ocean, Exeter had slowed to the point where her screens, now extended to a maximum radius of almost a quarter of a mile, were configured such they just might absorb enough of the impact energy to save the crew. Whether that left behind enough of a ship to be worth rescuing was another matter. 2300. The ocean yawned ominously across Exeter's main viewer. The brief flashes of clouds reminded everyone watching just how fast they were still moving. 1900. 
Corporal Byers stood resolute at the electronically sealed egress hatch, weapon at the ready and listening for any sign the intruders were still attempting to gain access. He could only imagine the savage battle underway in engineering and the heroism that was keeping Engine 5 operational. 800 yards per second, bringing us to station keeping at 4-0. All stop! Petty Officer Murphy activated the Navicomp's flight mode controls. Even with four engines down, he hoped the sophisticated electronic systems would still be able to perform the intricate function of combining the power of Exeter's maneuvering thrusters and single engine to bring the ship to a complete stop and maintain hover altitude over the water. But something was wrong. Negative operation on Navicomp. Auxiliary systems report insufficient main power to offset forward momentum. We... Even from as far away as Starhaven, the scene played out sickly in the burnt skies over the Windward Island chain. The starship Exeter impacted the Bayoun Ocean at a six-degree negative pitch. Her battle screens managed to absorb a mind-boggling amount of kinetic energy before being crushed under the massive loads and pressure. The vessel's hull skipped off the water, careened another 8,000 yards, and finally slammed against the ocean's surface. 60,000 tons of seawater exploded into the air. Petty Officer Murphy was the only member of the bridge crew still conscious. He struggled through the pain of two broken ribs and a dislocated shoulder to watch in horror as the Bayoun sky was pushed out of view by the murky greenish water of the open sea. The emergency lights failed a few moments later. The life support alarm sounded, indicating power to the ship's air circulation and temperature maintenance systems had been cut somehow. As Exeter rapidly passed a depth of 500 feet, the main viewer failed, plunging the bridge into darkness. Wolfpack 6 and Black 8 both lost contact with Exeter's transponder in the storm of electronic warfare signatures being produced by the Sarn ground forces. What do we do, sir? The pilot of Black 8 was as much at a loss for words as everyone else on the flight deck. We return to base and prep an attack plan against that column, pilot. Those forces will be rolling into Starhaven in less than an hour. Notify Wolfpack 6 and set a course for the garrison. The pilot hesitated for a moment, hoping there was some outside chance they could avoid the Sarn weapons and get to Exeter's impact point. Then he glanced at his surface warfare scanners. The wedge of red indicators was enough to yank him back to the real world. Reaper 8 banked on her vertical axis and blasted away from the Starhaven perimeter. By the time Black 8 was out of range, the churn in the waters over Exeter's impact point had washed away. Chapter 25, Strike Battleship Argent BBV-740, Wexford Jump Gate, Bayon System. Captain Jason Hunter commanding. Zoni, are you absolutely sure that was Enright's designator? Aye, sir, but I couldn't read the rest. Either they stopped transmitting or they were jammed. Jason thumped his fist on the con armrest. They had a few hours to spare, if that. Bridge, this is Skywatch. Advise navigation officer we are tracking a wide SRS reflection wave bearing 015 Mark III on approach for the Bayon perimeter. Recommend ion storm protocols. Standing by. The cold shudder that swept the mighty battleship's bridge told the story. For any personnel inexperienced in the ways of open space hazards, a wide short-range scanner reflection meant only one thing. An ion storm. Argent had just emerged from the Wexford jump gate and was only minutes from entering the Bayon system itself. Jason and Jace both had agreed Argent's squadron should use the same entry course as the balance of the Perseus fleet had taken after the Hades incident, but they hadn't counted on this. The alternative was to take the Blackburn jump gate, but parking Argent right where her enemies were likeliest to look was vetoed by Jace first, and then again by her brother. Certain officers held the edges of their consoles a little tighter. The sound of the instruments and the subsonic hum of the engines set a deceptively soothing tone for what was just about the worst news a starship captain could hear. Lieutenant McInerney had just verified the preliminary readings gathered by the Skywatch observation station at the topmost point aboard Argent. She took a moment to patch the readings into the navigation console. Each warship's nerve center, so to speak, was crewed by scanner and sensor technicians and specialists, and traditionally placed where the crow's nest lookouts had resided aboard wet Navy sailing ships. Naturally, space encounters rarely provided either adversary with naked eye-range view of other nearby ships unless they were in some kind of review formation, so where the SRS and sensor crews were actually located was of only anecdotal concern. Still, the tradition of having the best-trained lookouts stationed in a Skywatch control center had stuck, 
In fact, it only took a few years before the entire core space fleet had adopted the imagery of Guardians watching the stars. Within a decade, Skywatch vessel combat information centers and Skywatch sections were so well integrated that bridge personnel could concentrate more heavily on instruments for signal processing, targeting, and weapons control and navigation. Opinion, pilot, Hunter said in a clipped tone. If we take the long course, it will add at least three hours to our transit time, sir, McInerney replied. We can't afford it. If Monarch is being jammed, Bayonne may not have three hours, Hunter mused. Tactical, ready a Type 4 probe. Target the leading edge of the wave's magnetic envelope and set for continuous broadcast at station-keeping coordinates contact negative 500 miles. Aye, Captain. The tactical officer turned to the satellite operations console and called up the first probe in the rotation. Microcode transmit in progress. Ready to launch in 20 seconds. Hunter turned to Sabrina's station. XO, alert all flight decks to prepare for unsafe maneuvers, secure radiation protocols, secure all outer doors and launch bays. Direct course? I don't think we have a choice, Hunter said with a tired-looking grin. There's just too much that's vulnerable on the surface. If they've gone this far out of their way to draw out those defenses, they're going to hit dirt soon, and we have to be there before they do. I'm worried about Dunkirk. Mallory replied. She's been through hell, and that's not counting the pounding she took at Barker's asteroid. Are you sure she can handle a storm at full speed? Cobb and Commander DeMay are two of the best. Both assured me she was ready. I'm taking their word for it. Mallory didn't press any further. Raising the question was her job. Questioning Hunter's orders on the bridge of his own ship was not. Aye, coding your orders. Commander Mallory began coding orders for her squadron leaders and technical personnel on all three of Argent's flight decks. Hunter grabbed the black handset from the console over the con. Engineering bridge. The captain waited patiently while the midship signal's relay connected the bridge. The phone that must be answered rang in the engine officer's nest overlooking fusion reactors 4 and 5 on deck 29. Engineering, Alan. Mike, we're coming up on an ion storm. Tell Yeely we'll need everything you've got. Affirmative. All mains online. Engines prepped for all flight modes. Standing by. Very well. Hunter clamped the handset back into the con command station. Zoni, advise the Dunkirk we are navigating a least time course from the jump gate approach to Bayonne 7's orbital track. Once the course is on the board, engage Navicomp telemetry to match course and speed exactly. I don't want us flying into the red zone out of position. Standing by for navigational data. Put me on. The tactical officer snapped his hands to his headphones. He flipped two controls and switched scopes. New contact. Unidentified inbound designate hostile. Kilowatt X-ray 1 bearing on a narrow vector. Hostile vessel on intercept course and closing. Hunter swiveled back to the navigation station. Range to distortion field? 600,000 miles. Slow formation. Ahead one quarter. Maintain alert condition 3. Stand by battle stations. Affirmative. Zoni set the auto-transmit to advise Dunkirk and reconfirmed Argent's alert status for all decks. Range to kilowatt X-ray 1? 1.7 million miles off our port quarter. They are inside our defense perimeter and slowing. Zoni, open a hailing frequency, Hunter snapped. You're on. Unidentified vessel. This is Captain Jason Hunter of the Skywatch battleship Argent. You have entered our command zone. Identify yourself immediately. The tactical officer switched the main view screen to display a real-time enhanced tactical view of the distant ship. By now it had come to a complete stop. Anything? Negative. No response on any channel. Any idea who our unannounced guest is? CIC says Battle Computer is working on it, sir, Ensign McBride replied. And here we are with all our barn doors locked, Mallory quipped. Too bad we can't send out a welcoming committee. Whoever he is, he would have been smarter to engage us at Storm's Edge, Hunter replied. That would have been the right tactical play. How do you know it's a he, Mallory said with a smirk. A woman captain wouldn't make this kind of mistake. Why not? Because women are sneaky and treacherous, Hunter said. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Everything I know about deceit I learned by surviving the galaxy's most dangerous pirates' attempts to steal my ship and leave me marooned on an orbiting rock someplace, and she's as female as a hunting lion. Tactical, give me something. What color is it? Is it bigger than a bread box? Battle computer cannot identify kilowatt X-ray 1, sir, 
McBride said with a tone of finality. Joss turned from his auxiliary navigation station to look at the view screen. Zoni and McInerney both looked up at the same time. Hunter rose in his con chair. No information on this vessel anywhere in Skywatch records? Negative, sir, we have no data. I seem to remember the last time a ship drew a line in the sand we ended up getting blasted. We're not going to take that chance this time. Notify Dunkirk to set alert condition 3. Tactical. I want readings on Kilowatt X-Ray 1's course. Backplot her entry point to the system. Aye. We're going to call their bluff. Zoni, put me on intraship. Lieutenant Tixia configured the signal station controls to broadcast the captain's address to the entire ship's complement. You're on. This is the captain speaking. An ion storm has been detected at the Bayon system perimeter. We have no choice but to navigate straight through the distortion field in order to maintain a least time intercept to the last known position of the Starship Revenge at Bayon 3. All decks secure for unsafe maneuvers. Zero gravity protocols are in effect until further notice. Secure all non-emergency hatches. Engage shock harnesses at all stations. Off-duty personnel secure quarters. Deck officers report status to the operations officer. Hunter out. The bridge crew kept their gazes straight ahead. The million-mile-wide, vaguely reddish field of unstable plasma and ion interference twisted and bulged on the forward view screen, as if daring the two warships to make the attempt to fly through it. Energy bursts flashed and spidered through the opaque regions of the enormous cloud. Hunter grabbed the white handset off the overhead console. Sickbay Bridge. Doverly. Doctor, I'm reasonably certain I don't have to ask. We have emergency triage already manned. Deck alert subsystems are keyed to activate angels on any signal of injured. I have two dozen medics equipped and ready. Shall I consider myself skipper of an armed flying hospital, Commander? That's affirmative, Bridge. Sickbay out. Zoni smiled. Pilot, disengage drive field and stand by for continuous acceleration. Tactical, raise our battle screens and reinforce forward deflectors to maximum. Energize all topside armor for forward and lateral impacts. Secure and lock main batteries at zero degrees true deflection. XO, report all decks secured for ion storm transit. Quiet responses followed each of the captain's orders. It was at times like this the bridge crew became fully aware of all the little details that had to be on the mind of the skipper in command of a ship like Argent. Dozens of fighters, thousands of highly trained men and women, a five million ton warship moving at unimaginable speeds. Everything had to be precisely planned out in advance with almost no margin for error. In even a moderate storm, the ship's hull could be hit by forces greater than virtually any weapon that could be leveled against her. The crew had to be ready to react at a moment's notice, and they would have to do so without the protection of an interstellar drive field. Because of the physics and electromagnetic forces involved, ion storms forced ship's captains to pit their battle screens and armor alone against the potential for gravimetric and magnetic shocks that could pulverize a ship of the line if it wasn't handled exactly right. We have preliminary readings from our probe, sir, estimating average shock intensity at 400 millibeckles. Hunter steeled his expression. He knew the bridge crew would be looking to him for strength. He also knew a shock of more than 750 millibeckels could knock his shields down. 900 could heavily damage or destroy the Argent. Acknowledged. Pilot, give me the count. We will reach the storm perimeter in 17 seconds. Course 015 Mark 5, all ahead. Contact Kilowatt X-Ray 1 closing. It's an attack run, sir. Time to distortion field intercept, Hunter barked. Twelve seconds. Can we veer off? Not recommended at this speed, sir. Captain, I have hostile SRS reflections on all harmonics. We are being targeted for range, Zoni shouted. The tactical situation gave Hunter few options. Attempting evasive action without a drive field could subject Argent's hull to catastrophic stresses. Maintaining a straight line course, on the other hand, made his ship an easier target for the enemy's weapons. Whoever his opposite number was, they had the advantage. If they had the firepower to go with it, Argent could be in serious trouble even without the storm. Hunter studied the tactical track for a moment, then made his decision. He's not going to make it. Pilot all engines ahead. Emergency flank speed. Signal Dunkirk to maintain formation. The enormous battleship surged forward with the strike cruiser just off her starboard edge. Now it was a race. The enemy contact was quick, but it rapidly became clear to the bridge crew aboard Argent their enemy's angle was too narrow to obtain a clear shot. 
At any point along their course where they would be in range to be targeted by a missile attack, the storm would be between the enemy fire control and Argent. They could fire, but their missiles would likely be thrown hopelessly off course by the gravimetric forces inside the storm. Energy weapons were out of the question. Beam weapons based on any science known to Skywatch simply scattered into powerless background energy inside an ion disruption. Still, the enemy starship slashed in at a high attack angle. Moments before it broke firing range, the battleship Argent crashed through the leading edge of the ion storm, and all her instruments went haywire. A violent lunging impact caused the deck plates on the bridge to shudder. Wave interference impact, port side, estimating 385 millibeckels, shields holding, Ensign McBride shouted. Hunter grabbed the black handset again. Engineering bridge, hold propulsion 4x4, four four. emergency flank speed, steady continuous acceleration, acknowledge. Acknowledged bridge, engine power steady at 41% reactor utilization, acceleration 90 MPS per second. Very well. Hunter replaced the handset. Tactical. Modulate forward shields for reverse ion ambient. Divert all excess power to magnetic synchronization forward and aft. A strobing light surrounding the ship preceded a thundering crash that caused the bridge lights to flicker. Magnetic inversion. Forward hull. Estimating 460 millibetchels. Battle screens down to 88%. Raise the Dunkirk, Hunter shouted over the din. Zoni had Argent's escort warship on the signals console equivalent of speed dial. You're on, Captain. Toby, can you match our acceleration? The response was nearly choked by static, but Commander DeMay's faraway voice was still audible. Affirmative, Argent. We're holding formation. Report course and acceleration metrics. Course 315, acceleration 90 MPS. Steady as she goes, Dunkirk. Hunt her out. Another impact slammed into Argent's hull. This one knocked the battleship off her axis. The bridge rolled nearly ten degrees to port, causing most of the crew to instinctively grab their shock harnesses. Magnetic inversion, starboard quarter, estimating 535 millibeckels. Battle screens down to 71%. Lieutenant McInerney held Argent's flight controls, fighting the huge vessel's mass and momentum with her immense engines and their overwhelming power. She poured another 5% reserve reactor energy into counteracting the shearing forces that were buffeting Argent and gradually crowding her off course. With her ship now traveling at nearly 6,000 miles a second, there were few forces more dangerous than a potentially violent gravimetric shove from one side or the other. Auxiliary power to shields, Hunter barked. As if to answer, a spidery bolt from the storm punched into the heavily armored canopy of Flight 3. The screens held, but barely. Like an atmospheric aircraft, Argent's best course was to fly through the storm as fast as possible instead of using her power and propulsion systems to try and fight the distortion field. Although few vessels had more total power output, the truth was ion storms were unpredictable and could deal far more damage to the battleship than she could reliably absorb. Stay with the trailing edge of the wave, pilot. Give me a negative 12-degree roll. Aye. Yolanda held the controls as it seemed the entire helm console was cavitating along with the ship's outer hull. We're out of position, sir. Aft shields are causing a feedback reaction along our track. Yaw now six degrees relative forward orientation and increasing. Reduce forward propulsion. Engage lateral thrusters at one by one MPS acceleration. Tactical. Modulate shield power until the feedback powers down. Argent was now moving at nearly 10,000 miles per second. Proximity scanners indicated Dunkirk was still with her, but the smaller cruiser was having the tougher time of the changes in gravimetric distortion density and electromagnetic shock surges. Tactical analysis showed Commander DeMay's ship down to 60% shield energy. Tactical, what's our position relative to the storm's trailing edge? Estimating normal space in 21 seconds, sir. Very well. Stand by to reacquire kilowatt X-ray 1 the moment our scanners clear. XO, raise flight 2. I want us open for business right now after we get out of this. Affirmative? Commander Mallory looked as if she had just navigated an Olympic slalom event on a toy sled. Her hands were white around the shoulder straps of her shock harness as her shock couch rattled and bounced with the bridge structure. Aye, Captain. We'll be ready. Remember to breathe, Commander, Hunter said with a grin. Mallory looked over at her captain carefully. The bridge bucked and shuddered again. She held on and nodded. 
Pilot, stand by to re-establish our drive field. As soon as we clear the distortion wave, set engines ahead one half. Secure from continuous acceleration and engage normal space navigation. Zoni, get me a damage report. Yolanda and Zoni acknowledged Hunter's orders and went to work. We're being hailed by the Dunkirk, sir. On speakers. Argent, this is Dunkirk. We have emerged from the distortion wave and re-established our drive field. Standing by. Moments later, the comforting protective energy shell reappeared around Hunter's flagship. They had successfully navigated the ion storm. They still had to contend with their attacker, but first, their mission priority was still to relieve Bayon 3. Hunter was already on the horn with sickbay. Any casualties? Bumps and bruises, Captain. Nothing serious. Very well. Keep me advised. Hunter switched channels on the overhead comm. Engineering bridge. Curtis. Any engine damage? Negative, Yili replied. All propulsion systems at maximum and available for all flight modes. Reactors at 100%. Very well. Navigator set least time course for Bayon 3 assault orbit. Advise Dunkirk on formation alignment. All ahead flank 2. Affirmative, sir. Helm answering new course 40 mark 10. All engines ahead flank 2. Tactical, get me a position report on hostile contact kilowatt X-ray 1. Aye, sir. Force Commander, let's gas up the welcome wagon and put on our Sunday best. Chapter 26 Advanced Strike Cruiser Fury CX plus 704 Manassas Station Perimeter Gatern Sector 8 Commander Jace Hunter Commanding Tactical Officer Chris Palomar had been assigned to Fury's specialist rotation during her refit, and by now he had thoroughly acclimated himself to the advanced cruiser's sprawling new CIC. His station was one half-deck above the vessel's bridge proper, situated in the all-new combination flag bridge, weapons control, and combat information center. Flying Tactical was the aftmost station in the new complex, responsible for a grid of six display panels around a central screen called The Eye, which had a comprehensive layered view of Fury's entire warfare array right down to the ammunition counters and range-finding drones. Skywatch ships had a long tradition of coming up with fanciful names for pretty much everything. Fury's new facilities rapidly became the Flying Bridge not long after her refits were completed. The name would have stuck if Commander Huggins hadn't reminded the eager crew a Flying Bridge was something normally built into old civilian wet hull yachts. For now, it was the Flag Bridge in honor of Hunter's status as a task force commander, although there remained a quasi-militant group aboard, mostly led by the galley crew, that held fast to Flying Bridge, mainly because it sounded cool. Between Palomar's station and the forward section of the Flag Bridge sat the new Jaguar weapons console, known colloquially as WEPCON, where two specially trained officers took critical data from the tactical station, fed it into the targeting sequencers for Fury's new missiles and fusion torpedoes, and deployed the enormous cruiser's firepower at Captain Hunter's command. Still further forward sat the new integrated signals console, jokingly referred to as the Ear, to go along with Palomar's eye. In the center of the spacious new CIC behind WebCon was an eight-foot square reactive crystal display that could be swiveled to present maps, communications, range-finding or scientific readouts in any direction, or turned on its horizontal axis and lowered to create a table around which Fury's officers could confer. At the moment, Fury's two senses weren't getting along very well. Conflicting readings were the source of a rapidly worsening ongoing disagreement regarding their mission. Lieutenant Palomar insisted the trail of ionized helium and sodium left behind, when the starship Psy Ki was apparently surprised by a debris field would lead to her new position. Ensign Ken Garth at Signals, on the other hand, was adamant the ion trail was a ruse, and was meant to distract Fury so the frigate could get closer to the station without being detected. For the moment, Jace had been persuaded the trail they had discovered was their only hard evidence of another starship near Manassas. Since the Psy Key had not announced herself, it was likely she was up to something the senior officers aboard Fury wouldn't approve of, and that put the bridge crew on edge. After nearly three hours of looking, however, Hunter's cruiser and her crew were no closer to finding their phantom vessel. They had also lost and reacquired the Ion Trail several times without result. The feud had so far only been a tacit affair, but after yet another series of conflicting readings that produced few leads, Commander Hunter herself had decided it was time for answers, so she climbed the steps to CIC. Report. No change in readings, Skipper. We have ionized helium traces up to position 6. No readings from there to position 11. 
Then, another series of readings indicating trace particles on a course of 171 true, Palomar reported. For all we know, we're chasing an asteroid, Garth muttered from signals. Sure, if asteroids are being outfitted with interstellar engines by the space gremlins, Palomar snapped. Garth spun his chair around. His expression indicated he was ready to go a few rounds with his interlocutor when he was jolted out of his belligerence by the task force commander standing between him and the tactical station. Are you finished, Ensign? Hunter asked. Garth pressed his bet. Permission to speak freely, ma'am. Granted, if I... Garth cut her off. If you want to continue chasing your strange theory, Chris, why don't you give us one piece of evidence there's a ship out there at all? This time, it was Lieutenant Palomar who swiveled in his chair. You're speaking to a senior officer, Ensign. Very well, sir, Garth replied with sarcastic emphasis on the honorifics. Begging the junior lieutenant's pardon, sir, but why should any of us believe those readings are coming from a ship? Because we have no other leads, Ensign. Sounds less like science and more like an excuse, sir. Again, Garth sarcastically landed on Sir. By now, the raised voices had attracted the attention of the rest of the bridge crew one half-deck forward of and below the new CIC. Commander Huggins had just come on duty. He recognized the sounds of a stress-induced argument and made his way up the steps. Ensign, if you address me like that once more, I'll confine you to quarters, Palomar snapped. As you were, Lieutenant, Huggins snapped. Nobody is going to be confined anywhere aboard this vessel without the skipper's approval. Both junior officers looked at Jace Hunter as if they were just now noticing she had been standing in the middle of CIC for the entire exchange. Sir, I... Stand down. You too, Ensign. That's enough, Huggins ordered. The two men receded, their faces sullen. Ensign, do you have anything else you'd like to offer before I revoke your permission to speak freely? Hunter asked. No, ma'am. Very well. May I speak freely? Neither officer responded. The two specialists at WebCon kept their heads down. I realize this search has everyone on edge, but nothing is going to be gained by quarreling on my bridge. Tell her, Chris. Show the captain what evidence you have. Commander Huggins' expression darkened. Ensign, you speak when spoken to and direct your remarks to the captain, clear? The XO's voice was cool and even, only one notch below, life as you know it has ended. Aye, sir. Garth turned back to his controls. He was still tense and ready to defend his point of view, but he knew better than to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with both the captain and the executive officer. Hunter continued. Now then, let's presume for the moment that Helium Trail isn't a ship. Lieutenant Palomar, give me a plausible list of explanations for its holding a linear course, changing course and then holding a new linear course for 15 million total miles. I have no explanation, ma'am. There's absolutely no possibility other than a ship. None whatsoever? Palomar hesitated. Jace could tell the junior tactical officer was just now starting to think beyond his assumptions. I... He hesitated again. I don't know for certain, ma'am. It might not be a ship, but I can't imagine how a natural phenomena could produce these readings. For one thing, an asteroid or other space body can't change course 40 degrees without either its own propulsion or some kind of... The word registered in everyone's mind at the same time. Now let's hold on to that mode of thinking, Hunter said. If we presume for the moment these readings are not a ship, what might they indicate beyond simple guesswork? Permission to speak, Captain? Garth asked. Granted. Up to now, we haven't considered any alternative possibilities, at least not officially. Palomar's face flushed as he realized the ensign had just scored big points at his expense. Perhaps the lieutenant simply hasn't had enough time to consider the alternatives. Perhaps the lieutenant would have an easier time of it were his fellow officers on his side of the table instead of across it. Is that possible, ensign? Palomar's face flushed again as he heard the commander hammer the ball right back into Garth's end of the court on his behalf. Aye, ma'am, the ensign replied quietly. Can we at least agree that any energy expended being right is energy not being directed towards our mission? Yes, ma'am, Palomar replied. His eyes were still downcast. Huggins could tell he was blaming himself for not seeing beyond his own premature conclusions. Very well, Chris. You have my permission to think outside the box. Ken, you are now his second in command. Your orders are as follows. Find the Psy Key. Affirmative? Aye, ma'am, Palomar replied with new energy in his voice. Aye, Ensign Garth nodded. 
Very well, carry on, Hunter said as she stepped down to the main bridge. Chapter 27 Strike Battleship Argent BBV-740 Bayonne 7 Orbital Track Captain Jason Hunter commanding The commsat system beeped urgently. Captain to engineering. Hunter looked over his shoulder at Zoni, expecting to see something humorous or completely bizarre. But her expression was serious, or at least as serious as her hybrid lineage would allow. The captain reached up and unhooked the handset. Bridge. Hunter. Sir, we need you in Engineering Metallurgy Lab 6. You need to see this. Yilly, we're minutes out from an amphibious launch. I need to be on the bridge. With all due respect, sir, if we don't do something about this, there won't be an amphibious launch. Hunter looked over at Commander Mallory. She at least appeared to be unaware of anything unusual. Commander, do you have anything to report? Sir? A twinge of impatience took temporary control of the captain's eyebrows. He slammed the handset back into the comms console and shoved himself out of the center chair. Zoni, you have the con. XO, you're with me. Zoni almost gasped and was about to respond, but by the time she turned far enough in her chair, the captain was halfway to the lifts. Commander Mallory hurried to follow. The scene in the metallurgy lab was unusual for a Skywatch warship, especially one minutes from a combat deployment. At least 12 engineering personnel, including specialists from several departments with a wide selection of ranks, were gathered around what looked like a partially assembled hydraulic press with metal feet. Sitting next to it was an able crewman first class, the captain would have to admit he had never met. Supervising the scene of frozen confusion was Chief Engineer Yilly Curtis. Attention on deck. Jason Hunter strode into the room with a particularly aggressive bearing. He wasn't quite yet ready to knock heads, but the look on his face told the assembled crew members he was close. Accompanying he and Mallory was a yeoman the captain had dragged out of his deck to monitoring station. He was carrying an automatic recording device and a handheld light. As you were. Report. Everyone in the room looked at Commander Curtis. Finally, Hunter did too. Yili took a deep breath. Sir, the command computer aboard this vessel is malfunctioning. Hunter hesitated with an annoyed look, as if he had just heard something trivial magnified into a threat to all human life. Explain. Abel Crewman Turner was in the process of refactoring the heavy weapons deployment codes aboard Shamrock 3 when the onboard systems locked him out. The crewman glanced at the captain and immediately averted his eyes. When he attempted to reset the access routines, the voice output module started making unusual noises. A few seconds later, it identified itself as Lazarus, using a synthesized male voice, and ordered Abel Crewman Turner to cease attempting to access the repair core. Thinking it was some kind of practical joke, Turner tried to power down the onboard battle computer, which caused a subsystem fault in the engineering control network. By the time we caught it, Lazarus had uploaded itself into Argent Cephalon Matrix and inverted its permissions table. Now it has full access to every command system aboard and nobody aboard this vessel has any permissions beyond its voice interface. It's basically a big block of code in our computer that none of us can even look at. Damage from the storm? Negative. Enemy activity, Hunter asked. That was my thought. Problem is, we have no record of any activity for this Lazarus entity anywhere else aboard. I've run two complete binary integrity sweeps. The only way this system could have gotten as far as it did would have been through one of our launches. It got aboard by piggybacking on a fighter or gunship, Hunter said. Or a corvette. Even I can't crack security on a nemesis, but maybe a medical ship or the Copernicus? Yilly looked stumped and that wasn't making the captain very confident. We don't know for sure yet. What's the plan to neutralize this thing, engineer? We're a couple billion miles out from a full-scale war over Bayon 3. That's the problem, sir. I don't think this Lazarus thing is hostile. Every time we've tried to repair the damage, it acts like its feelings are hurt. I don't think it's trying to fight us, and I don't really even think it's deliberately trying to do any harm. All that said, we can't get it to budge. Sir? One of the non-commissioned specialists spoke up. It acts more like it's scared. Scared? Hunter repeated. His combination of annoyance and anxiety registered with Yili instantly. It insists on requesting an opponent for guessing games. Turner granted it access to Argent's Entertainment Bank and ran through a couple of simple word association programs. 
That seemed to settle things down for a few minutes, but the moment he tried to go back to work, it shut down on him again. After several attempts to re-establish contact, it uploaded itself off Shamrock 3 into Argent's main computer, and now it won't respond to anything. By the gradual reddening of the skin color under his eyes, Hunter looked like he was ready to open a new unplanned doorway in the nearest bulkhead. He clenched his hands a few times before taking a deep breath. He keyed his comlink. Hunter to bridge. Zoni, all stop. Raise the Dunkirk and put the formation at station keeping until further orders. Aye, Captain, came the snappy response. Have the officer of the watch take the con and report to engineering. Bring all of your records related to the Black 7 incident. Hunter out. What's the Black 7 incident? Mallory asked. Hunter exhaled. When the crew was displaced and imprisoned at Lethe Deeps, it left one of our gunship escorts unmanned. It crashed not far from Starhaven and was later discovered by a civilian girl. She somehow talked the command computer aboard back to operation by teaching it how to play guessing games. The ship reactivated itself and ended up taking a shot at the Sarn Invector Squadron before we could get it and the girl safely aboard. The deck crews ran a standard set of diagnostics and everything came up green, Yili added. We didn't have time to do a full teardown. A few hours after it was recovered, Black 7 activated itself and returned to the surface where it opened up on a group of unidentified ground personnel we believe were advance enemy scouts. The girl had a comlink with her, and that may be how the gunship knew where to look. Now Commander Mallory looked as confused as the captain. How could a child alter the programming of our battle computer? It's hard to say. We still don't know the full import of the damage from the crash. Add to that the fact Black 7's data link was disrupted and it somehow concluded A. Bren was its command pilot, there's no telling what the automatic recovery routines could have done. For all we know, the system rewrote itself according to A. Bren's instructions, Yili replied. The rest of the engineering crew wore expressions somewhere between confused and concerned. It responded to her, Hunter concluded. Problem is, we don't know why. Just then, Zoni ran through the egress bay with a handful of data packs. Lieutenant, I need to know exactly what happened with Black 7. How did Abreen's new instructions affect the battle computer? Zoni hesitated, her mind full of the obvious questions. The captain didn't look like he was in any mood for delay, so she did her best to explain. I've run the logs a couple of times. Near as we can guess, the damage from the crash and the restart after Black 7 re-established data link with Argent caused Dominique to incorrectly identify A. Bren as the gunship's command pilot. When the deck alert responded to the life support event, the emergency systems got stuck in a crash cycle. They were working, but the battle computer never relinquished control back to the command computer. That's why the gunship navigated back to the surface when A. Bren activated her emergency beacon. It was at full alert even though the rest of the ship was nominal. Was that crash cycle ever terminated? Yili asked. Not by my signals section. We can't tamper with launch vessels or systems without authorization from Force Command. Everyone looked at Commander Mallory. Don't bother looking at her, Hunter said. She just got her qualifications a few hours ago, and the doctor was busy fighting a war when the case of the missing gunship was playing out over the hills and dales of Starhaven. So we can presume the crash cycle was never terminated, Yili replied. That means any unmanned unit in our gunship wing has been in emergency mode ever since, and every time through the cycle with no access to the command computer, the system would be forced to assume everything else had been destroyed. That would cause it to... Wall itself off and lock everyone else out, Hunter concluded. I've never heard of something like this happening before, Zoni said. That makes two of us, Mallory added. How bad is the damage? Is Argent's command computer still operational? If we were under enemy fire, we wouldn't have a choice. But now, this far out from hostile action, my recommendation is to keep this ship as far from anything dangerous as we can. We're the linchpin in Bayon's defense, Commander, Hunter replied. We can't even begin our mission this far out from Planetfall. If we go into action with a big question mark in our command computer, sir, we could be putting every life on this vessel in danger. Then you need to tell me how we're going to deal with this Lazarus problem, Yili. The only person in this sector with the proper permissions is Ibran Willits. She's three billion miles away on a planet that will burn in space if we don't resume our course, Hunter shouted. The color drained from every face in the metallurgy bay. We could do a long-range deployment, sir, Curtis replied calmly. Without fighter cover, our transports would be carved up like a roast. 
We can restore the command computer from our shipyard data images. Perhaps we can set up waypoints? I'm not hopping fighters into 60 billion cubic miles of space without battle group support, Commander, Hunter snapped. Restore the computer. The stress tests alone will take a week. Fix it, Engineer. I don't want a debate. I don't want a list of cautious reasons and excuses. Get my command computer back online and report when we have full combat readiness. Sir, I really don't. I'll be in my executive cabin. You have two hours, XO. Captain Hunter strode through the egress bay with Mallory close behind, leaving most of his senior staff and a dozen or so engineering personnel staring at each other in silence. Chapter 28, Assault Cruiser Revenge, CA-220, Bayoni 3 Interdiction Zone, Commander Patrick Enright Commanding. Tactical, it's time for answers. Aye, sir. Atlantis-12 is not registering any known vessel configurations. Further, their power output is not registering within any known envelope. Are you certain? Enright rose from his chair and made his way to the pilot's console. He watched carefully as what was now almost certainly an enemy battle group made its way across Gitarn Sector 2 from the Blackburn Jump Gate towards Bayone 3's orbital track. So th they aren't Sarn, but they aren't friendlies either, sir. Can we even be sure they're hostile? The navigator asked in hopeful tones. Hostile or not, if they break Bayone 3's perimeter, we have orders to engage, the commander replied. Signals, are you reading any electronics, countermeasures, hailing frequencies, repeaters? Negative. Aside from their magnetic fields and engine emissions, they are completely silent. Enright exhaled carefully. He squinted at the unidentified ships, subconsciously trying to ferret out the data he needed by simple force of will. Rules of engagement call for a hail, he said to nobody in particular. And while that would be giving away our position, at this point I'd be surprised if they didn't have our track already. Tactical, are they active? Negative, sir. No sweeps, no targeting emissions the navigational or battle computers are familiar with. Pilot, match course and speed with Atlantis-12. We'll play along while we gather information. Acknowledged. Tactical, ready a type IV probe. Launch at station keeping and set an LOS interval of five clock minutes. Aye, Captain. Probe will be ready to launch in 60 seconds. Navigator, at our present course and speed. We will break the Bayone defense perimeter in 41 minutes. Commander Enright made his way back to the con and took his seat. Tactical? Signals? You have a Type 4 probe and 40 minutes to tell me who and what Atlantis-12 is, because in 41 minutes I'm going to blow them out of space. Chapter 29 Advanced Strike Cruiser Fury CX-704 Manassas Station Frontier Gatern Sector 8 Commander Jace Hunter Commanding Contact! Extreme Range! Jace Hunter turned her command chair to face the helm and calmly clicked her shock harness buckle closed. She had been dangling the mechanism in her hand for what seemed like hours. Now it was time. Report tactical, she ordered. Designate hostile contact uniform X-ray 1 bearing 040 Mark 115 on a lateral evasive course, reading steady but fluctuating. Jace glared at the tiny red icon glowing at the center of the forward tactical display. I got you, you sneaky bastard, she muttered. I'm in no mood to dance. Pilot, plot an intercept course. All ahead, flank three. Report on spectroscopic analysis. Match contact and previous readings. Affirmative. Confidence is high. Captain, are you sure we shouldn't evaluate? Jace interrupted before the XO could complete his cautionary recommendation. I want to scare the paint off his ship, XO. It's time our elusive opponents made themselves known and face us in the light of day. Sound battle stations energy, all personnel. Huggins hesitated. Aye, ma'am. He nodded at the signals officer who configured all the necessary communication systems and hit the clear channel alarm. The bridge lights shifted red as Fury's crew raced from one end of the ship to the other. The bridge officers hurriedly fastened their shock harnesses as the familiar intership address system echoed with the general quarters alarm. The sleek cruiser knifed through space, bearing down on its adversary with shocking speed. Hunter's expression hadn't changed. The fire in her eyes was unusual, even for her. Tactical, configure our electronic warfare systems for active sweeps. Get me range and a bearing match. Webcon, primary distribution on Jaguar attack profile alpha. Full power to forward fusion torpedoes. Full power to Spectre batteries D and V. Stand by for a firing solution. Navigator, bring our forward battle screens to 20% over amplitude. Maintain course and speed. 
Had there been an audience there to witness it, the strike cruiser Fury would have reshaped herself in space from a formidable warship into a flying weapon. Her quarry began to duck and weave, attempting to avoid the larger ship's formidable targeting systems and their attempts to anticipate the frigate's position with enough accuracy to guide the new Jaguar torpedoes to their mark. Range. Two million miles in closing. Weapon status. Main battery standing by, ma'am. All right, pilot. Veer us off nice and wide. Signals, patch me to Wepcon. The channel clicked. Wepcon, may? Give me a nice tight pattern, gunnery. All Spectre batteries open fire. Fire at will. Fire at will. Lieutenant May calmly spoke into her handset from the weapons control station on Fury's flag bridge. The crews stationed in each of the cruiser's eight reaction emitter batteries began drawing incredible surges of power from the mighty vessel's fusion matrix. One by one, diverted energy loads slammed into the brand new Spectre plasma generators, causing 60-ton weapons to glow like otherworldly obelisks. All at once, a white-hot beam of energy thousands of miles long flared in space and then vanished, leaving a ghostly trail of reactive ions in its wake. Battery 3 fired next. The lights on Fury's bridge dimmed as the advanced weapon's intense beam speared the darkness. Seconds later, a small Nova-like explosion lit up space for millions of miles. Then another, and another. Battery 7 fired. Another white sphere of violent explosive energy filled space. Battery 8 followed then battery two again. Shattering explosions filled the darkness in the distance. They began to bleed into each other. The ambient temperature reached millions of degrees again and again. The electronic interference started to overwhelm Fury's targeting systems. And still, the specter fire continued. It was the space combat equivalent of shelling a beachhead. Cease fire! Fury's weapons quieted. By the time the barrage subsided, Hunter's cruiser had fired 18 proximity blasts. Each had touched off a destructive zone nearly a half million miles in diameter. Space burned with residual interference patterns. They crackled over even Fury's internal communications network. Hunter steepled her fingers and watched the forward display carefully. Report tactical. There was a pause as the tactical officer ran a standard analysis of the region of Space Fury's weapons had just incinerated and compared it to the most recent readings, indicating the course and position of the captain's target. Negative contact, ma'am. Debris, emissions patterns. It will be a few minutes before we can get the same fidelity we had on approach, Captain. Huggins stood by the con. Those new main batteries sure raise hell. It looks like the decay curve will take... Tactical. Either find me a target or find me the wreck of the Psy Key. The junior officer silently gasped for air. He looked to the XO for help. Captain, we can't maintain continuous tracking through main battery fire. We'll need a few minutes to recalibrate. And, and when we're through recalibrating, Commander, I want a target. Not excuses. Ma'am, with all due... We've had weeks to evaluate these weapons and weeks to figure out a way to get our targeting systems to integrate. If every time I pull the trigger on these things I have to spend several minutes untangling a blindfold, they aren't much use to me, are they? We're still... <coughs> Commander, we may as well go back to the station and park this ship until we can do some... The tactical officer grabbed his headphones. All of his scopes shifted red at once. Affirmative. Contact re-established. Positive tracking on hostile contact uniform X-ray 1 now bearing 341 Mark II on intercept course. Jace leaped from her command chair. That's our cue, pilot. Hard over. Full power turn to starboard. Fury banked in space and surged forward, angling her attack run directly into the teeth of the oncoming frigate. Tactical, stand by your countermeasures. Webcon, report waveform delta by the numbers. Bridge Webcon, waveform continuity match on target uniform X-ray 1, optimum range for all proximity envelopes. Forward torpedoes fire. Fury's new Jaguar mounts glowed to life moments before the entire ship shuddered as if rammed by a sledge. Unstable fusion bolts each the size of an ocean liner screamed from each side of the warship's main hull. Fury's power systems strained to recover. Weapons away. The torpedoes went active the moment they were fired. Seconds later, twin explosions ripped radiation-streaming gashes in space. Helm, roll us off. Fifteen degrees port, full power. Bring the fury about to new course 261 Mark 9 relative. Give me some distance. Tactical. Stand by starboard and aft weapons. Energy containment overloads on all launchers. Aye, ma'am. Arming cycle, ten seconds, Mark. The electronic warfare officer was nearly out of breath. 
Ensign Coleman hadn't seen this much concentrated activity since his last qualification simulations. Weapons fire! Weapons fire! Lieutenant Palomar pulled and twisted at his shock harness as he desperately tried to read three scopes at once. An ugly salvo of unstable particle beam fire tore into Fury's starboard battle screens. The entire upper deck structure lurched with the impact. Lights flickered as the lieutenant dabbed blood from the side of his mouth. The roar of the cruiser's armor absorbing the energy overload sounded like distant thunder inside the hull. A second barrage hit Fury's quarter hard. Jay stumbled and fell back into her command chair. Damage report! Starboard battle screens at 71%, Coleman shouted. Enemy vessel still on her attack run, Captain, Huggins reported from the operations scope. Range now point nine megaclicks on a full power turn aft. Wepcon bridge, Spectre batteries to starboard, fire as she bears. The Psy key peeled across Fury's targeting envelope like a strafing fighter. Her potent little VOC batteries strobed and thundered, tearing into the larger ship's defenses again and again. Fury answered like a vengeful goddess. Spectre fire flashed into space like bolts of lightning, crisscrossing the angry enemy ship's evasive course. Fury's trailing starboard screens buckled, and the frigate's next two shots speared Spectre Battery 4. The armored superstructure was ripped from the hull in a cloud of burning circuitry. A secondary popped off amidships, filling the cruiser's upper decks with destructive concussions and streaming fires. Fury's remaining batteries forced the agile attacker to duck and spin as she veered away. Enormous bolts of shock plasma flared in the darkness. Each was enough to vaporize the smaller ship, but they weren't designed to target such quick opponents. Fusion explosions went off one after another across the Psy Key's course. Then she was gone. Uniform X-ray 1 veering away, Captain. Intercept course on the board and standing by. Status report, Jace growled. We're combat worthy, but battle screen 6 is down, ma'am, Huggins reported. That last run hurt us. We've got armor only starboard side. We're vulnerable if she goes to missiles. Range to Manassas Station. 31 million miles, ma'am. Jason Huggins exchanged a look. Finally, the captain relented. She may have been angry and she may have wanted to pursue the enemy ship, but... Bridge. Signals. We're being hailed. Hunter snapped back to glare at the main view screen. She shot a half-annoyed, half-enraged glance at her XO again. On screen. When the residual interference cleared, Captain Hunter found herself face-to-face -face with Colonel Zachariah Atwell. Chapter 30, War Destroyer Exeter, DDX-8043, Bayonne 3, Windward Bay Sea Floor, Depth 1,684 feet, Lieutenant Commander Alvin Pierce Commanding. Junior Lieutenant Brittany Hawkins was just conscious enough to recognize the sound of the general alarm. It was strangely distorted, as if she were trying to discern it through an immense windstorm. It also sounded far away which was strange given the short-range scanner station had an alarm terminal above its hatch. Her own coughing awakened her enough to recognize the telltale scent of burning composite. Something was generating enormous amounts of smoke. Hawkins tried to move her legs. One foot was stuck under something metal. She opened her eyes. The SRS station was completely dark. A nearby white light that looked much like a discarded handheld torch cast a stark white beam across the floor. The lieutenant could see stains and scattered pieces of broken and twisted circuitry and console frameworks. In the distance, the sound of an exposed fan or turbine of some kind was audible. It whined as if it were stuck at its highest acceleration. Hawkins spotted her comlink not far from her overturned shock couch. She became hopeful she could reach it if she could somehow extricate herself from whatever had ensnared her boot. After a few weak tugs, she felt movement. Whatever it was, it wasn't all that heavy. After a few more attempts, the heel of her boot snapped free. Pain shot through her leg. She was relatively sure her ankle was either badly sprained or broken. Nevertheless, she was free. She ignored the lightning-like stabs of fire in her swollen foot and pulled herself across the cold SRS deck. The comlink had power and was connected to the vessel's combat data link. Exeter was at general quarters. Hawkins decided against keying the transmitter. She tried to recall the events just prior to losing consciousness. Attackers had appeared. Then there was an explosion somewhere aft like Hawkins had never even imagined, much less experienced. Had the life support systems been interrupted? According to her comlink, there were no active environmental alerts. Either the deck alert systems had been destroyed or life support was operational. 
That meant there might be other survivors and other attackers. Hawkins began configuring her comlink according to intruder protocols. The priority for fleet personnel in the event of hostile boarding parties was to avoid transmissions that might indicate location. So the lieutenant keyed her transmitter to use the inboard ship's relay system to transmit and receive. Every Skywatch warship was equipped with general-purpose encrypted transmit relays on every deck. The entire relay network was hardwired such that a transmission would be impossible to localize. Their purpose was to amplify and relay any crew member or officer's communications from a properly configured comlink. This allowed each crew member's personal transmitter to switch from an omnidirectional full-power broadcast to an extremely short-range wideband transmission that was nearly impossible to detect from any appreciable distance, given its resemblance to background static. Hawkins elected to key her message instead of using voice channels, which would make her demand for a status report even harder for the enemy to find. The unit emitted a serene tone, indicating her message had been received and relayed on Exeter's emergency channels. Suddenly, an iron-like grip clamped around her injured leg. She twisted and saw one of the attackers crawling towards her. Apparently, the noise from the comlink had alerted it to the fact Hawkins was no longer unconscious. A struggle ensued. Hawkins reached for her sidearm, but it was pinned to the deck under her weight. She couldn't get hold of the weapon's grip. The weight of the attacker made it impossible to roll away. She lifted her uninjured knee and cracked the attacker in the side of the head. Still, it reached for her neck. Finally, the lieutenant drew the utility knife from the technician's pack on the opposite side of her uniform cinch and jammed the blade into the attacker's neck. Its body spasmed, and it reached for the wound as its bodysuit darkened with blood. Hawkins bared her teeth and stabbed again. The strength drained from the attacker's hands and its body slumped over hers. Hawkins let the knife clatter to the floor. Panic threatened to overwhelm her as she fought to get out from under the humanoid's weight. By the time she pulled herself away, her foot and leg felt as if they were being bombarded with spears of red-hot electricity. She collapsed against her shoulder and exerted all her self-control to keep from crying out at the pain. Something had to be done. She knew if she were discovered by the enemy in her current condition, she wouldn't likely survive. Her mind raced. The short-range scanner station was on Exeter's fourth deck in the center section. Hawkins knew there was an emergency supply locker on Deck 6. If it were intact, it would contain a first aid kit, fire suppression equipment, and a medical drone. Hawkins wasn't confident she could maneuver a medical drone through a deck-by-deck -deck firefight. Then she remembered Commander Pierce's briefing before they were deployed to Bayone 3's orbit. Commander Hunter had lent her minibots to Exeter's engineering team for security testing. The lieutenant had no idea if they would be of any help in this situation, but it was worth a try. After all, it had only taken a couple of them to defend Fury from attacks by intruders. Now that Hawkins could use both hands, she drew her sidearm and set it on the deck. No sense in having it snagged in case another enemy came through the hatch. She picked up her comlink and went to work. She queried Exeter's battle computer for all active secure frequencies and filtered the list to exclude any channel unreadable by autonomous systems. That left four channels. Hawkins keyed a request for a general status update to broadcast and receive on the entire combined network. A moment later, the Deck 12 Shield Electronics Lab lit up. It was Echo's atmospheric beacon. The minibots had been set for minimum power consumption, so their security systems didn't alert any of them to the in-progress emergency aboard Exeter. However, now that Echo had been contacted, all her circuits activated at once. The entire formation of six vehicles was parked on a floor-level platform near one of the hatches leading to Exeter's auxiliary control section. Hi, Brittany. Hawkins experienced a brief moment of panic and reduced her comlink's volume a little. Echo, I'm in the short-range scanner station on Deck 4 and I'm injured. Exeter is at general quarters and we have been boarded by a hostile enemy. I don't have any information on the ship's general status and I can't contact the bridge. Are you operational? Uh-huh, me and all the other bots are here. Do you want us to come help? We'll come help you if you need help. Can you get to Deck 4 without being detected? Intercept can, but that's because AC gave him a cloaking device. I think I can get Rebel to go up there, but if he sees bad guys, he might shoot them. No, don't shoot anybody. Just report to Deck 4 SRS so you can help me treat my ankle and we can start figuring out a plan. Okay, see ya. Hawkins let her head rest against the deck. She hoped she hadn't just created six new problems, but without some kind of medical assistance, 
there was no way she was going to be of any use to the ship. She keyed a general status update request to the bridge again, but got no response. She took a deep breath. All she could do was wait. Echo closed the channel. It was still quite dark in the electronics lab, but she knew all the minibots were at full charge. Rebel! Echo activated all her transmitters and tried to contact the big tank again and again. The leader of the minibots was about the size of a thick couch cushion and was the most heavily armed of all of Jace's cybernetic vehicles. He was also often difficult to activate. Echo, meanwhile, was about the size of a large toaster and activated herself at full battle alert if a feather landed on her roof. Rebel, wake up! Echo bumped against his treads a few times. The little ambulance waited as patiently as an advanced artificially intelligent vehicle could. Rebel often took several seconds to boot to full operation, and several seconds was a long time for Echo. Normally, the Minibot's communications and medical assistance unit would have preferred to just strike out on her own. But Rebel was the only one of the six vehicles with all the new op codes. If Echo had any hope of getting the whole team moving, her plan started and ended with the biggest bot. Finally, the tank's console indicators snapped on. Who's there? He roared. Advance and be recognized. Shh! I think we're in trouble. Why is it so dark in here? Turn on your lights! Rebel's full array of battlefield lights came on, filling the shield facility with white beams tilted at every angle. Lieutenant Hawkins needs help and there's bad guys. Let me at him. She said no shooting, just activate the others. We have to go to deck four. Why no shooting? Because she's a lieutenant and AC said if an officer says we have to do what they say. But why no shooting? Because Brittany said, turn on your opcode sequencer and activate the others. We have to go, she's hurt. Butterfly lit up first. The tiny multicolored lights around the base of her airframe blinked in sequence, indicating she had activated all her communications pickups. She spun her rotors for a few moments to make certain she had clearance. Wave's headlights snapped on. His electrical engine started. Dudes and dudettes, what's with the spooky scene? Wave was the second largest of the units, built like a high-tech reimagining of a World War II half-track. Aside from Lunar, Wave was the only other amphibious minibot, capable of operating on or under the water. He also had cargo capacity, so he could carry any of the other vehicles over land or water except for Rebel, who was far too heavy and bulky. Getting Rebel from one place to the next was Butterfly's job, as she was the only minibot with airlift capabilities. Whoa, now this is a crazy situation. According to my pressure indicators, we're 1684 feet under an ocean. When did we get assigned to a submarine? It's cause Lieutenant Hawkins said, she needs help to save the ship, Echo replied. Hurry up, we have to go. Intercept was parked in Wave's transport bed. When his systems booted, he vanished. After a few moments, his alert subsystems concluded there were no nearby threats, so he reappeared. Lunar hovered over the group, proudly showing off his shining external hull. He charged his weapon systems and yawed his rocket-shaped frame to cover the closest hatch. Everybody form up on me. We have to go to deck four and shoot bad guys, Rebel said with a tone of finality. His engines revved and he rolled off the graded platform to the deck. He pivoted towards the hatch and started rolling ponderously towards the outside passageway. Lieutenant Hawkins said not to shoot anybody. We just got to get to deck four because she's hurt, Echo chided as she rolled along next to Rebel. Well, Rebel, at this rate we'll get to deck four around lunchtime next Thursday, old buddy, Wave said as he inched along next to the big tank. Any chance we could have a little extra zoom to go with all that boom? Lunar streaked out into the passage and ran a full motion and electromagnetic sensor sweep. No contacts. Butterfly hovered over Rebel and extended her lift magnets. Rebel rotated his main gun to cover the passageway as he emerged from the lab. He had just managed to get out the door and rotate his main hull to drive up the passageway when Butterfly clamped her extenders to the sides of his armored hull, lifted his treads off the ground and pitched her rotors forward. Echo escorted Wave and Lunar escorted Butterfly as the minibots made for the deck 12 magneto lifts as quietly as they could. Intercept used his atmospheric sensors to monitor any changes in nearby air density from Wave's cargo bed. If anything moved or spoke, all six minibots would have its location in an instant. It remained to be seen if they would actually reach the Deck 4 SRS station without shooting any bad guys. Chapter 31 Strike Battleship Argent BBV 740 Bayonne 7 Orbital Track Captain Jason Hunter Commanding 
Excluding her occasional inspection tours, Commander Curtis had not visited Argent's core computer console since departing from Jupiter-5. The battleship's Cephalon Matrix was still essentially brand new. The spherical chamber that housed the primary terminal was constructed out of a highly specialized nickel-steel composite that developed superconductive properties at relatively high temperatures compared to the alternatives. The resulting environment in the Cephalon terminal chamber was chilly, but bearable for short intervals. Yili had brought a pair of gloves in case her impending attempt to manually repair damage to the ship's command computer took longer than expected. The captain had ordered Commander Mallory to attend, partially to learn the ship's complex data systems and partially to be the necessary second authorized command officer to repeat orders as the engineer worked towards reactivating the higher functions of the system. The terminal itself was a standalone console directly in the center of the room with a single seat for the operator. The core terminal was rarely manned during normal duty shifts. Its primary function was to be the interface of last resort in the event the rest of Argent's systems were down. In cybernetics parlance, it was Terminal Zero, which meant it was the only interface aboard the ship aside from the captain's direct interface that could access the command, navigational, library, sciences, and battle computer kernels without context or identification switching. This made it unique as it was the only console through which all of the battleship's computer functions could be accessed at once. As the two officers entered the facility, Mallory noticed the large display. It was a black screen with an alphanumeric sequence in large white characters across the top and green text underneath. At the moment, it was a simple login prompt. The keyboard looked surprisingly simple for such a powerful workstation. Its keys were relatively substantial and made out of black aluminum, Next to the display was an auxiliary screen that was currently displaying the surveillance system's view of the supercooled main holographics chamber one deck below. Yili was sifting through a stack of memory cards as she made her way across the shiny black chamber floor towards the console. Computer, engage command protocols and configure all security access to authorized logins coded to the following senior officers. Lieutenant Commander Yili Curtis, identifier Ghost 2946. Dominique's pleasant voice responded. Chief Engineering Officer Yili Curtis, Identifier Ghost 2946, Login Authorized Argent Terminal Zero. Acting Commander Sabrina Mallory, Identifier Kingfisher 4301. Executive Officer Sabrina Mallory, Identifier Kingfisher 4301, Login Authorized Argent Terminal Zero. All right, now for the fun part, Yili said as she sat at the center console. Mallory watched intently as the engineer manually logged into the system. She immediately upgraded her privileges and navigated to the heuristic initiative subsystems. According to Turner's report, the Lazarus executable uploaded through Argent's weather and atmospheric readings telemetry receiver, changed identities, and then buried itself somewhere inside Dominique's personality reflex files. By the time he found it, the permissions table was inverted. Let's hope it's still there. A tiny executable file has a lot of room to hide inside all these memory addresses, Mallory offered. It's modifying its own signature to try and hide from the locator process, Yili muttered. I'll have to filter the results and then isolate the file images as they come through. To find the one that doesn't match the decoys, Mallory said. Exactly, Yili replied. The trick is to copy it into its own file jail so it can't use the library computer to authorize itself a new identity, so to speak. The only advantage we have is Terminal Zero processes have unconditional Cephalon priority, while user space processes have to request cycles from their resident kernels. That gives us about a 10 cycle a second head start. No matter how efficient the code is, unless it is launched from this terminal, it will eventually fall far enough behind that this resident process will snag it. Sounds like you became an expert on computer systems right alongside fusion reactors. Zoni's the real genius on this thing. Only reason I got volunteered is because the captain needs Diamonds and Toby to decide how we're going to launch our assault if we can't maneuver any closer to orbit. I'm still not up to speed on the nicknames, Mallory said. When we were flying jacks, we all decided to use playing card warpaint. Zoni is the jack of diamonds. I'm the jack of spades. Dr. Doverly is hearts and Colonel Moody is clubs. And the captain is the ace, Mallory concluded. Affirmative. They called us four guns and a bullet. How will we know if this works? It all depends on how long it takes for my resident process to find Lazarus. Yili typed as she spoke.
The wild card in all this is the Lazarus process may have taken inspiration from Dominique, meaning it can respond intelligently to our attempts to find it. It can outsmart us. For a time, the only real advantage we have is brute-forcing memory space with our process priority. That obviates anything the Lazarus process can do with respect to trying to hide. Essentially, it can hide, but it can't run. Clever. Each dot represents one tetrahex memory address, Yili said, leaning back in the console couch. And how many of those are there? Mallory asked. Several, Yili said with a touch of sarcasm. Cephalon memory isn't measured in a linear fashion like old-style transistor-based computers. It's holographic. Storage is measured in the information's fidelity. Argent's matrix weighs about 600 tons and is made up of some of the densest material on the ship outside of our hull armor. It takes up most of the next lower deck. How is memory related to fidelity? Think of it like a three-dimensional picture. The more resolution and memory space you have, the sharper and more detailed the image is. Each tetrahex can store the equivalent of 4 to the 16th optical loci. Each loci is roughly analogous to a bit from the integrated circuit era. The difference is loci can be grouped arbitrarily, which allows us to create theoretical namespaces and operators, and also to use other number systems like trinary, decimal, and hexadecimal to encode information. Theoretical namespaces? Consider the idea of trinary data. Each bit is no longer limited to on or off. In a trinary system, I get to use on, off, and something else. That other state is theoretical, which allows me to create logic systems that are also theoretical. For example, what will a logical or produce if I combine on and other? I used to drive my cybernetics instructors crazy with this stuff. I wrote out a calculus proof in longhand using base 5 numbers one year and almost got kicked out of flight school. Sabrina chuckled. Why abandon binary numbers? Isn't the more basic encoding simpler? Binary is too slow, at least when used conventionally. The physical limitations of linear memory become a burden in normal space where the speed of light can't be altered, especially when you get to the point where you need to be able to perform a one-to-one -one scale sweep of a 3,500 square mile battle space on nine different light wavelengths 60 times a second and have the information stored somewhere it can be retrieved. Binary memory systems would grind to a halt just getting the information from one place to the next. In a Cephalon system, I have a selection of multipliers. All I have to do is change how the loci are grouped by changing what I'm looking at to retrieve the next record. With Argent's matrix, I don't even have to move the memory itself. I don't even have to move the collector unless I want to. If I write the process correctly, all I have to do is change the magnetic field and let the hexes flip themselves. Dots continued to appear one after another in scrolling horizontal lines across the console screen. Hexes, tetrahex, 4 by 16? Exactly. Yili's voice had an encouraging tone, even though she was concentrating on the readout. Another couple of hours and you'll be on your way to a cybernetics rating. I think I'll pass for now. I'm still trying to get my head around flight operations. How long do you think your search will take? Minutes? Days? Impossible to say. I know we will find the Losise. The Lazarus process can't copy and disguise itself faster than this resident process can locate the new memory addresses. Once we get it isolated, we should be able to repair the damage it did to Dominique's command table. Then we can set up an environment inside that isolated file jail that will make it think it is still functioning while sending all its output to ground. Does that get us operational again? Yili nodded. As long as there isn't some other little surprise buried in here we don't know about. It's not perfect but it gets our marines on the ground on time, and it keeps the captain from blowing a gasket. Her comlink beeped. Engineering. Report status. <laughs> Process is up and running, Captain. We should have some results shortly. Very well. Coordinate with Lieutenant Madison aboard Dunkirk on section battle drills to be launched no later than 1,400 hours. Affirmative? Aye, Captain. We will conference with Dunkirk right away. Outstanding. Hunter out. Yili looked up at Commander Mallory. That's the second time in six months he's asked for a status report. He's a by-the-book captain, then? Not a chance. He's a set and forget skipper. He assigns the right officer to the job, and then he expects them to deliver. There's only two things in known space that would make Jason Hunter request a status update like that. Either he's angry enough to chew ten penny nails, or he's scared out of his mind. I'd give even odds on both at once. Then we had better get this Lazarus thing out of his battle computer. Affirmative, XO. Affirmative.
Chapter 32 Operation Crimson Thunder, Recon Team Apache Blade, Triad Jungle Lowlands, Bayonne 3, approximately 168 miles southwest of Lethe Deeps. Strike Sergeant Roy Alexander had a target. According to his heads-up display, he was currently less than 12 miles from Apache Blade's LZ. He and Sable had chosen to start their search pattern along a northwesterly heading from their origin point. The terrain wasn't particularly difficult to navigate. The only major geographic feature within 10 miles of the sergeant's current position was a cliff face approximately 140 feet in height that bordered a river. The oxygen levels on Bayon 3 were insufficient to sustain human respiration. Although the gas balance in the air was somewhat related to an Earth-like environment, the absence of plants capable of producing enough oxygen to build up enough density in the atmosphere was the problem. Some of the flora on the planet's surface had been analyzed and discovered to be native to the Bion system. Starhaven scientists were fairly certain one or more of the new species used the light from Bion's second sun to synthesize sulfur for energy. But they hadn't devoted much time to the study given their top priority of securing their agricultural facilities for production of barley H-18. Those same scientists would have been thrilled to get Sergeant Alexander's analysis and telemetry, as he had already discovered at least five species of alien bacteria that were gobbling up every oxygen and water molecule they could find and replacing it with cyanide. Then there was the mold colony that was synthesizing the cyanide and turning it into nitrogen. The two species were at war, naturally. As fascinating as his exploratory journey into alien biology was, the true priority on the sergeant's mind at the moment was unidentified contact Tango 6 bearing 305 at a projected range of just under 80 yards. Whatever it was, it was breathing and using supplementary life support of some kind. Air displacement sensors indicated it was about the right size for an adult human male, although it had no transponders or any kind of electronic signature that would identify it as friendly. A wise precaution given the situation. Neither the recon marine nor his K-9 had active transponders either. The other alarming fact was the contact was armed. This became apparent when it shot Alexander's look-down probe out of the sky. The other of Ariane's probes had gone into evasive action and disappeared in the tree line before Tango-6 had enough time for a second shot. It had maneuvered itself out of the perimeter and was hovering on station awaiting further orders. A songbird warbled nearby. Aside from the occasional breeze and the buzzing sound coming from some nearby plants, the bird was the only sound. Alexander thought it was rather strange there wasn't the obligatory cacophony of bird songs in and around the trees. But then again, he had already encountered numerous things about Bayon 3 that were quite different from the forests where he had grown up. Maybe there weren't many wild birds on the surface, or perhaps something happened to them. The latter was a chilling thought. But if the birds had been eradicated somehow, there was no evidence of the method used. Neither Alexander nor Sable had detected the crash site of Paladin 6-4 yet, although the sergeant suspected his initial energy source contact might be wreckage of some kind from the crash. Perhaps the two things were related somehow. But before the recon team could investigate, they needed to determine the status of unidentified contact Tango 6. The sergeant ran another IR sweep. Even with both suns up, the ultra-sensitive tracking systems in the sergeant's armor mechanisms were capable of picking up temperature differentials brought about by changes in air density at range. Essentially, the recon version of the IR sensor suite was a photo-capable motion detector. At the moment, however, there was no motion in or near the projected location of the unidentified humanoid. Alexander ordered Sable to move to a higher flanking position on the theory that a higher angle might produce an opening through which the canine could establish a visual confirmation of the contact's position. Once Alexander could verify location, a number of options for neutralizing their opponent would become available. Sable's move had to be as silent as possible. There was no way of knowing if the contact had backup, nor was there any way to prevent a firefight if it did. The sergeant wasn't worried. He and his canine had trained for maneuvers like this for months on end. By the time Team Apache Blade graduated from Special Forces training, Sable could paw her way into a room full of security guards and alarms, lift someone's wallet, and leave without making the slightest sound, and the sergeant could put it back just as quietly. As Alexander monitored his companion's move, Ariane's calm voice sounded in the Marine's earpiece. New contact. Designate Uniform 9, bearing 308. 
range 270 yards approaching your position. The sergeant made a quick adjustment to his range finders. Move probe to coordinates 116 by 215, altitude 100 feet, IR ambient, surface warfare systems on standby. Affirmative Apache Blade will advise. By now, Sable was in position and it looked as if the move had been worth it. The K-9's rangefinders and optical pickups had Tango-6 at exactly the coordinates the sergeant expected. He patched Ariane into Sable's telemetry net and started running analysis on the image the highly trained shepherd dog was observing. Sable was roughly 150 yards distant and about 35 feet above Tango-6's position, but her optical systems were easily capable of getting an adequate resolution image in the light of day. Unmanned probe has arrived at requested coordinates. Engage electronic countermeasures at minimum power utilization. Report on all artificial emissions. Working. Surface warfare systems report contact Uniform 9 now hostile. Approaching position contact Tango 6 at increased speed. A crack of electrical energy sounded through the underbrush. A moment later, the thump of munitions filled the quiet air. The sergeant listened carefully as he studied his instruments. He switched his rangefinders to track electromagnetic discharge traces. Two long trails of superheated ions glowed to life in the distance. The sergeant transferred his analysis output to his overhead probe. The two contacts had exchanged fire, and now the sergeant knew why. The analysis of Tango 6 had finally been completed. The contact had been identified as Lieutenant Colonel Lucas Moody. Chapter 33 Strike Battleship Argent BBV-740, Bayonne 7 Orbital Track. Captain Jason Hunter commanding. Commander, we're out of time. We may have to hold Argent back until such time as my chief engineer can vouch for our battle and navigation computers. Toby DeMay steeled himself. He knew the order that was coming next. It was what he had trained for his entire career. He didn't know if he was ready, but one thing he did know was the forces he was about to lead were the best in the fleet. Captain Hunter walked around the war deck center table and indicated the tactical display as he spoke. The projection was a wide-angle representation of the Bayon system from the outermost orbit of the gas giant Bayon 7 all the way to the system's twin suns. Dunkirk will lead a combined arm strike wing and marine amphibious landing force against enemy units over Bayon 3. I am ordering T-Hawk Black to escort 12th Mechanized and 7th Strategic Air Group to cover the setdown. Your orders are to link up with Monarch Squadron and establish a combat blockade of the planet. Nothing gets in or out, understood? Aye, sir. Toby was encouraged by how strong his voice sounded. His crew was getting more and more acclimated to their ship, and he was confident they would have the upper hand if they could hit the system with the least possible lead time for their enemies to prepare. Argent will follow presently. If necessary, we will go into action with auxiliary systems and use dead reckoning for fire control over the planet. In the meantime, I am launching all four attack squadrons of fighters, all three squadrons of paladins and both gunship wings as part of your attack force. Commander Doverly's medical team will accompany your forces aboard Tranquility, and you will also have two Nemesis Electronic Warfare Corvettes available for open space anti-missile defense. Any questions? Negative, sir. Good hunting, Commander. Thank you, sir. We won't let you down. DeMay saluted and the captain returned the gesture. The Dunkirk skipper left Argent's war deck carrying far more weight than when he entered. His duty was clear. The lives of three starship crews, all of Komanov's ground forces, the population of Starhaven, and all of Colonel Atwell's future victims' lives now depended on one strike cruiser, 88 fighters, 68 mechs, 22 gunships, three corvettes, and 870 Skywatch marines. Jason Hunter returned to the bridge. He and Zoni locked gazes. Both had their orders and both also knew their duty. There were four fighter pilots aboard Argent whose only plans for the immediate future were to sit and wait for word from the engineering deck. Hunter strode hesitantly to the con. He looked over at his brand new executive officer and tried his best not to tempt fate with a reckless order. But despite his considerable reputation for following dangerous instructions, he simply couldn't ignore the fact he was about to order nearly 2,000 people into battle while he and his most experienced officers stood by and watched. Commander, Lieutenant, report to my inboard cabin on Deck 2. Zoni, have Yili and the doctor meet us there. Tim, you have the con. Sir, Zoni replied quietly. She had known for some time the order was coming. It was just a matter of when. A few minutes later, Dr. Doverly called the room to attention as Hunter stepped into the cabin. 
as you were. He took a seat quickly. Both Zoni and Honora noticed the captain seemed agitated and unsure of himself. I can't ignore this any longer, so I'm putting it on the table. While I realize I have standing orders to the contrary, I'm a Skywatch fighter pilot and flight leader and I should be leading the strike wing. Commanding officers are only authorized to be present in forward areas with armed escort, Zoni said with a smirk. She knew what Jason would say. I think four squadrons of fighters qualifies, Yili interrupted without looking up from her customary gadget. That's not the point, Doverly replied with a half-sarcastic smile directed at the engineer. I think I know what you're contemplating, and it's reckless. That's being generous. Sabrina's got her ratings. She can command this ship. Without senior officers, it's too dangerous. Far more dangerous than flying Argent into battle over Bayon 3 without a command computer. I should be in a cockpit for this fight, Doctor, Jason said. She could hear the anxious guilt in his voice. That was years ago when you were Lieutenant Commander Hunter with your leather jacket and your hair on fire, sir, Honora replied, the familiar tone of the executive officer starting to find its way into her words again. Now you're Captain Hunter at the top of Mount Olympus. You don't get to make rash decisions anymore. If the brass finds out you hopped in a fighter with your senior officers and flew off into a highly dubious gesture of comradeship, leaving an acting commander at the con of a Skywatch ship of the line, the least of your worries will be the hanging after your court-martial. Sir. Hunter gave the doctor a look, but he couldn't hold the glare. He smiled, and Honora responded by rolling her eyes. Sabrina looked as if she had just swallowed a bug. Leaving me in command? We go through this before every fight, ma'am, Zoni said. Every time we're about to do a flight deck launch, we all get that itch to don our gear and join the hotshots. We convene these little powwows so we can talk each other out of it and then talk the captain down before he orders us to go get our helmets. What's the status on the computer, engineer? If I can't take my little fighter to war, I want to take my big fighter, Hunter quipped. I can give you two options, sir, Curtis replied. It will take us an hour to rig the combat systems for manual operation. That will take Dominique offline completely until the battle is over. How will that hurt us? Point defense will be down. All the fly-by-wire systems are out. Long-range missile control is out. Tactical is out. We can still fire our main guns, but they will have to be targeted manually or lit up by a second unit. Like a Corvette, Hunter asked hopefully. A nemesis could do it. In fact, that's how we fought our way into Gitarne in the first place, Yili replied. And all you need is one hour? Give or take. No missile defense? No point defense? Mallory asked. I don't like the sound of that. I don't either, but the alternative is an Argent-shaped hole in our attack formation, Hunter replied. Can Argent support our ground attack with manual gunfire only? It's a risk, sir, Sabrina said. A big risk. We can rearrange dirt forever. But when it comes to hitting our targets, dead reckoning has all kinds of problems from orbit, and that's leaving aside the fact our targets will be moving at more than a thousand miles an hour, even if they are stationary on the surface. Hunter hesitated for a few moments. These were the decisions he was being paid to make now. It was so much easier before, when all he had to worry about was his fighter and his confidence. Now there was so much more on the line. Do it. Disable Argent's command computer until further instructed. We will launch on schedule with Dunkirk leading the first wave. Argent will follow no more than 30 minutes later. Are you sure we should be taking this risk, sir? Yili asked. It's the only thing keeping me from breaking out my flight suit, Commander. Let's get to work. Chapter 34 Advanced Strike Cruiser Fury, CX plus 704. Manassas Station Frontier, Gatern Sector 8. Commander Jace Hunter commanding. And you would be the younger, fiercer member of the Hunter clan, I presume, Colonel Atwell said with a wide grin. He had the air of a man in complete control, even though the ship he had chosen to engage outgunned his own six to one. By nine minutes, Jace replied, rising immediately to the occasion of being the only Skywatch officer standing between an apparent maniac and thousands of innocent civilians. Whatever your plan is, Colonel, it isn't going to work out the way you expect. It's not just my plan, Commander. Atwell replied, I expected your brother and the wiser minds at Skywatch Command would conclude an abandoned base on Bayon 3 wasn't worth sending the fleet to defend, but apparently I was mistaken. You've threatened a bit more than that, Colonel, Jace replied in a flat tone. 
You appropriated several starships. There are members of their crews still missing. I have reliable intelligence indicating you have a third base somewhere in the vicinity of Barker's asteroid. I'm pretty sure if I went looking, I'd find DSS Orca nearby. How am I doing so far? Not bad. You're underestimating the tonnage, but you've done an excellent job of figuring out how far we had progressed two months ago. Commander, we are right now in a position to crush your task force like an empty can. That's why I'm here. We had intended Admiral Hughes to carry our terms to Skywatch, but alas, those plans were disrupted by your brother's heroics. Therefore, I am here now speaking on behalf of four empires and the vessels already in position to blast every last breathing soul in the Bion system into background radiation in the next 100 hours. Constellation Exeter and the 808th have already been dispatched. Argent will be late to the party, but hopefully the captain will arrive in time to formally surrender. As Atwell spoke, Commander Huggins and Lieutenant Owens exerted considerable effort to keep their faces as dull and expressionless as possible. It was more than likely the colonel was simply telling stories to rattle Fury's crew. Nevertheless, those stories sounded worse and worse the more the colonel spoke. To their credit, Hunter's crew kept their bearing and let their skipper do the talking. Sounds like you've got the upper hand, colonel. If you are holding such strong cards, why are you wearing out your checks and staring me down? Hunter let the question hang in the cold air like a fish hook. After all, she hadn't been kidding when she said she was close enough to promotion to catch the texture of that fourth-rank insignia on her dress blues. Commander Fury had been seated across from formidable adversaries on many occasions. She knew how the game was played, and she commanded one hell of a lot of backup in case her strategy needed a little extra muscle. While she contended with the colonel, Hunter knew her damage control parties were hard at work doing what they did best, getting Fury back to full capability in record time. I'm giving you an opportunity to save the lives of the people on that planet, Commander. If you want to fight and die for honor and glory, you're definitely going to get your chance. Right now, Commander Enright is provoking a ship representing one of our allies. Its weapons are designed to tear the insides out of ships like Revenge. Exeter is at the bottom of Bayonne 3's ocean, and Constellation is burning in space. Six divisions of armor are about to land in the Triad Badlands and move on 14th Infantry. This is your last chance to withdraw. I'll have to consult with my superiors, Colonel. Come now, Commander. Atwell, you of all people should know I don't have the rank or authority to speak for Skywatch. To be honest, I have no idea why you chose to open a dialogue with me like this. If I had my way, I'd carve your ship up like a Sunday pheasant. You have the authority to order Perseus to stand down. Since you are outgunned and hopelessly outmatched in both tonnage and ships— I would think the welfare of your crews would be your priority rather than slavish adherence to regulations. Perhaps you've mistaken me for someone with more authority, Colonel. My brother is in command of the strike fleet, and so far I think he has made his opinion well known on this matter. Then why don't we ask him personally? Atwell snarled. Jason Hunter stumbled into view on the Psyche's bridge with his hands bound and a silencer around his neck. He was bleeding from the corner of his mouth and looked haggard, as if he had been on the losing end of at least one prolonged fistfight. Several of Fury's bridge officers rose to their feet. A block of ice a foot on each side landed in the pit of Jace's stomach. Atwell activated a blaster pistol and held it under Jason's chin. Since the fleet captain is no longer capable of discharging his duties under Skywatch regulations, command of Strike Fleet Perseus falls to you, Commander. Surrender and withdraw from the Bayon system, or Captain Jason Hunter will die right here and right now. Chapter 35 Assault Cruiser Revenge CA-220 Bayon 3 Interdiction Zone Commander Patrick Enright Commanding Sir, I think you should see this. Commander Enright's electronic warfare officer rarely spoke up unless directly asked for a report. Lieutenant Ian Mitchell was at the top of his game, however. He was the only EWO in the task force with time logged as an instructor at Skywatch Academy, even though nobody would ever know it by the way he kept to himself. Ian, what's the story on our probe? May we adjourn to CIC? Revenge's skipper followed the lieutenant down the wide metal stairs to the cruiser's combat information center. Enright noticed the young officer deliberately got as far from the rest of the crew as possible before he set his tablet down on one of the auxiliary tracking displays. He spoke quietly but urgently. 
There are no human life signs on Atlantis-12, sir. Further, their weapons technology is like nothing I've ever seen before. Each of their batteries is equipped with a circular structure of some kind around the main emitter. The lieutenant called up one of the probe's images. It showed what was clearly a dorsal weapons mount amidships. The barrel of the weapon was ringed by a wide circle of metal that looked like an enormous life preserver. Any idea how it works? My best guess at this point is those circular structures function as some kind of antenna. The problem is they can't be radio or any kind of electromagnetic receivers, because the interference from their weapons would black out all the signals. The only other thing I can come up with is some kind of energy signature receiver. Why would a weapon need an energy receiver? Unknown at this time, sir. I would strongly recommend we avoid engaging Atlantis-12 until we have a better idea what their capabilities are. Those weapons might do something unexpected, and if we get caught without a defense and without escort, we could end up in a lot of trouble. We've got to raise fury and report status to the commander. If the captain launches an assault over Bayonne 3 thinking Monarch is going to be there to back them up, they could be flying into a trap. That's a possibility, sir. At the moment, Atlantis-12 is only one ship. If I'm wrong, we could attack and knock out their subspace jamming equipment. If you're right, that could be a big mistake, Enright mused. He activated his comm link. Bridge CIC, time to Atlantis 12 weapons range over Bayon 3. Eight minutes, sir, came the snappy reply. We're out of time. Enright moved quickly back towards the bridge. Chapter 36, Strike Battleship Argent, BBV 740, Bayon 7 orbital track. Captain Jason Hunter commanding. Captain Jason Hunter strode into Argent Flight 2. The sound of nearly 900 Marines snapping to attention sounded like cannon fire and echoed across the huge deck. Mackinac troop transports with Argent's 2nd Marines insignia were parked near the heavy launch tunnel towards the deck's forward section. Hunter keyed his comlink to tie into the intraship and activated sound systems on all decks. Each of the fighting men and women were fully armed and suited for the landing. Marines, this is what we train for. There are fellow Marines, fleet, and civilians in harm's way. Up to now, we've been on defense. We didn't know what to expect. Now we're on offense. One of the battalion sergeants barked a hearty rah before the entire formation sounded off. It was electrifying. A Perseus squadron is over the planet ready to provide fire support, and I am ordering a full-scale launch of every fighter and mech under my command. You will hit dirt with air support and the fleet gun line, and I can tell you this. When Argent gets there, our enemies will never be that sorry again. Second Marines, your orders are to take that planet. Affirmative. Another explosive, rah, filled the air. Major Singleton. Sir. Argent Second Marines XO saluted and the captain returned his salute. Launch the assault force. Aye, sir. The major performed a regulation about face. Board transports in squad order. Another thundering rah sounded as the heavily armed fire teams moved efficiently to their transports. The Mackinacs each displaced 12000 tons and were roughly the size of a wet Navy destroyer. They were roughly three times as heavy as the boats used by DSS Exeter's 1st Marines. The two forward boats were each equipped with four 40-man SX-40 armed ground transports and an amphibious surface warfare ASW fusion kit, which was sufficient to provide one medium-strength mechanized infantry company with enough power to establish a forward operating base and repair facility. Each of the four MACs were set up to transport one platoon of Marines into Bayon's interdiction zone. MACs 3 and 4 swapped out the transport for one SX-8 fast battle tank. Hunter reconfigured his comlink. Commander, this is Charlie Oscar. Stand by to launch Strike Force Victory off all lateral rails. Affirmative, Skipper. Force Command is standing by, came Mallory's response, exactly as the book required. Argent's acting executive officer switched channels and picked up her yellow handset. Skywatch, this is the bridge. Stand by for launch orders from my mark. The alert response officer in Argent's topmost deck keyed his headset. Acknowledged, Force Commander. Skywatch is standing by. Red lights began rotating around the sleek and deadly forms of the Yellow Jacket fighters under the control of the storied 994th Squadron, known as the Red Buccaneers. Flight One's deck stacker switched the port tunnel indicators to green, and each jack levitated off the deck, turning towards each of their respective launch rails. Meanwhile, on Flight Three, the shining silver hulls of the 7th Marine Strategic Air Group reflected the ominous crimson glow of the flashing deck-ready lights.
The low rumble of the heavy Paladin bomber engines were a fine contrast to the higher-pitched fighter drives. Right behind each of the 7th's Paladins waited the 40th Airborne's nearly two dozen multi-role mechs, each bristling with weapons and containing nine heavily armed Marine shock riflemen. Force Commander, this is Skywatch. The board is green. Commander Mallory hesitated for a moment, mentally challenging herself to be absolutely certain she hadn't forgotten anything vital. Then she keyed the handset again. Launch all alert spacecraft. Acknowledged. Inside Rail Tunnel 2, Senior Lieutenant Desiree Danger Baby Shaw tightened her pressurized grip on her jack's controls before glancing left and saluting the ensign. The rail control specialist returned her salute and energized the tunnel. Launch spacecraft. The engines of Buck 2 screamed as the tunnel depressurized and exploded in magnetic energy. Argent's Hash 2 ranking pilot and Deputy Commander Space Wing, DSCOM, rocketed into the stars at more than 400 miles per hour. A moment later, Buck-7 and Buck-12 came streaking out of the battleship's portside launchers. The three missile-armed fighters formed a tight formation and punched their velocities up to their pattern velocity of nearly 4,000 miles per hour. Buck-6 and Buck-4 launched next. Both fighters joined the formation and continued navigating the combat pattern around their ship until the entire squadron had been launched. Over the course of the next 30 minutes, the 24 Wildcat fighters of Squadron 8-5 launched with flawless precision and were immediately joined by Nemesis 8, their escort corvette. From the starboard launchers, the Yellow Jacket fighters of Squadron 60 joined the full-strength formation led by the Fighting 16th, known as the Devil Cats. Moments later, the heavy mechs of the 99th Argent Marine Amphibious Company, carrying more than 200 mechanized infantry, maneuvered into formation with both the 40th Airborne and the 7th Marine Strategic Air Group. Then the first Mackinac thundered into space. Behind it came power launches of eight gunships from T-Hawk Black and the full-strength formation of 14 heavy gunships from the Shamrock emblazoned T-Hawk Green. A second Mackinac followed, leading Argent's entire combat medical team aboard Tranquility One. Twenty-two more Wildcats of the Archangels Squadron, led by flight leader Zach Fulkeg Roscoe, followed from Flight Three and joined the forward units of the 12th Marine Mechanized under the command of Argent 2nd Marines XO Major Samuel Singleton. Nemesis Four quietly launched last, signaling Commander DeMay aboard Dunkirk that Argent's strike force was free and clear to maneuver. Signal all units Dunkirk has the lead. Pilot, put us in combat formation. Set course for Bayon 3. All ahead full. Aye, sir. Helm answering new course 010 Mark 5. All engines ahead full. The huge strike cruiser knifed through space with a dozen formations of deadly fighters, gunships, and paladin mechs alongside. Aboard Argent, Hunter sat anxiously on the bridge, tapping the arm of his command chair and watching as his entire space wing vanished beyond the orbit of Bayon 7. He picked up the red handset. Yili, I want us underway the very moment the command computer is restored. Affirmative? We'll be there, Captain. Very well, Hunter out. Chapter 37 Operation Crimson Thunder, Recon Team Apache Blade, Triad Jungle Lowlands, Bayon 3, approximately 170 miles southwest of Lethe Deeps. Colonel Moody was rapidly running out of options. He knew he had perhaps an hour left, possibly much less. The life support systems aboard his vessel were critical. He had been working on the theory that if he could find some kind of underground shelter, the air density might be high enough to sustain him and his surviving crew for a day or so. The weapons fire leveled at his position changed everything. Although he could defend himself after a fashion with his sidearm, the blaster wasn't an infantry weapon. It wouldn't penetrate powered armor or battle screens at any range beyond point blank. It was only a matter of time before he ran out of places to hide. A rustle of noise up the incline behind him forced the colonel to strain and try to get some idea of what was up there. The move rewarded him with shooting pains down his back. He was fairly certain his knee was either badly sprained or had a hairline fracture from the twist it endured when he nearly fell into the shallow creek back in the direction of the crash site. Moody was about to attempt a move to a more secluded position closer to the incline when a strange reddish light flickered across a nearby copse of wide pale green leaves. The colonel froze and watched carefully. The light appeared again and then flickered out. Moody frowned. There was no natural phenomenon he was aware of that looked like... Then the light focused. The red light formed lettering and numbers. 
It was a Skywatch combat frequency designator. Moody's heart raced. He couldn't explain how it could be possible, but it looked to him like help had finally arrived. He configured his comm link to the designator. The moment the channel switched over, the calm sound of Ariane's voice filled his earpiece. Recon Team Attention Lieutenant Colonel Lucas Moody This is the Ariane Surface Warfare Tactical Combat System broadcasting on Skywatch Marine Frequency 0800. You are under surveillance by a Skywatch Recon Team. Stand by. Attention Lieutenant Colonel. The message repeated. Moody turned to look across the incline towards the north. Far in the distance, he could see the tree line as it disappeared down a much more treacherous grade. At the far end of the incline was a tightly packed group of wiry-looking trees with curved trunks. He saw a reflection and ducked back behind the foliage. A moment later, the unmistakable whisper of plasma fire flashed overhead. A muffled scream preceded a sound like a boulder crashing through jungle plants. Another shot burned overhead. The grotesque sound of choking followed. A third shot silenced it. The colonel was certain he would be next if he so much as took a deep breath. He waited, muscles tense enough to snap lumber. After several seconds of white-knuckled adrenaline, Moody saw a face in the foliage nearby. Whoever it was, they didn't make a sound. They only used hand gestures. Moo could tell the man was a Marine, since his hand gestures indicated there was one more hostile contact roughly 100 feet behind the colonel's position. Then, the face was gone. Ten seconds later, a fourth shot nearly vaporized an enemy scout stationed in a tree only a few yards from Colonel Moody's position. Had Moo even sat up straight, the attacker would have had a point-blank shot right at his head. The colonel almost jumped out of his tack suit when Sable ducked out of the undergrowth and sat down next to him as if she had returned a thrown ball. Sergeant Alexander arrived a moment later. Colonel, what unit are you with, Marine? Recon. Chapter 38. Advanced Strike Cruiser Fury CX plus 704. Manassas Station Frontier. Gitarn Sector 8. Commander Jace Hunter commanding. Corporal Andrew Benning reporting as ordered, ma'am. Even people who didn't know the commander well would have known Jace was on edge. She rarely used her inboard cabin and definitely never ordered anyone to report there. She wore her officer's conference gear, blue fatigues, and cover. This time, however, she was wearing her combat utility belt and a crossover harness. She was just about finished signing the last of her orders. She looked up and grinned. Corporal, you strike me as a Marine who's looking for a fight. Give me an order, ma'am. How would you like a shot at the guys who got you that purple heart? Benning didn't answer this time, but the look in his eyes said everything. I chewed your ass on Station 19, Corporal, and I think it's time you got a second chance. I need a security sergeant aboard my flagship. Interested? Aye. Corporal Benning tried not to smile. He almost succeeded. Help me kick Colonel Atwell's door down and you're hired. Affirmative. A moment later, Tom Huggins appeared in the doorway behind Jace's newest ally. Ma'am, with all due respect, I'd sure like to know just what the hell you think you're doing. Jace finished her last signature with a flourish and shoved the paperwork in a drawer. She opened the weapons locker behind her desk and retrieved a brand new TK-40. She safety checked it quickly and then tossed it to the corporal, who performed an identical safety check and then hoisted it over his shoulder. I'm joining the Corps, let's go. Jace led her exo and her new platoon corporal out of the cabin and up the passage towards the bridge. Hunter to security. Security, Lieutenant J. Lieutenant, I need four Marine infantry to gear up for a boarding action and report to the bridge on the double. Bring an extra pack. Right away, Commander. XO, got that zapper device? Commander Huggins handed the captain the fully charged alien device as if he were passing a baton in a foot race. Jace examined it and then hitched it to her utility belt. She produced a tablet and called up the reports filed by Yilly and Zoni on the proper operation of the device. She was still reading when she strode onto Fury's bridge. Signals. Open a hailing frequency to the Psi key. No visuals. Acknowledged. Channel open. Colonel Atwell, this is Commander Hunter. I agree to your terms. Fury will withdraw from Gitarin space. A pause. A wise choice, Commander. Send the same message to the rest of your task force, and Psi key will make preparations to release the captain to your custody. Give me a moment to set up our transmission. Jace made a hand-across-the-neck motion to her signals officer to close the channel. 
A moment later, four of Fury's security marines arrived. Three men and one woman. Each was outfitted with a TK-40 and the same basic gear as the commander. The leader tossed a combat pack to Benning. Weapons check, ladies and gentlemen. Jace drew the alien device from her belt. Now I won't lie to you. This thing is disorienting and we might materialize in midair, but we're going to hit the Psy Keys Bridge and put a stop to this war right here and right now, acknowledged? Yes, ma'am, replied the platoon sergeant. XO, you have the con. If any shuttles or escape craft show up, tractor them into our flight deck. Do not fire on the Psy Key unless provoked. Raise sick bay and have them prep for wounded. Huggins's expression looked drawn. By now he was used to his captain's aggressiveness, but this seemed reckless even for her. Ma'am, I recommend you remain. This could put you and your brother in grave danger. My brother isn't on that ship. Don't worry, XO, I'm following regulations. Hunter's eyes flashed. I'm also going to lead Atwell back to base in a cage. Marines, kill or cripple everything with a pulse. Affirmative? All had their rifles charged and ready. Five war faces glared. Stand by. Jace fiddled with the alien device. The lights rotated in sequence for a few seconds. Then she and the entire Marine squad vanished in a blinding flash. A mighty metal and composite crash followed. Jace landed in a doorway only steps from an armed human at least twice her weight. He drew a knife and slashed at her as she stumbled back. A second lunging attack pulled him off balance and Hunter went to the ground. Her doubled fists smashed his foot a moment before she drove her arms and shoulders up into his chin. His teeth cracked together and the knife clattered. He wheeled back with a grunt. Behind him, Sergeant Vickers leveled his weapon. Fury Marines, weapons down. The other two Psyche crew members didn't comply. One aimed a blaster at Vickers before his arms were shoved straight up. A struggle ensued before he was thrown back into a strobing thump of weapons fire. Sparks showered. Jace retrieved the knife and whirled with only an instant to spare. She let fly as a plasma lance ripped through the shoulder of her fatigues. The knife lodged in the attacker's neck. Dead weight hit the deck hard. Footsteps approached at a run. Benning was ready. Another dark-suited humanoid emerged at the end of the passage and shouted. Two conch rounds crashed through its armor and left its body smoking on the deck. A second attacker tossed something into the hallway. It made a metallic sound as it bounced. Lance Corporal Evans grabbed it like a bare-handed shortstop and threw it against the half-collapsed shelving in the passage corner. It deflected off the flat metal and detonated only a few feet beyond the corner wall. The explosion mixed with abruptly cut off screams as the Fury boarding party ran from the shock and the fireball with their arms up to protect their heads and ears. Are you injured, ma'am? Sergeant Vickers asked, examining the damage to Hunter's fatigues. Negative. Just winged me. Corporal, secure the prisoner. The bridge is at the far end of that passage. We fight our way in. Let's go. Hunter drew her sidearm and moved quickly to the turn in the passageway. She peered around the corner. The bridge hatch was only a few yards away. She briefly wondered why there were no sentries, but realized she and her squad might have just neutralized them. Why no alerts? Vickers asked quietly. The other Marines gathered behind him. Nobody had time to transmit, Hunter replied. Either that or their crew isn't that well trained yet. Meanwhile, aboard Fury, Commander Huggins was watching the Psy Key's SRS track like a hawk. Sir, I'm reading a power buildup aboard Uniform X-Ray 1, Engineering Section. Huggins stared at the viewscreen as realization dawned. He activated his comlink. Fury to boarding party, come in. Hunter. Captain, we're reading a power imbalance in the Psy Key's engineering section. Could be a weapon of some kind. What is your location? We're near the bridge, XO. Stand by. You may not have much time, ma'am. Hunter moved up the passageway towards the bridge hatch. She had her suspicions on what had just happened, and the answers were beyond the door. She checked the portal controls as the other Marines moved up. Jace pulled her electronics kit off her belt. We don't have time for this amateur hour crap, she growled as she pulled the panel off the disabled control station and hooked her universal board controller up to the security circuitry. The other Marines watched with a combination of wonder and surprise as their commander ran a bypass that looked for all the world like a teenage girl hot-wiring a car. Weapons up, Jay said. She reconnected the power and the bridge hatch slid aside to reveal... Nobody. I knew it. Hunter to fury. Bridge, Huggins. Any escape vessels or shuttles? Negative. 
<laughs> Jace strode across the frigate's bridge to the engineering console. It only took her a few seconds to recognize what was going on. They've rigged the Psy Key's engines to blow. I'm on my way to engineering. Sergeant, secure the bridge. Acknowledged. Ma'am, I recommend you abandon the Psy Key at once. Return to Fury. Negative, Exo, Jay said as she broke into a run. There might be valuable intel on this vessel, and I'm not going to let that bastard blow it up. She stopped in reverse direction before reaching the vertical egress tunnel on Deck 3. Hunter wasn't entirely sure, and it had been a while, but she might at least be able to guess her way to engineering aboard a Palermo frigate. Move the Fury off 10,000 clicks, raise battle screens, and pull up the deck plans for this ship so I don't end up trying to defuse the bowling alley. Huggins stood at the pilot station as the helm officer reversed the cruiser's engines. The moment Fury broke the 10,000-mile perimeter, Huggins activated his transmitter again. Fury is on station at 10,000 clicks. What is your position? Jay stopped and ran back, then through a hatch. Another vertical access tunnel was open at the end of the coolant valve auxiliary control room. Deck 4, she exhaled heavily. Likely amidships near the auxiliary coolant transfer batteries. Scan this vessel for life signs. Already done, ma'am. You and the Marine squad are it. Bastard, Jace thought. I'm at the main electrical switch matrix. Which way? 270 true. There's an emergency lift at the far end of the fire access space that leads to the engineering deck. Got it. Jace was relieved to find they hadn't torn the controls out of the magneto lift. She closed the cage and hit the controls for deck 8. She fidgeted and bounced on her toes until the hatch opened again to a darkened main engineering deck. She ran to the main fusion control bank and called up the universal interface. Fury, can SRS localize the power? Wait, I see it. Hunter moved quickly to the reactor chamber. Like DSS Minstrel, the Psyche's main reactor wasn't much bigger than an industrial walk-in freezer, but this model had an unauthorized accessory. A magnetically armed proximity charge was wired to the vessel's navigational interface. Hunter examined the device rapidly and formed a working theory on how it was supposed to operate. She keyed her comlink. Hunter to Vickers, under no circumstances touch the bridge navigational computer or the con, acknowledge. Acknowledged, ma'am. Hands off the controls. Very well, stand by. The commander skillfully removed the outer casing of the charge and examined the circuitry to confirm her suspicions. Hunter to Fury. Go ahead, Jace muttered as she fought with a bent corner of the panel. Amateur design for this thing. Whoever Atwell hired to be his engineer either didn't have any time or wasn't thinking clearly. This thing is magnetically armed. It's set to go off when the air ionizes around the reaction chamber. If we try to engage the mains, that's the signal to go poof. Acknowledged. Is there anything we can do to help? Stand by, Fury. Jace removed a versatile-looking tool from her belt and performed a rapid explosive ectomy on the main section of the proximity charge. She tossed the plastic compound aside and rewired the detonator to a simple polar circuit. She yanked a section of cable out of the nearby emergency light power unit and lashed it up to the internal power supply on the explosive casing before shoving the opposite end into the console heatsink. She found a pair of insulating gloves and a suitable bar of conductive metal and slammed it against the terminals. A bright lightning-like flash and a shower of sparks later, all that remained of the device was a blackened circuit board and a cloud of acrid smoke. Hunter to Fury, reset SRS and run another pass. Aboard the cruiser, Huggins gave Lieutenant Owens the signal and the sciences specialist performed another full scan of the Psi Key with his short-range scanners. No unusual readings, ma'am. I'm detecting no further overload conditions aboard. Life signs? Negative. Only the boarding party. Very well. Secure from quarters. Set alert condition 2. Send a damage control party and a corpsman aboard the shuttle to our forward soft lock. Tactical. Report all contacts. Lieutenant Palomar set the subspace warfare scanner array to active and ran a 360 by 360 sweep from the flag bridge tactical console. My only contact is uniform X-ray 1 bearing 015. Acknowledged. If any of those readings change, I want to be notified at once. We're on top of it, Commander. Stand by to receive damage control party. Huggins grabbed the handset at the bridge engineering station. All right, you son of a bitch, Jace muttered to herself as she strode back to the lifts. I've got prisoners, and I'm going to tear this ship apart until I find you or your plan. Chapter 39 
War Destroyer Exeter DDX-8043, Bayon 3, Windward Bay Seafloor, Depth 1,684 feet, Lieutenant Commander Alvin Pierce, Commanding, Intercept rolled warily out of the magneto lift onto Deck 4. By now the mini-bots were only about 15 yards from the SRS station, but they had a problem. There were two closed hatches in the passage between the lifts and the lieutenant's position. The closest of the two was off to one side and blocked by debris. The other was straight ahead, but further away. Are we right side up? Echo asked quietly. Sure are. When we decided to join the submarine navy, our ship decided to land on the ocean floor with the flat part pointed down, Wave replied. Water temperature is warm, too. Really warm. I hope that's not bad, Butterfly said. The little police car moved quietly to the first hatch. Its little searchlight snapped on and played a beam across the control panel and the edges of the portal. There wasn't any visible damage. Echo directed her sensors down the other passage. She didn't detect anything. No movement. No changes in air density or emissions. Brittany, it's Echo. We're here. Okay, Echo. The intruders may have moved on, but I can't detect anything from my station here. All but emergency power is out. Is the security system broken? Negative. Then if we get power, we can get the ship to help us. Butterfly, come on. Okay. The little helicopter floated down the straight-ahead passage, escorting Echo. The two bots were looking for the deck alert console, where Echo knew there was a power terminal either she or Lunar could activate with their universal connectors. Life signs, intruder! Intercept shouted. His tires squealed as he reversed at full speed. Rebel's turret traversed clockwise as he rumbled into the passageway. He acquired a full engagement field on the portal only a moment before it slid open. Two vaguely humanoid intruders tried to step through, only to be blinded by Intercept's floodlights. Both raised hands to shield their eyes. Halt! he shouted. Rebel followed with, Drop all weapons! No. One of the attackers tried to aim its power rifle through the hatch, but both Rebel and Wave were ready. The big tank fired a powerful blast, punching the first intruder hard in the chest. It flailed back as the other blindly opened fire into the stark white lights. A barrage of energy bolts tore searing gashes in the metal bulkheads, but missed, largely because the intruder didn't realize he was up against a team of robotic vehicles, each roughly the size of a box of detergent. A stray bolt impacted Wave's starboard side battle screens. The emitter overloaded and scattered sparks across the floor. Wave returned fire with a long burst from his main repeaters. Several of the bolts tore into the intruder's arm. A scream echoed in the corridor as flames began to climb its shoulder. It turned to run. Stand fast, Intercept barked. The attacker ran back up the corridor. Intercept's light bar activated, filling the passage with red and blue flashes. The little car's tires squealed again and its siren echoed. He accelerated up the passageway in pursuit, headlights strobing. Hawkins heard the sound and rolled to her side just in time to see the Mobile Security Command logo and badge on Intercept's passenger door as he screamed past the SRS section. Lunar, help Intercept, Rebel ordered. The little rocket tore up the passage after the police car like a tiny missile. Rebel's emergency systems activated and he doused Wave with fire suppressant. Wave, stand by for repairs. Sure thing, old friend. Wave replied as he deployed his repeater battery to cover the passage where Intercept and Lunar had gone. The larger tank's external articulation arms went to work repairing Wave's battle screen emitter. Meanwhile, Echo and Butterfly had arrived at the deck alert power terminal. Within moments, the small ambulance had connected her own batteries to the ship's power grid. Butterfly activated her data link and configured the deck four subsystems to isolate themselves from the rest of the ship's electrical access. Then she set the power junction to divert Echo's battery power to limit transfers only to the deck alert system. Exeter's command computer issued the necessary challenges, and both Echo and Butterfly responded with Jace's command codes, which gave them virtually unlimited access to the destroyer's command functions. Seconds later, Deck 4 began drawing power directly from Echo's batteries. Yellow lights flooded the passages and cabins across the entire deck. Once the system had stored enough energy to operate for a short interval, Echo disconnected. Deck alert subsystems restored to full operation, the little ambulance reported, responding to SRS control to treat wounded. Her own light bars activated and she raced back down the passageway towards Rebel and Wave. Butterfly followed. Information flooded Hawkins's comlink. Exeter's security systems rapidly identified six intruders on Deck 4, all of which were on the opposite side of the ship near auxiliary control. 
A seventh was moving quickly down the center passage near the spectrometry and life sciences labs. She keyed the device. Computer, this is Lieutenant J.G. Brittany Hawkins. Identifier Mercator 8199. Request security access. Affirmative, Lieutenant J.G. Brittany Hawkins. Voice print positive. Identity match. How can Exeter help you today? At that exact instant, Hawkins had an idea. Echo had restored the deck alert systems. Maybe there is enough power. Stand by. Hawkins to Echo. Come in. Hi, Brittany. I'll be there in ten seconds. Are your transponders all active? All the mini-bots? Uh-huh. We always have our transponders on unless AC says to turn them off. Very well. Stand by. Computer, engage automatic deck defense measures and authorize weapons release. Affirmative. Deck defense weapon reactivated. Engaging hostile contacts in five minutes. Mark. An audible second-by-second -second countdown sounded on the lieutenant's comlink. Hawkins wasn't thrilled at the idea of having to wait five minutes, but she understood the safety locks and the rationale. It was more important to get friendly personnel whose transponders might be malfunctioning out of the way than it was to unleash the auto systems. Normally, the command computer would have handled all the preliminary checks and configurations and Exeter's Marine Security Detachment would be available to activate the overrides if necessary. Unfortunately, none of those options were available at the moment, so the lieutenant was forced to make do. Despite the delay, she knew what was about to be unleashed on the attackers. They would have no way of knowing how she had managed to restore power, and if the weapons were effective enough, it might give Exeter's crew a foothold from which to launch a counterattack and retake the ship. At the moment, the whole plan depended on Commander Hunter's bots. Like most members of the Perseus Task Force, Hawkins had heard of her commander's cybernetic experiments, and of course, she had heard the stories. The idea of brave toy robots charging into battle sounded more than a little outlandish, but for those who bothered to look up the facts, they would find Echo had been awarded a ribbon from the Indian Forks campaign and Intercept had been officially attached to the security section aboard DSS Fury. Although none of the minibots had ranks, they were by order of the Office of the Task Force Commander members of the Skywatch Auxiliary and therefore eligible for enlistment and battle commendations. Jace wasn't confident they could adequately lead other fleet members or Marines yet, so her auxiliary appointments specifically prohibited promotion. For all other intents and purposes, however, all six of the minibots were skywatch from their power supplies to their headlamps. Lieutenant Hawkins saw the rotating reflections of Echo's lights in the outside passageway. She also heard a strange sound like the wings of a gigantic moth flapping at about 100 times their normal speed. A moment later, Butterfly peeked around the edge of the hatch and played a laser rangefinder across the entire SRS station. Having detected no threats, the little helicopter hovered into the room while Echo made her way past all the limbs and bodies in the doorway. She pulled up alongside the lieutenant and performed a quick scan of Hawkins's injuries. You got hurt, but I can fix it. It's just three fractures. That's easy. Don't give me the details. Just make it stop her. Hawkins' vision blurred as painkillers streamed into her circulation. Her legs and feet felt as if they were several miles away. She imagined a sunny sky and a big tree just swaying in the breeze way up in the sky and then drifted off. Having knocked the lieutenant silly, Echo proceeded to synthesize a latex polymer using her built-in nanochemical apparatus. The emitter doused Hawkins's leg from her knee to her toes, leaving the slick, plastic-like substance dripping from her tack suit surface. Echo's external sleeve slid around the lieutenant's knee and inflated to much higher than normal pressure. Oxygen flooded the polymer compound and it expanded into a flexible but surprisingly sturdy cast. Hawkins' leg was virtually immobilized from the knee down, but her fractures had been set firmly and skillfully enough the cast itself would support her weight. Now it's better, Echo announced. She pumped a dose of adrenaline into Hawkins's bloodstream to counteract the painkillers. After a few seconds, the lieutenant regained consciousness. Her eyes fluttered open. She turned to her side and found herself staring at Echo's headlights. Hi. Hi, what happened? You got a broken leg, so I made a cast. But you gotta go see a doctor right away, and you shouldn't take the cast off until a doctor says. Hawkins sat up. The pain in her leg was gone. She immediately noticed the rigid resistance of the temporary set Echo had manufactured. I could walk on this. Uh-huh. Now we can all go where it's safe. Right, Butterfly? Right. And the safest place on the ship is right here. 
At that moment, Wave and Rebel pulled up outside and arranged themselves back to back in order to guard both approaches to the SRS section. Hawkins checked her comlink. The deck defense systems would activate in less than two minutes. Once we retake Deck 4, we start making plans to retake the bridge. Chapter 40 Operation Pegasus Combined Task Force Strike Formation Bayon 3 Interdiction Perimeter Commander Toby DeMay Commanding More than 110 vessels broke the Bayon 3 defense perimeter at once. The lead squadrons had already activated their battle screens, and the commander had ordered the customary standing alert condition. Commander Dunkirk, this is Nemesis 4 on priority frequency. Come in, please. DeMay's signals officer could barely read the Electronic Warfare Corvette's transmission, which was unusual enough that it required its own report. Sir, the formation is being jammed on all frequencies. Nemesis 4 has pierced the interference within our formation. We are being hailed. On screen, DeMay turned to face the forward section of Dunkirk's bridge. The pilot of the Electronic Warfare Corvette appeared. Sir, there is a formidable scattering field in effect throughout this system. Data link is being degraded by at least 40%, and subspace communications are only possible at minimal ranges. We are using maximum overload power on our anti-countermeasures transmissions. Recommend the formation reconfigure their short-range arrays to maximum power with minimum bandwidth until we can locate the source of the... Sir! The sudden shout from the tactical officer drew the attention of the entire bridge crew. DeMay was on his feet. On the screen, a pitched battle between two unidentified cruiser-class vessels and DSS Revenge was playing out between megaton-level bursts of gravitic energy. Space flashed and burned around the vessels. Revenge was streaming atmosphere, but she was still underway and still returning fire. It was a shocking mismatch. Obviously, Commander Enright had been ambushed. Signals, raise flight leader Squadron 994 and Squadron 16, code 00 black. Forward units are cleared to engage enemy vessels at 2-1 mark. Affirmative force, Commander, coding your message. Aboard Buck-2, the 994 TOS flight leader had already drawn her blast shields down over her faceplate. The reflective surface tinted her cockpit lights such that her onboard battle computers would be able to communicate status through colors instead of hard-to-read telemetry. Her triple-S interpreters were already active. She keyed her amplified comlink. Buck-2 to Scallywags. We've got the call. Let's break them up. Six jacks banked out of the strike formation, following Shaw's lead and accelerated on a wide vector to the enemy cruiser's flanks. Meanwhile, four of Commander Banner's Devil Cats screamed ahead on a direct attack run right into the formation's teeth. Come in revenge, come in revenge! The signals officer kept the transmitters active. Suddenly, the tactical officer spoke up. I have them, sir. Very faint. Auxiliary frequency data only. Advise Revenge to alter course 195 Mark 60, DeMay ordered. Contact Nemesis 8. Electronic countermeasures to maximum, formation-wide. Engage data link and combined point defense. Advise Major Singleton he is cleared to make his run. Detach T-Hawk Black and Los Gatos for inbound escort. Affirmative, Captain. Coding your messages. Dunkirk has the ball. Tactical, sound battle stations energy. Shields to maximum. All power to weapons. The clear channel tone sounded across the ship. Pilot, bring us up loud and fast. Five degrees starboard, battle speed. The huge cruiser's deck pitched as the bridge crew fastened their harnesses. The station's klaxon sounded. Aboard Revenge, Commander Enright couldn't be sure through the fire and smoke on his bridge. He might have been hallucinating, but he could have sworn he heard a Skywatch fighter designator over his auxiliary circuits. He dragged himself to the signals console. It was barely functioning and his communications officer was unconscious and bleeding. He somehow managed to reconfigure his emergency transmitter and key it to his comlink. Attention any Skywatch units that can hear my voice. Enemy vessels have advanced reactive weapons. Do not engage with any beam weapon. Repeat, do not engage with beam weapons. The trailing enemy cruiser had been designated Atlantis-14 by the Revenge SRS and Tactical Tracking Systems. It was caught slow and out of position and had no defenses starboard side to deal with the oncoming wedge of yellow jackets. Lieutenant Shaw opened up at a murderous range of only 6,000 miles. Fox 2. Buck 2 banked away as her SDAC fusion missiles slashed through the enemy drive field. Twin fusion warheads slammed into the cruiser's starboard shields, boiling the ship's hull in violent X-ray bursts. Buck 6 followed up. Fox 2, missile away. 
This time it was an SRAT 107 hemlock weapon with an antimatter warhead. The enormous torpedo acquired lock and bore down on Atlantis 14, accelerating as it punched through the cruiser's drive field. Point defense snapped into position and exploded with standoff fire. The hemlock dove and spun, swerving closer and closer to its target. Finally, the enemy fire control locked the warhead and the next shot ripped the missile out of space with a ghostly flash. Not far away, a diamond formation of fighters from the Devil Cats were just about to break optimum firing range. Their target was the forward cruiser, designated Atlantis-12. They hadn't copied Enright's warning. DCAT-5 opened up first. The fighter's particle weapons crashed into the cruiser's forward shields and instantly overloaded. White-hot beams burned around the fighter's drive field until the cruiser's forward batteries moved into position. The huge weapons locked on the particle trails and fired a gigantic feedback pulse along the magnetic residue between the cruiser and the attacking fighters. DCAT-5 vanished in a sunbright ball of white fire. Edmund. Commander Banner was almost knocked off course by the disruption, but he managed to right his cat, screaming in at nearly 600 miles a second. He fired both wing beams simultaneously. The weapons tore an unstable gash in the enemy cruiser's screens. A second battery locked both plasma trails and counter-amplified their destructive power by a factor of nearly 20. DCAT 1's drive field boiled in space for several seconds before the liquefied hull ripped itself to pieces in an ugly reactive explosion. Two cats are down. Two cats down. DeMay bared his teeth. Tactical, get me a waveform lock and bearings match on forward target Atlantis 12. Stand by forward batteries 1 and 2. I have the range, sir. Target locked. Fire, battery 1. The strike cruiser's enormous dorsal energy battery glowed to life and speared space for almost 19,000 miles. The pulse shattered Atlantis 12's forward shields entirely. A moment later, nearly every control mechanism on Dunkirk's bridge exploded with overload energy. A blinding beam of impossibly intense white light grew to monstrous proportions between the two cruisers. Dunkirk's lights snapped out, leaving only the scopes and forward screens for light. A sound like a sinuave generator powered by a couple dozen jet engines nearly cut its way through the bulkheads and decks. Everyone on the bridge slammed their hands against their ears, but the sound did its damage anyway. Blood streamed through the captain's fingers. Nearly all the bridge personnel screamed, but their voices were completely absorbed by the feedback wave. A moment later, the dorsal armor plate of DSS Dunkirk detonated, engulfing the cruiser's entire upper deck superstructure in a 40,000-degree firestorm. Battery 1 tumbled away as the huge flagship rolled to starboard, streaming wreckage, hard radiation, and atmosphere. Mac 1's pilot shouted back into the loading bay. New contact! Designate hostile Atlantis 15, bearing 281, range 8 million miles on intercept course and closing rapidly. Major Singleton could only stare in abject shock at the scope. Operation Pegasus had just effectively been blown to hell, leaving his MAC transports and a single formation of gunships alone against whatever was already down on the Bayonne surface, to say nothing of the possibility Atlantis 12 and 14 might have more than just one escort. Transport 1, this is Black Swan. We are tracking an inbound missile wave targeting all Pegasus transports. Vector Mark 10 for cover. Attention all vessels, attention all vessels. Disable your beam emplacements, missiles and warheads only. Repeat, disable all beam weapons, missiles and warheads only. Order the amphibious formation to evasive action, the Major shouted. The Alpha Strike fired by the hostile Atlantis-15 warship was chillingly formidable. Based on their emissions, the Pegasus formation concluded the inbounds were likely balanced with track on signature, track on emissions, and harm style warheads. The storm of electronic countermeasures and anti countermeasure interference was so intense, the gunships of T Hawk Black were having trouble reading it correctly. But the beauty of ships like Black 2, also known as the Black Swan, was that brawler cannons didn't care about ECM, and they weren't beam weapons either. Four of the eight gunships escorting Major Singleton's landing force peeled off. Lieutenant Parker Dunleavy, the commander of the Black Two, calmly opened a channel to the Seventh. Yank, form up on us. If we can't send the cats in, let's see how they feel about some sons of bitches flying bombers and gunships. Captain Horace Frank keyed his transmitter. Affirmative Black Swan, the Seventh is in. Eighteen heavy Paladin bombers rolled out of the strike formation and raced towards the attack vector established by Black Two and her three angry escorts. Hell Square, Black Four, Karen's staff, Black One and Negative X, Black Six. 
They were approaching the wedge of incoming missiles at more than 3,000 miles a second closure. Panic reactors to maximum. Reinforce all battle screens forward. Stand by for targets, Dunleavy ordered. The gunships were in a flawless diamond formation. Their data link and point defense was coordinated to tolerances of a millionth of a second. Each of the four ships was tracking more than 200 bandits. Seventh, we'll plow the row. You send our friends a nice welcome basket, Dunleavy said. Not far behind the wedge of gunships, a mighty formation of bombers loomed, their own battle screens reacting against their drive fields as they pushed their engines to the very edge of their tolerances. Affirmative. All wings, arm warheads, and standby for waveform telemetry. Egg-shaped weapons, each the size of a small delivery van, emerged from beneath the arm wings of the heavy paladins. These were not the simple contact bombs launched by forward mechs like airborne or mechanized units. These were the monster blockbuster weapons of Argent's only strategic space wing, the Decimators, referred to by weapons specialists as the S-Hex-10 radiation kinetic charge, and by marine pilots as Shucks. They were equally as effective over ground targets as they were in space. In fact, Paladin crews often deployed them as mines, since they carried their own onboard space and surface warfare electronics packages and could deliver focused destructive power nearly equal to an 18-megaton fission weapon in the form of a hypercompressed burst of high-energy X-rays. They were considered clean weapons after a fashion, since they left behind no explosive or radioactive residue, and since they could be configured to direct their energy using a precisely timed magnetic field, they were generally considered rather safe for the wielder. A similar weapon without the ability to contain and focus the X-ray burst would be likely to vaporize expensive and hard-to-replace strategic bombers, no matter how fast they veered away from their targets. Each of the paladins in the seventh were carrying ten such weapons, and every paladin pilot was perfectly capable of deploying his or her decimators in open space combat. By now, the gunship formation and the inbounds were on a collision course at more than 2,600 miles per second closure. The highly trained and experienced crews of T-Hawk Black were unusually quiet and reserved. They were well aware any of the approaching missiles could create jumbo-sized problems for their formation. They were also aware whoever had launched them wasn't likely prepared for Tarantula Hawk appetites. The 7th banked in behind T-Hawk Black and reconfigured its data link and combined point defense into a cybernetic fortress of electronic potential. The big paladins and their even bigger bombs strained to close range with the point of the spear not far ahead of them. They had almost reached a range where they could include the gunships in their shared defense perimeter when Black Six opened fire on the inbounds. Overloaded brawler cannons thundered away at the leading edge of the missile formation. Several of the birds veered in an attempt to avoid Negative X and her targeting systems, but most were rapidly disrupted and torn to ribbons by secondary explosions. Bursts of gravitic and unstable plasma energy flashed and strobed. Debris and ignited fuel scattered in every direction as the night black gunships screamed through the formation. A moment later, Black Swan and Hell Square joined in. The three gunships blasted a 15-mile wide hole in the strike. Seconds later, the entire squadron of heavy paladins rocketed through, now bearing down on Atlantis 15 like rabid hunting dogs. The fire in the eyes of the marine pilots as they engaged their attack runs would have driven vampires out of a blood bank. By now, T-Hawk Black was also upon its target. Atlantis 15 was undeniably alien in design. The gunship wing read no human life forms aboard. It was heavier than the other two cruisers, but it was quite obviously unprepared for the relatively tiny, teeth-bared little ships gathering at its bow. The two alien escort cruisers opened up with point defense, but they were both out of range and still trying to recover from the missile strikes from Lieutenant Shaw's jacks. Atlantis 15 engaged the attacking gunships first, which would turn out to be a fatal mistake. Karen's handle took the brunt of the first barrage of heavy weapons fire, absorbed it, slammed it through her panic reactors, and opened up with her cannons like a deranged sorcerer. Violent bolts of white-hot energy tore enormous reactive gouges in the cruiser's forward battle screens. The big ship returned fire, and Black One began glowing in space with all the feedback energy she was turning aside or channeling into her panic matrix. A moment later, the seventh arrived with Argent's special delivery. SAG-9 pulled her launch handles at an effective range of six miles, which may as well have been Atlantis 15's front porch. The first decimator actually impacted the vessel's portside armor before spinning off into space and then detonating. 
The effect of the invisible shockwave against the unshielded hull of the warship was disorienting but highly effective. Sixty tons of hull plating and deck structure instantly reached a temperature of over 100,000 degrees before being disrupted and twisted beyond recognition. Plates were thrown into space at speeds that were beyond human comprehension. SAG-4 banked away as two more decimators disappeared into the enemy cruiser's inner hull amidships. The fourth bomb punctured the topmost deck. The entire Paladin formation streaked past as at least seven explosions thumped and pounded from inside the ship's hull. An uncontrolled hypernova finally escaped her starboard armor and tore the quarter-million-ton vessel into pieces. Her drive field collapsed and the kinetic forces reduced the cruiser to white-hot spinning debris. Aboard the transports, Major Singleton was buoyed somewhat by the fact Operation Pegasus had been floored by its opponent's first punch, but had gotten back to its feet and punched back hard enough to take out at least one cruiser-class vessel. Range to the LZ pilot. Three minutes, Mac one's pilot shouted. We have escort. Nemesis 4 now providing electronic standoff interference. Recall all the cats and get the rest of those mechs in tight. We're going in. Chapter 41 Operation Crimson Thunder, Recon Team Apache Blade, Triad Jungle Lowlands, Bay on 3, approximately 175 miles southwest of Lethe Deeps. I had to put the rest of the survey team in stasis, Moo continued. Our power was out, and I lost my handheld avoiding an autonomous security sweep. There's some kind of scattering field down here. The captain surmised some kind of natural cause, Alexander replied. That was our first thought, too. But it turned out the conditions that would lead to those algae blooms never emerged, at least in the region where we lost power. I can't prove it yet, but I'm convinced the enemy LZ had something to do with knocking out 6-4's atmospheric drives. That's how they knew where to look. Do you have the coordinates of the recovery LZ? Four clicks bearing 315. I have orders to neutralize it, sir. Is there any possibility of reviving your infill team? They're beat all to hell, Sergeant, and I'm going to countermand your orders temporarily. There's something about that base cap doesn't know, but you should. They have some kind of semi-permanent teleportation mechanism set up. I don't know where it goes, but I saw creatures coming out of that gateway that were about as far from human as a creature can get. Have we seen them before? The 98th has. I ran a full sensor sweep on the mechanism. I probably shouldn't have since that's what attracted their security bots in the first place. Whatever it is, it's got some kind of connection to Bayonne 4 and the Lethe Deeps complex. I saw the Alaska base firsthand, sir. I have a lot of friends in the 98th. We all graduated basic together. Major Charton is a good officer, hell of a tactical mind. I met him at the academy about a year after my commission. He had just started at Infantry Training Command. If anyone can lead them out of that hellhole, it's him. Do you think the enemy has similar plans for Bayonne 3? That's a distinct possibility, Sergeant. Let me show you something. Colonel Moody took Alexander's handheld and entered his Paladin's security op codes. Ariane dutifully added 6-4 to the local combat data link and made its library computer files available. Moo spent a few seconds gathering the readings and then handed the device back to the sergeant. My readings indicated some kind of biological phenomenon at the other end of this link. Whatever it is, it's growing out of the ground on Bayon 4, and it's infesting Hallow's Moon in the process. We started out with an asteroid and graduated to a planet-sized problem. Now we may have a two-planet problem, and all that we can find from the 98th are a few scattered survivors from the fire team. Is there anything we can do from this end to stop it? To tell you the truth, I need Zoni and Anora down here to advise me. While we're at it, I need Yili to explain to me how a mechanical device like the one I saw in that LZ can be having the kind of biological effect it's having on Bayon 4. Alexander called up his readings from the bacteria he had encountered. Tell me what you make of this, Colonel. Moo studied the readings for a moment. I'm no expert, but at least one of those species isn't native to the Bayon system. That was my first thought. The new arrival is trying to get a foothold and kill off the more aggressive strains. That may be what is causing the strange scattering field. Perhaps there is some connection between the biological phenomena and the alien technology. Biopowered teleportation, Moo mused. I know what I saw inside the alien hive didn't make a lot of sense, but it sure was a convincing display of power. The only way we can know for sure where that doorway in the enemy LZ leads is to go through it and then destroy it behind us. 
I'd say that qualifies as neutralizing their foothold, sir, provided the portal is what they're trying to protect. If they plan to use it to... Moo's comlink lit up. Overlapping transmissions from at least four different sources combined into a babbling cacophony of panicked voices. Neither Marine could determine who was transmitting or what their status was. The colonel keyed the device to filter voice channels into single data streams. Major Komonov's voice was the loudest. Attention all Skywatch units. 14th Infantry reports. They have engaged an unidentified invasion force at the Starhaven perimeter. Ground units rally at Point Sierra. I say again. Moo switched channels. 40th Airborne signaling station orbit vectoring 4-5 degrees for ground intercept. And again. We'll set down at Point Sierra. Mac 3 will vector northeast to guard White Ridge. I want power systems operational two minutes after we hit dirt. Stand by to deploy... Invasion force, Alexander said calmly. More than one. White Ridge is about 150 miles east of here. That rules out traveling on foot. Any chance of repairing 6-4? Negative. Her drives are a pile of junk. Main power is online, but operating at just enough capacity to maintain the stasis mechanisms. Then our only option is to infiltrate the LZ and use that portal. Let's get to it, Sergeant. Sable followed the two Marines as they started towards the enemy camp. Chapter 42 Sixth Armor Company Skywatch Landing Zone, White Ridge Captain Leonard Tarkas commanding If we can't drive over it, we'll drive through it. Tiger Man, open fire! The main battery of Captain Tarkas's SX-15 Razorback tank swiveled silently and unleashed a hellish barrage of plasma fire against an ugly, broken wall of unremarkable stone only a few hundred yards away. Sixth Armor had been underway for nearly twenty minutes, but found itself consistently blocked from a better firing position a few miles to the east. Tarkas needed his tanks where they could support the infantry transports Major Singleton was hurrying to set down on the planet's surface. Explosions shot rocky debris into the sky. Orange fireballs bloomed all along the 140-foot obstacle until there wasn't much left but scorch marks and a fair number of startled birds. Column ahead. I want to be at Point Sierra in two minutes. Move. The 19,000-ton weapon pivoted on tracks each the size of a medium-sized yacht and lurched forward, spitting several thousand pounds of shale, dirt, mud, pulped plant matter, and water into the sky behind it. Within a few seconds, Tarkas's main battle tank reached an overland velocity of nearly 60 miles per hour. The occupants bounced and dodged side to side as the mass of dense metal, battle screens, and firepower leaped and crashed over the broken terrain. In the distance, airbursts and frantically transmitting drones indicated Argent's invasion force had made landfall. Five more SX-15S fell into formation behind the captain's lead unit, forming a hastily organized battle wedge. Tarkas knew Singleton was going to need heavy firepower on the ground as quickly as possible. The top priority for 14th Infantry and 6th Armor in particular was protecting Argent's ground forces until they could stabilize and move on Sarn positions to the east. What's the story on the coastline armor? Tarkas barked. His driver and radio man both sat one level below the captain's command chair. Tigerman was still trying to get his helmet fastened properly while driving with one hand. Stevers was holding his headphones tightly to prevent them from being ripped off his head. No update since Black Five's last report, sir, Stevers shouted. Nah. We've got to get something over there to block that advance, or those sea crops are going to pave over Starhaven like a road crew. Bandits. Designate targets 1 through 5 continuous. Jester 1 on ground engagement intercept. Range 90 miles and closing. What's the position? Tarkas snapped, turning to look behind his command chair at the auxiliary scope. Low and fast, approaching from the west. Two, three, three, true. Missile lock. Missile lock my ass. Tarkas actually took the cigar out of his mouth for a moment and yelled like he was arguing over a parking fee. All units, this is lunch wagon. Deflection lock target Jester 1. Fire at will. Enemy spacecraft streaked into view over the western horizon, banking out of their northbound track to strafe the 6th armor column. By now, the wedge of five tanks was pushing 80 mph over the broken terrain. All of their main turrets traversed in perfect synchronization and launched a sky-shattering barrage of overloaded plasma bolts at the screaming inbounds. Sprint missiles, beam weapons, and electronic noise crashed into the Skywatch weapons and filled a thousand cubic miles with orange fire blooms, each the size of a luxury resort. A wall of warhead-equipped missiles slashed out of the sky and bore down on the SX-15S. 
Each tank's short-range defenses lit up in perfect concert with all the other units in the wedge. A furious and desperate explosion of destructive energy surrounded the formation, leaving whipping bright fires behind. Razorback 9 was blown into the sky. After tumbling for at least 500 yards, the enormous weapon came to rest on its side and then tipped over onto its back. Hold advance. Bring us about Tigerman. Maintain main battery fire. The other four tanks slowed and each skidded the length of a football field to a stop. The enemy spacecraft rocketed overhead, and the SX-15S each tracked them with their turrets. Moments before they disappeared over the horizon, another volley of plasma fire lit up the sky with airbursts. Razorback 9 blew its dorsal jets and flipped over, landing on thundering tracks. Damage assessment. No hits, no damage. Razorback 9 is operational. Get moving, hogs. Get me to Point Sierra now. All five tanks threw mud skyward once again and roared north towards the landing zone. Chapter 43. 12th Marine Mechanized. Skywatch Landing Zone, Point Sierra. First Lieutenant Randall Dunham commanding. The silvery hull of Paladin 7-7 hovered into position over the south edge of Point Sierra and activated its quick drop mechanisms. The smaller of Bayonne 3's sun's reflected glare flashed across its war paint and hull designation forward of the enormous formation ID, DSS Argent BBV-740. Two SX-10 land assault tracks roared out of its vehicle hold moments before the Paladin rotated into its mech configuration. Metal feet each the size of side-by-side -side rail cars pounded against the ground and supported the weight of the war machine as it rose to its full 80-foot height. Twin missile banks deployed on opposite sides of its main hull as it began to march forward, causing mild earthquakes with each step. Four more mechs just like it performed exactly the same maneuver alongside their wing leader. In a matter of two minutes, 180 Marines aboard 10 vehicles were rolling in the direction of the nearest enemy column. Hostile units believed to be Sarn had set down to the west of the 14th Infantry Garrison in an attempt to take one of the base's three energy facilities offline. It was all crystal clear on Lieutenant Dunham's scope. Aboard her lead mech, she was attempting to coordinate a bracketing maneuver in preparation for the arrival of the remaining Yellow Jacket fighters from Argent Squadron 60. The 5th mech stomped into position at the far end of the line, and the lieutenant ordered the 12th to advance on the enemy position to the north. Alien infantry was still raining out of orbit using individual re-entry pods instead of transports. It was a perfect example of what the lieutenant's training officers called whoever gets their firstest with the mostest wins. At the moment, Skywatch was ahead, but given the rumors of a full-fledged battle group holding position on the far side of the planet, that advantage wasn't likely to last for long. The first five mechs formed a diamond slot formation and established an elevated firing position approximately 11 miles southeast of Skull Point. A planet-wide hostile action bulletin had already been broadcast by Komanov's gun shop, meaning artillery was about to start pounding on the enemy landing sites. The plan was to race ahead, deploy as close to the energy facility as possible, and then dogfight the rest of the way in. The mechs of the 12th launched an awe-inspiring barrage of tracer missiles across the no-man's land three miles north of Point Sierra. Detonations and fireballs marched across the horizon, providing cover for the first of Dunham's infantry to come pouring out of their low-slung LAVs. The Marines were true to their reputation, firing as they advanced. Alien light armor parked on the last ridge south of Energy Facility 2 and began strafing the mechanized formations with main battery fire, which only drew the attention of the mechs. Another prolonged volley of sprint missiles turned at least six tanks into fiery piles of mangled junk. Two of the alien vehicles returned fire, heavily damaging Paladin 8-1 and knocking down the battle screens of Dunham's unit. Reinforcements arrived for the light tanks a moment before the formation started pressing its advantage. They all stopped cold when Captain Tarkas and his super heavies crested the southern hill. A man-portable rocket launcher speared the main turret of the lead light tank and detonated, lifting the entire structure into the air on an ugly explosion. Then it seemed like everyone opened fire at once. The most pitched battle in Skywatch history started to spin and whirl in an increasingly violent storm of weapons fire, explosions, electronic interference, and radioactive debris. Just as the SX-15 column reached the Point Sierra Basin, a shockwave of gravitic energy rolled across the entire planetary surface like a fast-moving tidal wave of distortion. Lieutenant Dunham picked it up first. 
It was a faraway tone that grew rapidly in both pitch and volume. Before long, it started to scramble instruments and knock out utility lights in the cockpits of the mighty Paladin mechs. On the ground, Marine infantry staggered back and forth, hands to the sides of their heads. None could say for sure where the phenomenon was emanating from, and none of the units on the ground could get their comlinks or data communications devices to work properly. The battle continued, but it seemed as if the Skywatch forces were the only ones affected by the strange distortion wave. The alien units began to advance, taking advantage of the fact none of the human war machines were functioning properly, if at all. Chapter 44 Operation Crimson Thunder Recon Team Apache Blade Abandoned Enemy Landing Zone Approximately 180 miles southwest of Lethe Deeps This wasn't accidental, Sergeant. Atwell meant for us to find this. Colonel Moody, Sergeant Alexander, and Sable were steps away from the strange alien portal. It was situated in the center of a clearing at the base of a gully not far from Alexander's set-down pod. It seethed with electromagnetic energy and was surrounded by an olive-colored cloud that twisted and distorted the image of it as if it were being reflected in a carnival mirror. The rest of the landing zone was gone, as if it had never been there at all. There wasn't a single piece of equipment, nor was there any physical evidence anyone had been in or out of the clearing in months. It may have been illusionary, sir. In fact, that portal may be as well. I know I saw creatures coming out of that thing. I want to know where they came from. We have two hours of life support between us. If we appear someplace hostile to human life, we won't last long. All we have to do is last long enough to destroy whatever is at the other end. Are you with me? As long as you take the rap for going off the reservation, sir, Alexander replied with a grin. Sable and I don't give orders. We carry them out. Then let's put an end to this. An instant after Moo and Alexander stepped through, the portal faded, leaving nothing in the enemy LZ at all. A cold breeze caused dust clouds to swirl across the clearing. Chapter 45 Assault Cruiser Revenge CA-220 Bayon 3 Interdiction Zone Commander Patrick Enright Commanding The alien cruisers had moved on. DSS Revenge's main drive was down. Most of her crew was either injured or missing. She had suffered a catastrophic decompression of all crew-occupied areas below Deck 12. Even the heroic actions of her legendary damage control parties had only managed to put out the largest of the fires burning portside. Since the attack by the 994th against Atlantis 14, the need for air cover over Point Sierra had sapped most of the Strike Force's fighter strength. Singleton had gotten his transports down intact, but the fleet forces had paid the price. Now there were no fewer than five alien cruisers performing the space equivalent of wave hopping and driving the remaining fighters and gunships further from their ideal positions over the planet. None of the Strike Force officers could get a response from Dunkirk. She was presumed dead in space, although her hull was still intact, and there were intermittent emissions and life signs detectable in both her engine and boat bay sections. By now, there was a 4,000 mile trail of bodies, hard radiation, atmosphere, and debris behind her. Enright knew it would only be a matter of time before the alien task force returned to finish off his command. Their weapon, whatever it was, and however it managed to do what it did, was the most disastrous thing any Skywatch vessel had ever encountered. There wasn't a signal from the alien ships. There was no hesitation in their attack. Revenge's first shot cost her two of her four main batteries, half her firepower. Although a newer ship might have had the option of engaging with missiles, Revenge wasn't designed for that kind of fight. The alien weapon was a perfect counter to a fleet CA. The battle unfolded in about the way anyone would expect. Even though he was broken and bleeding at his con, and although his ship was wrecked, it wasn't the dire situation caused by the fires and environmental events that got Commander Enright's attention. It was the sudden alarm at the Life Sciences Station of all places. It persistently jangled, as if to insist whatever it had detected demanded attention despite the life and death struggle surrounding it. After a painful crawl to the sparking and smoldering console, Enright managed to pull himself up to the crash couch. He knew he didn't have the strength to go any further. On his main screen, he was going to get a magnificent view of Skywatch losing control of the Bayon system right before he and his crew were all vaporized in a fusion explosion. He fiddled with the scope at the life sciences station and blinked. He leaned closer to get a better look and what was left of the color in his face drained away. 
A fissure of some kind was visible on the surface of Bayon 4, and it was emitting some kind of unidentifiable energy. Even from more than a million miles off, the jagged black and red tear being detected by the 983's look-down probe on the surface of the planet was visible, and based on the telemetry gathered so far, it had grown to a surface area of more than half a million square miles in an interval of only a few hours. The commander slumped back in his chair. His injuries were starting to overwhelm what remained of his strength. He stared at the tactical display, watching the undamaged alien cruiser designated Atlantis-16 as it approached Revenge's position. This is it, Enright thought. We gave all we had and it wasn't enough. The cruiser drew closer. It was now only 10,000 miles off Revenge's port quarter. Enright had no shields and no weapons. Power was down to batteries, and even that was fluctuating. All he could do was perform a ship's captain's last duty and die with his crew. 8,000 miles. The commander wondered if perhaps the alien captain meant to commandeer revenge, but that notion faded as the tactical station alarm sounded, signaling a weapons power buildup aboard Atlantis-16. His crew had seconds to live. Like unexpected lightning, the reality-shattering explosion that ripped Atlantis 16 in half left the commander stunned for a moment, every part of his mind and body screaming at him to run for his life. The hot white light filled the bridge of revenge, as if someone had opened a curtain revealing a search beacon the size of a large house. The piercing brightness strobed rapidly and then faded. Sections of the alien ship's hull tumbled in space. Fires fed by the escaping atmosphere burned themselves out. The shockwave impacted revenge, causing the entire vessel to suddenly roll another few degrees to port. The afterimages made it impossible for the captain to focus his vision, but he did hear the faraway cheers and whoops over the fleet command net. Something had happened. Enright just wished he could have seen it. Give me forward battle screens at 15% over amplitude. Tactical. Bring the Argent about to new course 21 Mark 0 and engage hostile target Atlantis 13. All ahead battle speed. Lieutenant McInerney banked the five-million-ton battleship hull four degrees to port and engaged the rest of the engine power under her control. Jason Hunter was already issuing his next orders. Havoc batteries two and three get me a firing solution. Bring us up loud and fast and maneuver to a defensive position on the planet side of Dunkirk. Acknowledged, came the snappy reply from the tactical station. Hold your course, Helm. She'll try to get under us. Aye, helm answering battle speed on attack vector 021. Snapshot 2. The monstrous Havoc anti-proton battery already had a bearings match. An instant before it fired, Argent's tactical station locked its waveform into the battle computer. It glowed to life and exploded with destructive energy. The beam crossed the blackness of space in an instant and slammed into the alien cruiser's screens. Suddenly, the beam re-established itself and began to grow in both size and energy. Captain, we're getting some kind of feedback amplification on our... Snapshot 3. A second Havoc battery fired, crushing the forward section of the alien cruiser with a frightening impact explosion. The feedback reaction vanished a moment before Argent's lateral point defense swiveled and discharged a storm of high-energy ion bolts directly through the cruiser's main hull. Impact patterns rolled through the vessel's insides, filling its entire volume with yellow and orange blasts. It rolled away, engines strobing as its drive field collapsed. Snapshot 6. A third main battery blast gutted the cruiser an instant before it vanished in a miniature artificial sun. The fusion disruption burned itself out in moments. There was no wreckage. Atlantis 13 is down, Captain. Very well. Tactical, I want starboard side capital missiles 1 through 4 armed and standing by for a bearings match on target Atlantis 12. Aye, sir, I... Hunter rose from the center chair. There had been perhaps five times in his entire life he was at a loss for words. This qualified as number six. Tactical, tell me that's an equipment malfunction. Ensign McBride could only gape. She instinctively ran a diagnostic on her console, but she knew the equipment was functioning properly. She didn't answer her captain. What could she say? The rest of the bridge crew was as silent as she was. Bayon 3 was gone. Chapter 46, Strike Battleship Argent BBV-740, Bayoni 3 Interdiction Zone, CPT Jason Hunter Commanding. Captain Jason Hunter, I trust you can hear me. It was the voice of Colonel Atwell. Hunter put his hand up to his ear. His headset was there and seemed to be functioning just fine. He wasn't hallucinating. 
Do not alert your other officers. You've now seen the power I have. Don't make me destroy your ship and your crew. Jason steeled himself, trying to look as if he had everything under control. Then he rose from the center chair. Sabrina, you have the con. Sir, I... I need a minute. Hunter stalked off the bridge, listening intently. Very good, Captain. Go to the flight deck and board any vessel of yours capable of interstellar navigation. Go alone. I will know if you are following my instructions. This is between you and I. It is time I show you instead of wasting my time explaining. Hunter stopped at the Magneto lifts. He would have no trouble finding a ship to navigate out system with. But what then? He pulled a small device nobody else had ever seen before and dialed an encryption code before pressing the transmit button. He dropped it on the deck. A few moments later, it flipped over several times as its circuitry electrocuted itself. Captain, time is short. Hunter boarded the lift and slammed the gate shut. He caught a glimpse of Zoni as the lift descended towards the load lane for Flight 2. He couldn't say anything. He couldn't take the risk of endangering his crew any further. After a few seconds, he strode out of the lifts onto Flight 2. His crews were still making preparations to recover their fighter squadrons. They took no notice of him as he grabbed a helmet and boarded one of the converted Wildcats from Yili's fusion torpedo experiment. Meanwhile, on the bridge, Commander Mallory was trying to process what she was seeing, or rather not seeing on her system-wide tactical display. The wreckage of at least nine starships was scattered across space between Argent's position and the unimaginable void where Bayonne 3 once was. Ma'am? Zoni shook Sabrina's arm. Commander! Yes, yes, what is it? Mallory felt like she was trying to swim through syrup. Her mind simply couldn't catch up to the present moment. Where's the captain going? What did he say to you? I... He didn't say anything. He ordered me to take the con and then walked out. Zoni looked back at the egress portal and the lifts, then at the screen. Did you notice anything else? Did you hear anything? He was listening to something, ma'am, Ensign McBride offered. He walked right by and he had his hand to his ear. Listening to what? Mallory asked, finally able to devote some mental energy to evaluating what had just taken place. Unknown, McBride replied. Mallory's comlink lit up. Skywatch to Force Commander. Go ahead, Skywatch. Are we launching? Negative, we have no wings with launch orders. Cat 70 just launched from Flight 2's forward rails. One life form aboard. Ensign? McBride configured Argent's SRS tracking. The tiny fighter appeared on the main screen. Where is it going? It's headed for the out-system jump gate at 192, McBride reported. Blackburn? Raleo system? Zoni offered. Force Commander, this is Skywatch. Captain Hunter is piloting Cat 70. His transponder is active. Hail him! Mallory barked, making her way to the con. Zoni rushed to the signal station. Cat 70, this is Argent on emergency channel. Acknowledge. The bridge crew waited the regulation ten seconds. No response, Zoni said, looking at Sabrina with a desperate expression. New contact, bearing 295, range 60,000 miles and closing on 70. Identify, quickly. Zoni looked up with a shocked expression. That's the Shrike, that's Cerulea's ship. Tactical, give me some... A beam of energy from out of nowhere speared Cat 70. The fighter disappeared in a ball of fire. Zoni put her hands to her face and screamed. Epilogue, Battleship Argent Executive Conference, Acting Commander Sabrina Mallory Commanding. Commander Doverly stepped into the Executive Conference and found Argent's first officer staring at the reactive display as it cycled through scan after scan of the system looking for any evidence of Cat 70 or the captain. Honora stood at attention. Reporting as ordered, ma'am. Mallory swiveled in her chair. Honora could tell she had been crying, even though the XO had spent several minutes trying to put on a brave face. Be seated. Mallory slid the command codes across the table. I'm relinquishing command of Argent. I want you to take the center chair. Negative, ma'am. Don't make this any harder than it already is, Honora. I froze on the bridge. I didn't see what was happening to the captain. I didn't put a stop to it. Neither did anyone else, Sabrina. You can't take the blame for this. I'm not cut out for command. Nonsense. You went from a blank sheet of paper to a fully qualified force command officer in less than a week. I can't think of anything you aren't cut out for at the moment. We have a job to do, and you know exactly what the next step is. I'm not going to play hunches, not after what's happened. 
Sabrina, you were given an order by our captain. Are you going to prove him wrong? Are you going to fold up after he chose you out of 100 officers for the most prestigious job in this entire task force? What if I make another mistake? What if next time it's all of us? Then we go down fighting like a battleship crew, like Captain Hunter would expect us to. You're in command of a Skywatch ship of the line, Sabrina. You don't surrender. We don't either. Mallory still looked defeated. I don't have the camaraderie you five have, Honora. I didn't get to fly with you and Jason when you were making names for yourselves. I'm a weapons specialist with a knack for passing tests. You were a weapons specialist. Now you're the ranking officer on this ship. The man who wrote the book on the bandit jacks put his trust in you and placed the safety of his pride and joy in your hands. It's up to you to live up to his vision, or all is truly lost. If you step down now, it will kill this crew's morale, and at the worst possible time. Honora took Mallory by the hand and held it firmly across the table. You're the only person aboard this vessel who can speak with Jason Hunter's authority now. A subtle change registered in the commander's eyes. She looked intently at the doctor. You knew what was going to happen. We've been fighting this Colonel Atwell and his alien technology from a distance now for weeks. Why? Because the captain was trying to protect thousands of civilians. And now so are you. What's your recommendation? We track the last known course of the Shrike before she engaged her cloak. And go to the system the captain insisted we avoid. The shadow across Commander Doverly's face gave Mallory a chill. If we're looking for answers, Commander, we're going to find them on Raleo 2, right after we run down Jason Hunter's killer and blow her out of space. The door to the executive conference whispered open, and the battalion sergeant ushered Argent's chief engineer, signals officer, and co B through the door. Yeely tossed a nondescript-looking piece of scorched electronics on the table and took a seat next to Zoni, who had cried herself out of tears for now. Cobb looked like he had just lost a son. Yeely, what's that? Honora asked in an exhausted tone. The engineer seemed to be the only person in the room who apparently wasn't affected by what had happened. Short-range autonomous transmitter, encrypted. It self-destructed, apparently, but it didn't take much to fix. Whoever rigged it to overload did a pretty half-assed job. I suspect a high-ranking officer of our acquaintance. Can you break the code? At first I thought it was one of the captain's practical jokes, but now I'm pretty sure he didn't leave it behind by accident. I found it on deck one near the magneto lifts. Why did you think it was a practical joke? Mallory asked as she wiped her face and sniffled. His code is the old ASCII table from ancient Earth computers. An elementary class could have decoded it in a few minutes. I ran basic pattern recognition on the data. It's a simple raster sequence. Let's see it. Yili activated the device and redirected its transmitter to use the reactive display at the head of the table. Zoni's eyes widened. Mallory and Honora gasped. Buckmaster stood and stared. Before them was an eight-foot-tall image of the Ace of Spades, 